Check, check, check. Aloha mai kako. Okay, I'm just going to hold this bugger because that is not tall enough for me. Um, Velina mai meke aloha. Welcome to the 29th. Pipes Intern Symposium. You guys almost made it to the 30th year. Um, I just want to first of all give a big mahalo to the interns for sticking it out this year. Um, through all the bumps and bruises, can we give them a hand? Um, and really being a part of this ohana, yeah? Um, and we're super fortunate to have you guys with us, yeah, and we look forward to the work that you guys do in the future. And just know that we'll always be here um, to help you on your journey and your path. Um, this year we had 33 host in I mean, we had 33 interns, our biggest cohort on Hawaii Island. Um, all the interns were on Hawaii Island across different um, agencies. So we had 33 interns with 31 host organizations um, that range from federal, state, local, and community nonprofits. So um, big ups to the interns as well as the mentors. Mahalo Nui for being there and really giving these students in, um, and these interns an opportunity. Um, some, some things that I wanted to highlight is that um, I think this year we, we had some what we call hubs and I was supposed to have a map for you guys um, but I got sick and I decided to try and take my health um, and not make a map. Um, so just picture a big map of Hawaii Island, yeah. Um, we had interns in Kohala uh, with uh, Iole. Um, we had interns on the Puna coast with our partners um, for our Puna Strong Hub. We had interns in Hilo as well as Kona down in Mililii. 
Kahalu'u. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we also had interns up on Mauna Kea. Um, yeah, the Mauna boys. Uh, so we really just want to utilize this time um, to hear all of the awesome stories um, that they've kind of been creating this summer. Um, I also want to give a, a big shout out to our funders because without them, we wouldn't be here as a program. And it's important to make sure that you know our people get paid. Um, so mahalo nui to Haole Maloa Foundation. Um, without their help, we wouldn't be here. Um, as well as UH Foundation, they've always been an awesome partner to us um, in helping these interns get to the next level. Um, as well as NSF, the National Science Foundation. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have a lot of our interns getting paid well, you know, um, and I think that's the biggest thing. So, mahalo me. I don't want to take up too much time. I think, uh, you know, we are running a little bit um, early, but uh, many will present around 8.45. Yeah, so mahalo me. Thank you.
All right. Alhamdulillahi Mahalo, everybody, for coming to our 29th annual Pipe Symposium. Um, our first speaker is a native of Kalapanna. Um, but before we jump into that, I just want to talk real quickly about the partnership. So this year we had a Puna Hub. We had three different community sites who are um, doing Aloha Aina all along the Puna coast. One of them being the Kokos, Uncle's Kokos Center in Kalapana with Uncle Sam Kiliho Malu under the, um, the direction of Kumu Gina Maguire and Uncle Sam, you know, who actually runs the center, but Gina Maguire helped um, create this opportunity for Minnie in 2021. So she actually came back again this year, 2023, to continue that work that she started in Kalapana. Um, we also have one down in Ka'akepa with um, Kumu Leila Kealoha, as well as one down in um, Kehialaka, Third Bay, with Auntie Anna Khan. Um, and we're trying to support those Aloha Aina movements and those efforts by putting the, the OEV, the natives of those Ainas, of those spaces, in the care and the, um, under the mentorship of these wonderful Aloha Aina stewards, like Auntie Anna, Auntie Leila, Kumu Leila, and um, Uncle Sam Kiliho Malu folks. So, without further ado, it is my honor to be, present, to be presenting to you folks, um, introducing more like Mini Kiliho Malu Holtz, also known as Kai Inu Kuuvai. Aloha. Can you guys see it? Or is it just me? Okay. <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, um, maybe it's in my head. <laughs> okay, there you It's not. 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 Aloha everyone, good morning. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Kaini Pu'uvai Keli Homalu Hotz, and I come from Kaimu, a small kipuka on the southeast coast of Puna. My presentation is called Kahuaina and translates to Stewards of Kaimu, or Kahuaina o Kaimu, Stewards of Kaimu. Sorry, just eat the ice cream. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Throughout my upbringing, I was instilled with the knowledge of and passion for supporting Hawaiian cultural practices. I'm grateful for those who have inspired me and who continue to support me on my lifelong journey. I'm grateful for those who have come before me and who guide me on this path. And I'm grateful for the aina that continues to nourish my heart's desire. So, right here. I started this summer with the desire to learn more about Kaimu and how I can practice being a steward of the aina. I will be going over what I've learned and my experience this summer. Oh. Thanks to the PIPES program and my mentor, Sam Kelly Omalu and Gina McGuire, um, I was able to continue my work in Kaimu at home with my ohana and my community under a nonprofit organization called Uncle's Kokua Center. With the mission to support the continuing good that our ohana provides to the rural, rural Puna community while supporting the farmers markets, Hawaiian sovereignty, Hawaiian culture, regenerative agriculture, wellness, education, and economic development. So, um, uncle, as it states in the Uncle's Kokua Center, actually refers to my Papa Robert Kili Ho'omalu, who strives to make Kaimu a place of aloha, a place where we can be self-sufficient, love one another, and learn from one another. 
one another. Here's just a map of like Kaimu borders. But Kaimu means to gather at the sea, and it's where the Kalapana Ohanas come to practice their rites of gathering and going holo holo. It's a place where we can gather as family to enjoy each other's presence, and it's a place where the Puna community come to support one another. Kaimu was also known for its famous black sand beach before the 1990 lava flow, at, um, before the lava flow created a new coastline that extends nearly 1,000 feet further into the Pacific Ocean. As you can see in these pictures, hold on. This is before and after, just the lava flow, 1990 lava flow. Yeah. So, um, the Puna area is also historic, uh, historically known to have had rich agricultural lands and practices. And recent lava flows have actually caused a sprawl of rapid subdivision development on the new land, increasing populations of non-local -lo residents and the spread of invasive species. Sorry. And for over 25 years, Pune has been the fastest growing district in the state with the largest influx of incoming residents. Here in Pune, our coastlines and communities are constantly changing and we have to learn to adapt to these changes. Just like the lava that continues to expand um, our coastlines, our, cons our community is constantly growing and the local ohanas have to adapt to become more resilient. Speaking about land, kahuana translates to priest of the land, or in this case, stewards of that which feeds. In the practice of reciprocity and the native Hawaiian culture, wait, here, wait, wait. <laughs> In practice of um, reciprocity in the native Hawaiian culture, we are maka ainana, or the eyes of the land. The Aina feeds us and we watch over it in return. So with this understanding of kuleana brings us to our very own pipe, uh, Puna Pipes collaboration, which we know Nalu mentioned. Sorry, right here. Boom. So this is a collaboration between our three sites along the Puna coast with the same goals as the Puna Maka'ala Coalition, which was formed in 2020. This coalition consists of Hawaiian ohanas, nonprofit organizations, and community members that meet regularly to collaborate, coordinate, and disseminate information to solve problems. We work together to provide solutions to challenges within Lower Puna, specifically how to preserve, protect, and perpetuate our natural, cultural, and spiritual resources within Dahi Puna and our Lower Puna region. So this new collaboration is great for Puna because Puna doesn't get much attention in conservation matters or efforts. And I feel like this is how we can shed light on these important matters concerning our Ainu and community. So first up, we have our Puhoiki site under the Namakahalo OYPO nonprofit organization, which Hinano will be going more into in the next presentation. And then we have our Ka'akepa site, if you want to load, right there, under the Pohoku Pelemaka nonprofit organization with Kili Poho, Auntie Lilo, and Hannah, which Kili Poho will be going more into after. And then last but not least, our Kaimu site, home base, um, under Uncle's Kokua Center, well, um, Uncle Sam, myself, and Gina. So Pilima is important. Making these connections from the very foundation of kahuaina or stewardship and everything to do with how we can malama our people and our places. We hold a common goal to make it possible for the ohanas of Puna to be able to steward and manage our own aina and its precious resources while also getting paid because who wouldn't want to work at home and get paid, right? So through these connections, I also had the um, chance to host and learn from several programs this summer. The first one being our very own Pipes Ohana right here. And these these hamas helped me clean and restore our freshwater Opai Ula Pond in Kaimu that I anticipated would have taken me weeks to do by myself. Yeah, but oh wait, wait, let me swipe the picture for you. Look at those hamas right there. Yeah, working in the Aina, boom. <laughs> and then after the Pipes Ohana, I had the chance to um, host the East West Center. Um, they're based in Oahu, but they work with and cultivate leaders from diverse fields across the region with the intention of teaching them about the history of Kaimu 
and its lava flows and what we are doing in Kaimu. They actually came from 14 different um, countries around the world and they fascinated me with their questions and their interests to learn more. Here. This is them just talking story with them at the beach. So yeah, there's a bunch of them. Okay. And then after learning from these field or researchers in the field, adults from 14 different countries, I got to um, work with the Keiki Okaina of Pune. So I got to um, host the Lavaita Ohana camp for one day. And the purpose of this camp was to gather as Ohana of Pune area, the Keiki, Makua, and Kupuna to practice and perpetuate Hawaiian culture, to learn the Ma'olelo of place and spa uh, space, the way of fishing practices that include malama and stewardship of our aina, and to teach each other and learn from one another. I got the chance to have these keiki down in Kaimu for the day to teach them how to harvest, clean, and prepare kalo for replanting. So this is them cleaning the kalo. So I'm super grateful that I got to teach and learn from all of these amazing people, from the professionals in the field, to college students around my age, and then on to the next generation of Keiki of Puna. I like to think of myself as a cool aina or someone who continues to actively live Hawaiian culture and keep the spirit of the land alive. I believe it's our kuleana to malama our aina because nobody can take care of our home better than we can. In this space, I'm able to create these connections and form the foundation of what I'm building off of to be a kahuaina, or a steward of the land. And with the help of my mentors and their knowledge, I was able to practice being a kahuaina, and I was given the flexibility to start my own projects based on goals I had talked to my uncles and aunties and my family about. I had also started projects in spaces around our property that needed some love. So after the 1990 lava flow, there has been many restoration efforts to bring life back to the um, barren lava along the Kaimu Beach Trail. We're actively working to restore the lava flow, and here's a map right here. So here's just a map showing these outplanting efforts of native um, natives plants such as lama, ko, kukui, lohala, and really, really trees, and like many more. I didn't get all the names. But yeah, these are just some of them along the trail. There's more. And some pictures. Okay. This summer, I also focused on restoring our reciprocal food systems in Kaimu, including cleaning our Ohana's emu or ground oven, and in caretaking the Malakalo, right here, including uh, weeding, making huli, replanting, and making poi. There are just some pictures, yeah. And then I had the chance to, with the Pipes Ohana, restore and clean up our Opai Ula Pond, which has been a long-standing goal among, among many people in my family. And the Pipes Peeps helped me make that happen. Here's some Opai right there, boom. Um, according to Uncle Aku, who is a well-known fisherman in Kalapana, this pond is believed to have been used to grow Opai Ula to feed the Opelo Opelu fish in the old Kaimu Bay, which was a common practice before the lava flow covered the bay. So these are just some of the projects I got the chance to work on this summer in order to malama aina and practice being a steward of my own aina. Uncle Sam shared with me that here in Kaimu, we learn from the past, look for guidance in the future, and f I mean present, look for guidance in the present, and focus on the future. My hopes are to continue my role as kahu aina and ku aina of Kaimu, and here are some of our future goals that I won't go into detail about, but happy to answer any questions on what this might look like look like and mahalo to my mentors and all of our supporters boom any questions <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> questions 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 no questions okay <laughs> no <laughs> So you asked, like, out of all the projects I did, which one was my personal favorite? 
I think it was cleaning the Opaiula pond with you guys. Because, like, we used to go down there all the time as kids, and, like, I've always seen the weeds just, like, the vines just growing in there, and I've always wanted to clean it out. So, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. So many hands. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Hannah. Um, <laughs> so, so here goals. These are just some of the future goals I plan to do. So working with um, Auntie Leila and Auntie Anna guys, starting a stewardship plan for the Puna coastline. So like Ka'akepa, Pohoiki, and then Kaimu, and being able to like use that outline to adapt to different spaces along the Puna coast. So just like a stewardship plan and like managing of our aina, stewarding the aina, and being able to um, bring in Kama'aina to work like at home. Yeah. And and host more educational programs in the future. Cause that's really fun. I had fun hosting all these different programs this summer. So and um possibly restoring our Hawaiian trail that runs through Kaimu. That was one of my uncle's um goals, so I'm gonna do that for him. And then um, talk story to the kupunas and find out more history about Kaimu because I still have a lot to learn. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Mahalo nui mini. All right. Um, it is my pleasure, Naukahaoli, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, she is also another native of Puna, um, under the the mentorship of Auntie Anna Kwan down at Kiahialaka. I'm I'm happy to introduce Hinano Ahenganir. Hello. Check, 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 check. Aloha mai kako. My name is Harmony Ke Alo Kahinano Vilimeka Mai Vilauli'i Monica Ahinganir. But everyone knows me as Hinano. I am from Pahoa, located in the Moku of Puna, and I'm honored to share a piece of home through my project, Kahuaina O Puna, Understanding the Roles of Hala. To guide my project, I developed the research question What is the cultural significance of Hala in Puna? But before I dive into that, I want to share a little bit about my Hua the reason I joined Pipe. So as I mentioned, Puna is a district on the east side of Hawaii Island, known for its abundance of hala and the different ways it was used by the Kanaka of the land. It is the place that raised me and that I am deeply connected to. My family has been rooted in Puna for many generations and have witnessed the lava flows that sweep across our aina. And while some perceive lava as a form of destruction, Puna people view it as a mentor of resilience and adaptability. Embracing this mindset inspired me to apply for the PIPES program during my first year of college at UH Hilo. I heard that Hawaiian culture and Malama Aina was a huge focus in this internship, so I decided to go for it and try something new. I'm very grateful for this program because it gave me the opportunity to give back to the Aina that raised me. This summer, I had the privilege of working with Antiana Khan, who is the Kahu Aina coordinator of the Makahaloa OIPO organization. And our site was located in Pohoiki. And Pohoiki was once a huge gathering spot where families were raised fishing on the rocks or swimming by the boat ramp, where the boats came in and out with fish and where events were held for the community. After the 2018 eruption, the process of restoring places affected by the lava, like Pohoiki, has been long and complicated. At this point, Pohoiki needs stewards of the community that are willing to care for the space. This is why Namakahaloa collaborated with other family-run nonprofit organizations along the Puna Coast, such as Pohaku Pelamaka and Uncle's Kokua Center. And this is just a picture of Namana Vahine O Puna, AKA Puna Peeps, AKA our team of mentors and Pipes interns. And then here's a map starting with my home site at Pohoiki slash Keahialaka with Auntie Anna. And then down the road, Ka'akepa, Pohaku Pelamaka, 
was it Lucky? And then in Kaimul on Ghost Kokua Center. The vision for our Puna coastline inspired me to take on a research project about hala because it is a significant plant to the Puna people. For my, pro oh, sorry. <laughs> my Inoa Hawaii Hinano is a reference to the flower of the male hala tree, and the name Hinano has resonated with me ever since I was a little, ever since I was little, because it represents my roots in Puna. So for my project, I wanted to explore different parts of the hala tree and how Puna people interact to answer the question, what is the cultural significance of hala in Puna? So what is hala? Hala is an indigenous plant in Hawaii with pretty distinct features. It grows best in humid coastal locations, which is why it thrives on the Puna coast. The most interesting aspect of hala is that it's a dioecious plant, meaning it has male and female reproductive organs in separate hala trees. So this shows the male tree identified by the hinano with white bracts enveloping tiny clusters of flowers. And then we have the female tree identified by the ahui hala, which is a cluster of many tiny wedge-shaped keys, which people like to compare to a pineapple. And the sex of hala can only be determined by the hinano or ahui hala, which is only visible when a hala tree has reached the appropriate age of fruiting. And that moves us into my Ha'alela phase with the saying, Ikanana no ka'ike, by observing one learns. This Olela no Eao really guided me through my Ha'alela phase. As a child, I learned from my Ohana that we must listen and observe to acquire the knowledge of our kumu, kupuna, the aina, the kai, and our surroundings in general. This phase was my time to step back and learn as a keiki again. So part of my project methodology was interviewing two Hala practitioners of Puna, Vahine, might I say, Auntie P. Ilanika Avaloa and my mom, Hualani Ganyer. The goal was to understand their knowledge, experiences, and practices with Hala through a Puna perspective. And a list of questions was created by myself to contribute to the main research question, what is the cultural significance of Hala? And I'm just gonna share like two questions that I asked them. Auntie P.E.'s response was, she comes from a family, oh, let me read the question. What is your background in hala and its uses? Auntie P.E. told me she comes from a family of weavers, as her mom and grandmother were knowledgeable and well-known weavers of Puna. My mom's hala journey began with hula, and she learned how to gather, clean, and use low hala for hula garments, which she learned from Auntie P.E. when she was a teenager. And then the second question, how do you apply hala to your life? Auntie P.E. continues to weave like the vahina in her family, whenever she has the time. Whatever her, her imagination creates, she brings it to life through her weaving. As for my mom, Hualani, I would like to think of her as a lay hala master because nearly every week she gathers a hui hala and makes lay for her family and friends. And then we move into my huaka'i, what I discovered from interviews to understand the cultural significance of hala in Puna. When I talked with Auntie P.E., she went over the olelo no eo, Puna paya ala ika hala, Puna with walls fragrant of the pandanus blossoms. This olelo no eao directly alludes to the paya, or walls, of a tradi traditional hale in Puna. These hale follow the traditional A-frame roofing style, where Puna would hang several ahui hala and hinano, and let the sweet fragrance envelop their homes. However, the fragrance is intoxicating, and visitors that come to the hale smell the scent of hinano and ahui hala. As Auntie P.E. put it, this is why Hawaiian families in Puna tend to be large, <laughs> as the combined fragrance, fragrance arouses people's senses and then get choke kids. <laughs> <laughs> Through these interviews, I also learned about the four main parts of hala that are utilized in Hawaiian culture, as I shared hinano and hui hala, and then we have ule hala and lau hala. So the Hinano flower was actually used as an aphrodisiac across many Polynesian cultures. Um, if ever an individual, male or female, encountered hardships in finding another person, then they would use the pollen of the Hinano to like attract that person. So they would like sprinkle it on themselves, in the house, on the bed, all that good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have a hui hala. Traditionally, a hui hala was used to make lei for multiple purposes, including the passing of a loved one, marriage, 
someone that graduated or any kind of new chapter in life. But as I learned from my ohana and kumumanai, puna people wore it as an accessory just because we had it around all the time. And I would like to bring that back as well because look at that. <laughs> During the interview with my mom, she talked about her experiences with lehala and what she learned from our auntie Annie Kaokai, who is also a well-known puna hala practitioner. And she learned from Auntie Annie the traditional Puna style of Lehala. And this picture shows, this is the Puna style. So we use the whole key instead of just getting the yellow part. This is how we used to do it before learning the Puna style of Lehala. Because Auntie Annie told her that style only wastes the Hala. So I'll teach you the Puna style. <laughs> 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 then we have Ule Hala which are the aerial roots protruding at the base of the tree. And like a certain human body part, it comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, in Puna, it is used <laughs> for cordage or medicinal treatment. And that treatment, it could be um, the skin disease. Oh my god. <laughs> the skin disease called kane, also known as tinea. And that's something I hope to like look into in the future as well, as I continue my hala studies. And then we have our lohala, the long blade-like leaves of the plant, commonly used for weaving. Lohala weaving has received a lot of attention in the past, in, the, in recent years, because of the beautiful things you can make, like mats, papale, baskets, whatever your imagination creates. However, the process of gathering lohala is just as essential as the weaving part. And that's something I wanted to shed light on. I learned from Auntie P.E. that the ground was always ma'e ma'e, or clean, at groves of gathering in Puna. And the old dead lauhala were placed under the ulehala at the base of the tree to provide more nutrients. In addition, old leaves were plucked off the tree itself to allow the younger ones to grow nice and beautiful for weaving. This process of gathering lauhala portrays the nurturing relationship between Puna people and the hala. And this is a picture taken at Kuku with Kukulu Kumuhana Keiki when we went to Keahia Laka and we gathered Lohala, we learned how to pick the right ones or just the whole process of gathering and cleaning. And they made cute little bracelets. So to answer the question, what is the cultural significance of Hala and Puna? Maintaining and caring for the Aina is how native plants like Hala will continue to thrive. Puna people shared a special connection with Hala because of the way they utilized it, whether it was to find a significant other and create a big ohana, to make lay medicine and cordage, or to create beautiful clothing and accessories. It was inspiring to learn more about Hala so that I can apply it to my daily life as a future Hala practitioner of Puna. This way we can pass our practices down to the future generations. And then we got my ho'ina. Now that this internship is coming to an end, I would like to give a big mahalo to the people that supported me during my ka'au journey, such as our Pipes Ohana and supporting organizations. Mahalo for opening career paths for my future, teaching me essential life skills, like public speaking, which I love a lot, and <laughs> giving me the opportuni opportunity to malama the aina that raised me, and most importantly, for instilling Hawaiian values of na'au, aina, kaiahulu, and ka'au. I will carry this ike with me as I continue my education as a college student. And to my puna ohana that pushed me to kulia ikanu'u, strive for the summit, I'm honored to represent my home as a steward of Puna and a Pipes intern. Mahalo. <laughs> Any questions? Mahalo me, Hunana. Does anybody have a question? And I'll run this mic to you. I'm sure somebody has a question. I'm going to kind of go towards our Puna peeps. Sorry. Please state your name. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, a year ago, we did hala surveys along the, the Red Road down <laughs> in Puna, and um, seems like it's not, not as abundant as it used to be historically. So I was just curious in your interviews or in your experiences this summer if you have any ideas for how we get our groves back or malama our groves or yeah, get people to want to have hala around. Mm -hmm. um, this summer, I actually got the um, opportunity to plant some red hala 
because we wanted to like keep it going, start that propagation again. But those, oh, eat the ice cream, sorry. Those um, halak didn't really sprout, but luckily we went on a hike, a very strenuous <laughs> hard hike across lava rocks and at the edge of a cliff. And we found a singular hala tree and we got like all these little seeds. So I think just like, you know, finding all the seeds you can and like starting that out planting, especially in Kaimu and bringing that back. Uh, that's how we get the abundance again. Um, Hinano, I have another question online from Noi, from Kumu Noi. Were the hala collected mostly in yards or from the forests? And a follow-up, do you see any connection with the cultural importance of hala with the health of the forest? Mm. So um, at my house, we actually don't have any hala fruiting right now. So we usually go around the neighborhood in Hawaiian beaches. We're scoping it out. If it's in front of someone's yard, we make it quick. <laughs> and <laughs> we go along the shores and the coastline of Puna. You can go anywhere really in Puna and find the best one for you. What was the other part of the, did I answer it? What's the connection? What is the connection with the cultural importance of hala uh, with the health of the forest? How do you connect those? Hmm? What is the cultural connection? Do you see any connection with the cultural importance of hala with the health of the forest? Yes, because hala is like our plant in Puna. And like Gina said, it's not as abundant as it used to be. So just bringing that back. <laughs> Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, any environmental, I, I just like to ask um, if there's any environmental threats that are hindering the cultural Ooh. practices, like um, a so invasive species attacking hala trees and stuff? Yeah, so I actually heard about hala scale. Luckily, it's, it hasn't been spotted on the big island, but it is taking over Hana Maui, which also used to be like Puna with the abundance of hala. And it's sad to see that that's happening there, and I hope we can keep it how it is over here on the Big Island. Mahalo Hinano. Oh, we have one more question. We get time for one more question from mom. <laughs> so um, the last time we gathered Hala, we heard, because we have a lot of influx of non-residents in Puna, which we heard from many, um, someone told us that they are working towards some people in the neighborhood want to cut down the hala trees because it's a nuisance or they don't like the way it looks. So what would you say to non-residents who don't find cultural significance in the hala? Like, how would you help them to understand its importance? Well, I think they need to come down and be part of our stewardship plan and learn about our cultural <laughs> plants and natural resources or the not so nice ways. Stop doing that. <laughs> Good job, Hinano. Mahalo Nui. And yes, please come down to Puna and learn all about Hala. Um, our next speaker is our last Puna Hub representative. Um, and it is Naukaha Ole. It's my, my pleasure to be introducing Vertio Kilipohe Ventura. Hello. Eating the ice cream. <laughs> Eat it for real. Okay. Aloha Kako. My name is Bertio Kilipohe Kohi Vai Komaluake Aloha. Ventura. Um, and I had the amazing opportunity to be a part of the Kahu Aino Puna project with a few of the nonprofit organizations out in Puna. I also had the freedom to choose a personal project to focus on, and through talking stories with the Puna Ohana, we decided to take a deeper dive and look into the relationship or pirina between hala and ha uke uke. But before we do that, I'm going to go over myself. 
I was born and raised in Pune, and I've always appreciated the place that raised me all my life. And by being born and raised in Pune, I have a part of that area within me. <laughs> and coming into this internship, I had little to no knowledge on what to expect. But as we come towards the end, I am truly grateful of this transformation process I went through this summer. Bohaku Pelemaka is a nonprofit organization I had the opportunity to work with, as well as collabing with two other nonprofit organizations, Namaka Haloa OIPO in Pune with Auntie Anna Khan, and Uncle Kokua Center out in Kaimu with the Kelly Iho Omalu Ohana. Ka'akepa is found in the Ahu, or Ka'akepa is the home base for Pohaku Pelemaka. And if we take a closer look, <coughs> Ka'akepa is found in the Ahupua of Malama near Mackenzie State Park. There it is. Um, Auntie Leila Kealoha, along with her Ohana, have been stewarding the place for many, many years now. And Pohaku Pelemaka is an organization that displays what it means to be Kahu Aina of Puna. Um, this nonprofit organization educates, holds space, and continues traditions in and for our community. In this area, it shows the connection that Kai and Aina share, and having a healthy environment means both land and sea are strongly connected to each other. Kaakepa is a special place where many Puna Ohana are able to gather and grow with one another, and at the same time are able to educate the next generation in hopes that they can take on this kuleana and educate their next generation. Um, as we learned from Minnie's previous pr um, presentation, the term kahuaina is a term we use to explain what a steward of the land is. And when becoming a steward, we need to find proper protocol to educate others who visit these spaces, as well as malama aina, this area, so we are sure to have it in the future. Over the summer, we hosted a handful of groups, as well as creating camps for the Puna Ohana. We had two groups, Green River College and the Arctic Slope Foundation, who came from areas beyond the island. And our kuleana was to educate them about the history of the area and teach them skills that we were taught growing up, as well as allowing them to understand the purpose of Malama Aina or Aloha Aina. The other two camps were camps for the Puna Ohana, and pretty much they come together and be the hama Hawaiians they are. <laughs> Sharing their ike with one another is how we will continue to grow and build what we have in Puna. <coughs> and then part of being a steward of the land is to develop a program manual. And in this document, we included biological surveys. <coughs> Uh, so we performed baseline studies within Ka'akepa, and this consisted of tide pool surveys as well as forest surveys. And we started with the tide pool surveys earlier in the summer, and then later on we tackled that thick forest we have in Ka'akepa. And all these um, data we are collecting will be put into the program manual Auntie Leila is currently developing for Ka'akepa. As I mentioned earlier, Auntie Leila gave me the opportunity to develop a project that sparked my interest. Puna is known for its surplus amount of hala, so I figured why not develop a project around our greatest resource. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this specific tree plays many roles in Hawaiian practices as we learned from Hinano's presentation. And Ha uke uke, hold on. Ha uke uke is an edible urchin that is um, deeply favored by the kupuna and others in Puna. And basically, we wait till the urchin is big enough and then we bust it open and eat the gonads. <laughs> <laughs> In order to dive deeper into this pilina, um, that these two species shared, I decided to interview a few Puna practitioners. And through the interview process, Auntie P.E. Lenny Kaavalo reminds me about pilina. 
Through the research, I come to find that this special relationship between land and sea are well recognized in many, many stories, as well as the Kumulifo. And every living thing in the ocean has a matching partner on land that shares similar traits. So hala is the counterpart to ha uke uke. By the process of kilo, both the species seem to share the same ripening season, which is in the fall. And by observing the fruit, families would know when to go down to the shoreline to gather the urchin. Looking at the two species, we were able to see similarities shared by hala and ha uke uke. The pattern on the outside of the hala keys shares similar patterns found at the bottom of ha uke uke. I also learned that this urchin tastes different in different areas, and with the help from Auntie McCunny Greg, we wondered if this had to do with the type of hala produced in that same area. Unfortunately, we haven't really got to fully test this theory due to our busy schedules this summer, but from Auntie P.E.'s Manao, she has never really heard of this potentially being a factor. As we traveled up and down the shore of Ka'akepo, we were a little concerned whether or not we would find Hauke Uke in the area. Auntie Leila continuously told us stories about how her father used to collect Hauke Uke along the coastline, but as time went on, she never really saw any. So during our tide pool surveys, we found a colony of Hauke Uke near the western boundary of the site. Since this was a rare sighting in Ka'akepo, we marked the spot on our GPS, and later on in the day, I sat down with Uncle Kyle Keoloha, another Puna practitioner, to talk about the coastlines of Puna. Uncle Kyle is a Puna hammer who spends majority of his time along the coastlines of Puna, and he gave us a quick rundown of the type of hauke uke to find along the coastlines. Just like Auntie P.E. Lenny Kaavaloa, he also mentioned the olelo no eo, pala kahala momona kaha uke uke. <coughs> so as I continue this journey of learning more about my aina and where I come from, I come to the realization that this kuleana I have goes beyond the 10 weeks Pipes internship provides to me. I was able to reconnect myself to my home as well as build a strong connection with my Puna peeps. And being able to be a part of a big change that is to come is such an honor. And as a Kanaka in the upcoming generation, it is amazing to be able to have a say in future projects we are to hold in this area. Auntie Leila, as well as Auntie Anna, showed that our voices as the next generation matter. And being able to see and be a part of uh, developing a community-based stewardship manual gives us the opportunity to give our mana'o in what we want to see in the future. It is so valuable to be able to carry on the type of work these amazing ladies are doing. And because of them, we are able to have a place to continue to keep educating new generations as well as people who just simply want to learn. Due to this being the place where we are consistently in, this doesn't mean this is the end of our journey. There is no official way to close this because this was just the start of something amazing to come in Pune. So as a way to give back to my Pune peeps, um, me, along with Minnie and Hinanu, decided to create a Mele Vahipana highlighting the beautiful traits our sites provide. With the help from my sister, Hualani, um, we created this. And this, ol uh, this Mele is not finished, but I think it has to do with the fact that this journey isn't over. Pipe's internship opened a door for us and gave us this opportunity to be part of this lifelong duty we have as people from Pune. And overall, I just want to give a big mahalo to the Pipes Ohana, as well as the supporters. And a big mahalo to the Puna peeps back there. And especially the biggest mahalos to Auntie Leila Kealoha for taking me under her wing this whole summer. So thank you, guys. Mahalo me, Kimipohe. Puna strong, Puna strong. Do we have any questions for Kilipo here? Oh, here, oh, oh my God, you would be in the middle. I don't even. Can we do pass the mic? So, Bree, 
besides Hala and Ha Uke Uke, did you see any other similarities from land to coast during this internship in Puna? In Puna? Or, or what you learned while down well, there? Well, a big thing I heard was um, a lot of the Puna people knew the Olala no Ea as Palakahala Momona Kavana. So I thought that was an interesting um, part. And what I also learned is Vana and Hala do share similar um, patterns as well. So when we look at the core of the fruit and pretty much take off the spines of the Vana, Auntie P.E. told me that they look exactly the same. And so, yeah, but if you look in the Kumu Lipo, there's plenty, there's plenty of those kind of connections. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions? I think we could take. Oh, here we go. Um, I heard you mention your process um, through the process of Kilo. So I was wondering how you utilized Kilo throughout your internship, and if you had any favorite kilos throughout the summer, or if you have a specific way that you kilo? Wow, that was a beautiful question. <laughs> 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 well, kind of the way I kilo is really just staying in the area and taking it all in. And, you know, this Mele Vahipana was created from kilo. Thank you. <laughs> One more question. Thank you. When can we hear the mele? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you not today. <laughs> If you like hear them, you can email me, bratilahua.edu. I'll send you a recording. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I get one more. Um, so how could you apply the same type of understanding with the Olelo no Eau between the Hala and Ha'uke Uke or the Vana and the Hala to the current climate change that's happening? You know what I mean? That's affecting all of um, the changing within the ocean. Like, uh, like, how do you think you can apply it now with the knowledge that you gain from the aunties and the kupunas that can help you out through your um, studies? Well, something I did want to do in the future was really like test the theory out that if Hala is right, is the Ha Uke Uke even ready? And so some ways of doing that, I would say is like, you know, we have to use our observation skills and see if the Hala is ripe and then check if the Ha Uke Uke is ready. And then maybe, I don't know if I'm able to take on this Kuleana, but like kind of revamp that Olalo no Eau to like what we are seeing in this time and age. Thank you. Mahalo <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Mahalo Nui Puna Peeps. Yeah, Puna Strong. Yeah, um, so we have a couple more presentations before we take a break, because I know everybody got to stretch their legs. Um, but I'd like to introduce Mia Takai, our next presenter. And she'll be talking about her experience this summer uh, working with Wahine farmers. Hello. Okay, 
Aloha kako, everybody. My name is Mia Takai, and I'm a student here at UH Hilo. And I'm currently majoring in geography. Um, this summer, I was so blessed to, yet again, be a part of the PIPES cohort. And um, my project this year is about the women's perspectives in a male-dominated industry while exploring conservation practices through the lens of wahine farmers in Hawaii. Oh, sorry. So first and foremost, I want to give a big mahalo to Kipuka, UH Hilo, and Pipes for funding this project and actually making this research possible this summer. I also want to thank my host agency, the Geography Department at UH Hilo, along with Dr. Catherine Bezio and my Pipes mentor in the back, Anna Ezi, who is a graduate student in the Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Sciences Master's Program. So in this study, I wanted to focus on two main points, which was Wahine identifying farmers' experiences in practicing conservation in agriculture, but specifically looking at native Wahine farmers and um, women of color. I also wanted to um, focus on the challenges and barriers for women who try to attempt these, um, try to attempt to access these farm bill programs or any other government support conservation um, funding. So some of the methods that I had used in this project was grounded theory and purposive sampling. And basically to start the project, I had to gather some background information. So I looked into literature um, and basically the topics that I looked into was biocultural restoration, women farmers and government support programs. After reviewing the literature, I identified the gap of research on women of color in agriculture in the US. So if you take a look at this graph, sorry, it is a little small, um, but it shows that farm bill programs actually support conservation in farming. And then in fact, there's over like $60 um, billion um, that goes towards that with federal money. And then on another note, um, we were able to connect with Hikiola, which is a community nonprofit organization, and they were able to share a study with us that they conducted in 2022 on Native Hawaiian and Pacific Island um, access to farm bill programs. And some of the main barriers that they had seen was that there was a lack of knowledge of these programs, there was a lack of time that they had, and people assumed that they actually weren't eligible because they didn't assume or they didn't identify as a farmer. So in the outreach portion of my project, I basically documented the details of the participants. So I created a spreadsheet with starting with 12 participants and then ended with 60 well-respected farmers in Hawaii that basically ranged from small backyard farmers to commercial producers. And in total, we um, had six interviews that were conducted. So because the interviews were completely exploratory, we did not fill out the IRB protocol. Instead, we used this informed consent form to basically tell the participant what the interview was about, what it entailed, and the confidentiality measures that were taken for their um, privacy and so on. And the completed forms were in my Google Drive. So the interviews that I conducted were semi-structured, which basically meant which, which basically means that we ask them open-ended questions. There are three main questions um, for this project, and they are how do Wahine agricultural land stewards identify themselves as, and how have they engaged with conservation assistance programs? What are the barriers and what works? Um, the third question says how can a greater understanding of the first two questions help Wahine access conservation assistance programs? And so in, these, um, in this study, we created the interview questions and basically sorted them into categories of themes to narrow down the focus of our project. And as you can see here, there's like, for example, identity methods and farming practices, um, community and social networks, challenges, and government support. So some of the details of the participants we gathered was the location of cultivation and their ethnicities, um, and the ethnicities of the participants. There were six participants in this study, 
um, all of which that cultivated on the Big Island, Maui, and Oahu. All of them had farming experience in Hawaii, and take note that two of the participants actually were born out of state. Um, the participants identified as Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Irish, and Japanese. And knowing these details will help us get a better understanding of their exper experience in farming as a whole. And so the next step was to transcribe the audio files using Otter AI. So I have a screenshot for you guys of what it looks like. Um, Otter AI is basically a technology that develops speech into text transcription using artificial intelligence. And I did have some difficulties with um, using AI. Uh, some of those reasons include like, English wasn't the only language that was being used by the participants. Um, they also used pidgin and words of Olelo Hawaii. Another issue was the background noises. So it made it hard for the AI to um, accurately transcribe. Here we have deduce, so I use deduce to code uh, my transcriptions and basically identify any themes to examine any patterns that were present in the answers that the participants gave us. And to your left in this um, image here, I created 15 codes um, that basically derive from topics um, that were talked about within the interviews. And to provide a little bit of context um, from what I heard from the participants. I used demographic data that the USDA Census of Agriculture um, had taken in 2017. And within the data, they collected gender statistics. And um, when comparing both years of 2012 and 2017, they seen that there was a decrease of 1.7% of male producers and a dramatic inc increase of 26.6 female producers. The USDA data collection also featured race and ethnicity in the US, and it basically shows that there's a discrepancy in both gender and ethnicity in the US who is for who is actually farming. Um, the highest percentage of producers were white, and 0.1% of the producers in the US were Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. In 2017, USDA collected the same data pertaining to gender and ethnicity, but within the state of Hawaii, and there was around 7,000 male producers and 5,000 female producers. So when comparing Hawaii to the US, Hawaii has less of an extreme gap um, in gender and race uh, for who is farming, yet there is still like a lack of research um, into the needs and pers perspectives of women of color in agriculture. So in the interviews, something that I really wanted to ask the participants was, what does a farmer look like to them? Just to get a sense of how they perceive things. So here are two quotes um, from two different participants that display an image of, a farm, of what a farmer looks like to them. One states, when people think of a farmer, I mean old McNaughton, Old McDonald had a farm. It's a dude on a tractor with a big pot belly. Another states, someone that does what I do, maybe on a larger scale or something, more land covered, I feel like they also grow other things too, consistently, not like me trying to experiment. Um, when referring back to my first main question of the project, we found that two people identified as farmers, and these quotes below, are actually from two participants that don't identify as farmers. Um, one of them states that, I don't say I'm a farmer, but it's like, oh yeah, farmer so-and-so, you know, she grows kalo. My mom, she likes to joke around and say that, and my papa. But yeah, I don't even, I don't even though it's what I do. Um, and basically another participant claims the same thing, but she, she says in the participants that, I mean, she says in the interview that, um, she set a high bar for herself, um, and she's nowhere near that, so therefore she is not that. Another interesting find that um, we found in the study was that a participant actually um, questioned the identity of a farmer and as both a occupation and as a lifestyle. Here in the quote it says, I always thought, is this a job or is this a lifestyle? 
And to address my second question in my project of how Wahine land stewards engage with these conservation assistance programs and what the barriers are, um, I seen that in my study, a lot of the participants mentioned like a lack of time, desired freedom from the government, completing the forms for funding were challenging, but actually getting a hold of the forms itself was just as hard. Um, not being eligible for NRCS funding, networking is important, but some of the people were left out, um, and opportunities for funding. Um, one participant said, uh, the women I know who are farmers, they're expected to take on both household duties like cooking and taking care of the children, plus running the farm and seeking out resources on top of that. And that's something um, that one of them said. So the things that are working, here we have a quote, and it states that I went into the Rural Development Office, and they had a packet that had like a lot of pictures and a lot of grants, um, just had like one sentence descriptions. And it was like a 30-page pack, and it was very helpful. When going to, um, when you go to grants.gov, it's like no pictures. So these are the things that are super helpful, keeping the information and resources out there very brief and short. So when addressing my third question, um, some of the solutions that I see um, could help more Wahina access these uh, resources consist of marketing those resources more, which could, co which, could com which could provide the inclusion for different identities, and not just farmers, but like Wahina growers as well. In our finding, many of the participants um, shared that existing materials for seeking out resources are too time consuming. So I believe making, like I said, um, just briefly before this, that making the information a bit more brief and bite-sized for the farmers would be best. I also think that networking would be a good way to help people get connected and find the resources for funding within different communities that they need. So I want to thank um, my funders, Kipuka, UH Hilo, and the Pipe Sohana, as well as my mentor, and also a main, um, I guess you could say necessity of this project was the participants that I really want to mahalo because they took the time out of their life to um, meet with me and discuss all of the details of that and provide the study with the data that it needed. So um, yeah, mahalo for your time. Chop, chop. Mahalo, Mia, Noilani. Do we have any questions for Noilani? I'll come run to you wherever you are. Yes, Chloe. Uh, was there anything during your like interviews that you didn't expect to find? Hmm. Oh, she asked me um, if there was anything in the interviews that I didn't expect to find. Um. Hmm. Honestly, for some of the questions that we asked, because it was like a semi-structured interview with open-ended questions, the participant could basically just free flow it. It doesn't even have to end with something that I was asking for. So, for example, one of the participants, she had answered the question first, and then she moved on to these all of these other different topics. Um, like problems with society, like food insecurity in our um, society. So it mentioned a lot of other things and a lot of other problems that um, need recognition. Any um, other questions? I think we. Oh, 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 oh. Please raise your hand. Right, okay, so the question was like, where did the interviews take place, whether it was on their farm in the Mala and or inside? And I would say, I don't know the numbers, but we were outside um, in their farms for two of them um, when we went up to HCC for, or in Oahu for HCC. Um, we got to visit like a Kalo patch, um, what else? And a farm in a valley. I don't really want to give the details of that, but um, 
Yeah, so it was super outside. Um, majority of the in interviews were through Zoom, though, which um, I honestly think that with more funding, maybe from Pipes, one day, like, you know, we can go and fly to Oahu or Maui, you know, and get to answer, I mean, ask these questions in the field. And I think, I think it actually does alter, like, um, the answers that the participants, you know, say to us because, I don't know, anything can influence their answers. Like the, I guess the environment around them could remind them of a certain point to mention to me, so, yeah. Any other questions? I think Makoa had a question, yeah? Okay, so the question was um, basically like about the relation of farming to me, right? So I was actually, <laughs> I was very interested in this project. It was a very new project, especially for my mentor. Um, but so my relation to farming and why I was so excited was because I actually come from a family of farmers. I uh, personally wanted to interview my grandma, but she actually refused. <laughs> Because she just said, no, I don't do that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I respect that. Totally respect it. But, um, yeah, I just come from a family of farmers and fishermen. So, yeah. In the back. Right, all of them. Right. Right, so. Right. You know, um, what was the question? How did, how did the gender dynamics, or gender roles, and um, what are the specifics of, the, of that dynamic, I guess you could say, um, on farming and who makes the decisions? So. Um, my answer to that is um, I'm not too sure how they exactly split up that role of running the farm, um, whether it's like the husband or the wife, but we actually, I think something that we could control in our project is like looking for women that actually take on the responsibility themselves and not having um, too much assistance from, you know, like the male gender role portion of that, but um, one of our participants' parents who actually ran the farm, um, her mom had basically been in charge of the farm itself, and then the father had been like the animals, and not even, nothing to do with the farm, not, nothing to do with cultivating at all. It was just, you know, like the animals. So I think that's something that we've seen in our um, study, so yeah. Um, we have one question online. Uh, did any of the participants describe themselves as mahi ai? Right, good question. Um, honestly, in our interviews, we asked them, um, I'm not too sure exactly what we asked them, but they, some of them actually asked us, like, what does that kind of mean? Um, it seems like some of the participants didn't know um, exactly what mahi ai is. Um, but I was told by my mentor um, that mahi ai is like a term that you use for farming, but also I feel like it's on a spiritual level. So whether it's stewarding the land and, and cultivating and taking care of it, doing your part and your kuleana in this community, um, not just taking, taking, taking as a farmer um, for that term. But yeah, I would have to research more into that term, so. Oh, one more question, I guess. Right, so um, the question was the differences between male and female, um, I guess access to the grants and stuff like that. Um, I didn't get too into that in my study. I would love to see the differences, but um, I believe that we had data that shows the percentages, but not the reason why more men um, have access to these uh, you know, resources more than women. Um, 
Also, in our interviews, we asked about like the difference, I guess, between that male and female dynamic, and they didn't really think that there was anything to um, impact that, I guess you could say. Like, there should, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I have to research into that more. That would be a really good study. So, yeah, is that all? Can we give another round of applause for okay, Melanie thank you. Hattai? <laughs> Hey, so we're going to finish this morning session with um, Violet Hart. She was working with BISC this summer and has some really cool stories to share. Thank you, Violet. Aloha, everyone. My name is Violet Hart. Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's eat the ice cream. All right. Aloha, everyone. My name is Violet Hart. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting on our community and our environment, using citizen science to detect and track the spread of invasive species on Hawaii Island. All right, so to start um, with my hua, my catalyst, and my reason for doing this internship. So I was born and raised on the Big Island, and I developed a really strong love for the outdoors at a young age. Um, I was fortunate enough to be raised by parents who really valued caring for the land, and they were always uh, pushing me to interact with my environment. Um, these are just some pictures of me exploring and playing in, in the native rainforests. Um, I was always super fascinated by everything that makes up these intricate ecosystems. This is a picture of me. Sometimes things never change. I look exactly like this now, <laughs> um, as you can see in this picture. Uh, so the native species we all know and love are in danger. Uh, Hawaii makes up about 1% of the U.S. landmass, but about 40% of the nation's endangered species. Um, and like anyone who grew up here, uh, I'm very well acquainted with these invasives that plague our islands. Um, and I became increasingly frustrated with this um, as I grew up, and it really inspired me to go into conservation. These are just some pictures of the terrible things that we see here, in my opinion. Uh, so moving on, when I began college in 2020, I was really set on becoming a biology major with a focus in botany. Um, but this kind of morphed into a new passion as I studied the significant disparities within our communities when it comes to education, environmental education. Um, and Western science kind of just has a tendency to remove humans from our environment and uh, study the two as separate entities. Um, but this, uh, this, this, <laughs> taking, pulling us apart from the, this disconnection, sorry, I was looking for that word, this disconnection has um, kind of removed this sense of kuleana we have to steward the land. Um, and I believe that real conservation cannot only just occur in the lab. And for me to feel like I was making real and tangible change, I had to uh, work with the communities to bridge this gap um, and reconnect people with their environment. So this all led me to this internship where I got to work with the Big Island Invasive Species Committee, or BISC. Um, they have voluntary partnership with government, private, and nonprofit organizations and community members, and they work island-wide to protect native forests, agriculture, and communities from the threats and impacts of invasive species. These are just some pictures of things that they're doing the Albizia assassins, some of their education events. Um, so I was really excited to work with BISC because um, it seemed to just combine a lot of my major interests. I was able to use my botany skills and kind of practice that, um, and then also work with the community and gain more experience uh, in outreach and education. So my internship with BISC 
uh, primarily consisted of three things. The first was finding the most accurate plant identification app. Uh, the second was testing a new method of early detection for invasive plants. And then the third was just general outreach and education, which I was kind of just helping out with throughout the entire internship. So the first that I'm gonna talk about is finding the most accurate plant ID app. So BISC is a very small organization and they have limited reach, so they rely a lot on public engagement um, to monitor and track the spread of invasive species on the island. Um, and using plant ID apps was a huge way that we were doing this this summer. Um, so my mentor, Molly Murphy, along with Kevin Facenda and Chuck Chimera, they decided to test the various plant identification apps. So they accumulated about 250 pictures of uh, identified plants, and then these were categorized as um, invasive or non-native common, uh, non-native rare, native rare, and native common. Um, and then I helped with this project by uploading these photos one at a time into each of the five identification apps we were looking at. So we were looking at iNaturalist, PlantNet, uh, PhotoThis, Google Lens, and LeafNet. Um, and then I recorded the answers of these and basically just said if it was either correct or if it just got it on a genus level or a family or anything like that. Uh, and then each app response was quantified on a point system. So it was one point if it got it fully correct, 0.6 if it got it correct as a second to fifth option, and then 0.3 points if it just got it on a genus level. So these points were added up and then turned into these nice bar charts that I did not make, unfortunately. Um, but they were turned into these bar charts. The x-axis shows zero to 50, with 50 points being fully accurate. Um, and as you can see, iNaturalist won with about 43 points for common natives. And uh, Google Lens and PlantNet got about 25 points, so, you know, clear second place, but at least they tied. Um, and then for rare natives, iNaturalist had about 13 points, and Google Lens took a clear second place with 10 points. Uh, so it was very apparent to me, um, as you can see, the rare non-natives, uh, the app seemed to get a lot more accurately than with the rare natives, which is just likely due to a lack of data in these systems when it comes to native Hawaiian species, but this will hopefully be remedied as the uh, it's expanded over time and people continue to use it across the islands, but as you can see the rare na non-natives and then the rare natives. Um, iNatural is still one, but still very low points. So this kind of goes into my next project that I was working with with Fisk, which was definitely one of my favorite parts. Um, I got to go around the island in 10 weeks. Um, so invasive plants often come to the islands as harmless, seemingly harmless ornamentals, definitely not harmless. Um, but then once they're introduced here to the island's favorable conditions and their lack of their native predator from their homeland, they just grow wildly out of control. Um, these are just a few examples of some of those plants um, that you can kind of just see all over that are in people's yards. Um, <coughs> And so, the uh, GIS analyst at BISC pulled a bunch of GPS points from iNaturalist um, and then compared these with uh, plants from a, oh, I forgot to say earlier, another thing that I was very surprised with that it was very interesting to me was that the list of um, invasive species or naturalized species has not been updated since 1992. So there's about 30 years of plants and, you know, things that we need to back up before we can even, like, go into eradicating them. But, um, so, the GIS analyst took the points from iNaturalist and then he compared these to that list of unregistered uh, naturalized species in Hawaii and then made a nice little map that uh, Molly and I used to 
just go around the island. So we would take these points and then we would go and collect these plant samples from around the island. And then this is just a map of what we found. I'll try to go through it kind of quickly, but um, we kind of started in Hilo and then went around. Let's see if the map will even move. <laughs> oh, there we go. Some of them were hard to find. I like this name. <laughs> the Rosa Rugosa was a potential eradication target. Uh, sometimes you almost have to fall into a pond to get your sample, but you, you know, what you got to do for science. Uh, this one, bane of my existence, you see it everywhere. Once it was the f our first collection, and now I can't I can't stop looking at it. Anyone who's driven with me recently knows that that's all I can talk about. Um, so then, for every plant, we recorded data about their location, their physical characteristics, surrounding plants, basically anything we saw. Um, the main characteristic we were looking for was the presence of fruit and flowers. So this kind of shows that the plant is naturalizing and becoming accustomed to the new environment. Um, and then back at the office, we would press the samples, or we would dry them and press them, and then we would mount them for uh, our own collections as well as the Bishop Museum. So these are just a few pictures. Uh, this is us pressing the plants. It's not for the weak. And uh, just uh, this is a picture of me, good load, mounting the plants, um, just putting some glue on the back of them and then labeling them. So the kind of culminating thing with this entire internship was public outreach, and that was what I was focusing on. So I did a lot of events with event things like uh, World Oceans Day, Climate Day, um, Revitalize Puna, um, and then BISC also gets c called to do a lot of neighborhood talks and stuff like that, talking about fire ants and rat lungworm and this was just a picture of uh, us when we went out to Kalani Estates. Um, we were just doing a native species talk and also about uh, fire ants and rat lungworm and things that are important out there. Uh, my f one of my favorite outreach events was with Imi Pono. So that's a conservation group um, or a conservation program for students. Um, but my mentor, Franny Brewer, and I went up with the group to Kahuku Ranch, and we did a talk about native and invasive species, and then we also got to remove some V, which was really cathartic, I think, for both of us. Um, but making sure that this information that we're spreading is accessible for everyone, including just you know young kids, was just a really big part of my time with BISC, and it's really inspired me to rethink how I go about public outreach and education. So now to kind of finish, bear with me with all this, these words, I'm sorry. Um, so my ho'ina, my reflection on this entire internship. So I study environmental education and eco-justice, which essentially means I'm just constantly surrounded by very depressing conversations about the future of our earth um, and just this like seemingly just impossible acts it would take to fix these things. Um, but after a few weeks with working with BISC, I, my mindset was really starting to change, especially because I had definitely come back home with just a lot of hopelessness, honestly. <laughs> um, but I was still seeing a lot of these issues, obviously, and just kind of being shown the really, uh, the restricting like politics and stuff surrounding conservation. Um, but I felt like I was actually able to see people who are putting in the time and effort and able to be a part of real change that is happening, which was really inspiring for me. And working with people who are doing this was like incredible. Um, but you know, as we all know, conservation is incredibly underfunded. It's incredibly grueling a lot of the times. And the people who are in it, they're in it because they're passionate about what they do. Um, and so being able to work with these people, it was just so inspiring for me. And even in my outreach, just being able to see people of all ages and occupations who are just generally interested and just concerned about environmental issues 
was super motivating for me to continue uh, my own learning and just continue on this path. So I was able to see some long-term and short-term impacts of the work I was given the opportunity to help with. So um, with the early detection, we were able to test this new way of doing it with just, you know, using these points and going straight to it. And we would sometimes be able to collect a few samples in a single day as opposed to what they used to do, which I never had to do, luckily. Um, which was just driving like really slowly and looking for plants and being like, that looks suspicious. And then you'd collect very, very few that way. But this way, you'd just be like, okay, yeah, we want to go to Kona and just collect like four plants. Cool. Um, and then long term, I hope that our outreach and education events will just inspire uh, anyone who is interested or even people who don't even think that they're interested to um, see steward land stewardship as a responsibility and not just a chore um but i have just been reminded honestly that people are generally good and strive to do the right thing um and this has given me some clarification for what i want to do as i'm considering my next steps after college i only have one more year left so also working back home in hawaii in the natural ecosystems that I grew up in has inspired me to come back home at some point and continue my work in the ecosystems and the community that raised me. Um, but I definitely feel a lot more ready to take on this task and I'm a lot more energized now after working with them. But before I finish, um, I just wanna say a huge mahalo to the Pipes Ohana and also um, Franny Brewer and Molly Murphy and Jade and everyone with VISC who made me feel so welcome. Um, I felt like I got to see a good snippet of what it's like to be a biscuit. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I really appreciate, appreciate you guys. You're all so wonderful, so awesome. Um, but yeah, that's all I have for you. Thank you. Mahalo, Violet. Thank you, Violet. Do we have any questions? And maybe this time, try to use the mic so that our audience on the uh, YouTube can hear. So she doesn't have to repeat stuff. Sorry, Noilani. No questions? Questions come? Oh. How's it? So, okay. Uh, okay. So, how's it? Um, so, in your opinion, how would you um, differentiate invasive versus in introduced? Um, so I also work in invasive species. I work in, um, I always talk to Kamaina, and some of them even see strawberry guava, which is one of the most invasive species as like, oh, they're beneficial because they provide fruits. And yeah, so I was wondering, in your opinion, when if you have to go to outreach and talk to those, you know, talk how to define invasive versus introduced, how would you like differentiate them? soon um well definitely not all species that are introduced are invasive i would just consider invasives to be the things that are harming and just grew wildly out of control i mean there's certain things that are technically not native like kalo or um you know ulu all those things they were brought here by people but they actually have a use i guess you could say that you can eat strawberry guava but you know, I would just tell you to maybe eat a different fruit. You don't, you don't need, stra <laughs> you, <laughs> we don't need strawberry guava. The birds are eating the strawberry guava and that's the problem. But um, yeah, definitely just how damaging they are um, for sure. <laughs> I have a question online. What was the ratio of local versus newer residents at the outreach activities that you helped at? Hmm, that is interesting. Um, kind of a good mix. There was a lot of people, um, after I, you know, got past the fact that they had, like, just moved here and they wanted to, like, I don't know, um, then it was kind of cool to talk to them because there was a few people who had just moved here, but they were, uh, really concerned about planting the right things. So they were asking me how they could go about, like, landscaping or what, plants would be best to plant in their yards. Um, 
definitely saw a lot of that when I was doing the Revitalized Pune event, like you guys were talking about earlier. I feel like there's an influx of people moving to Pune, and I definitely saw that when I was working out there. It seemed like a lot of people were um, had just moved here. Um, but, you know, I guess take the positives. They're trying to do the right thing, I guess, but, you know. <laughs> definitely a mix, a lot of keiki as well. Oh. Hi, Violet. Hi. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I was really intrigued by the, the, um, the statistic that you gave about the naturalized plants not being updated since 1992. That's a lot of years of things coming in. I'm just curious about what the next steps are with that. Is there going to be a new um, manual developed, or what are the next steps for getting the information, some of the stuff you learned this summer, into um, information for the public? Um, uh, that's something that you could do, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if if. <laughs> um, no, but uh, yeah, obviously just probably like the next generation hiring new people who can like look into that. Um, that's definitely a job that could be taken by someone, so you know, snatch that up, I guess, or make that available for as something that someone could do, because there's definitely a lot of work to be done in conservation, but um, yeah, I guess you're not the best person now if you're on your way out, but. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's your Pipes 2 next year. <laughs> yeah. Pipes 2.0, that's my next project. Pipes 2.0, we have another question, please use the mic, yes. sir. Uh, if you could get rid of one invasive, what would it be? Besides the one we're all thinking about. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> um, <laughs> hmm. I think that the one that has been making me the most mad lately is my conia because it's bright purple too so it's just really yelling at you that it's right there and i feel like every time we've gone on any of our huakai's that's all i'm focusing on <laughs> and it's honestly kind of it's, it's messing me up a little bit <laughs> i'm not gonna lie <laughs> all right any more questions uh, i think we could take one on? more one more and you're gonna make me go all the way across the room Oh, wait, did somebody else? I, I think point of clarification, the list that Violet referred to is not the weed list. I mean oh, the noxious weed list, yeah. Only people need to update that, but the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. So, mm -hmm. oh. so not IPIF? Are you sure I can get them to do it? Check, check. Oh. Okay, this is our last and final question. Okay, RVV. Okay, okay, okay. Um, hmm. now that I'm presenting. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, if you could do your like own education like program, um, to just educate people and like the next generation on what you um want to take as the next steps, would you include pipes with that? Like, would you invite us or like the next cohort and no, you know, n <laughs> possibly become like a pipes mentor in the future? Because I feel like we need, um, we're lacking a lot of uh people and hands in conservation, so um, I guess doing that kind of outreach, yes, okay, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I definitely would. That'd be really cool. Okay, can we have another round of applause to Violet? I'm going to move to this mic because that mic is dying. Um, and that concludes our first round of presentations for the pipe 29th Pipes Intern Symposium. Um, we have a break now um, until 10.30. Um, so please be back by no later than 10.27 um, because we will be introducing our next round. There's food outside. Please go eat. Um, Mahalo.
Chuk, chuk. Yeah, I can just turn it on standby. Huh? Check. Might as well just talk out of this one. Uh. I'll go get these in for you. We'll wait a couple more minutes before introducing our next presentation as people start coming in. Hopefully they're Coming in already. Are you gonna see all this party outside, huh? Okay, check, check, check. Okay, we're at 10.30, so we're gonna um, continue the presentations. Thank you for joining us online, whoever's online. I don't know what camera to look at. Okay, let's bring it back in, bring it back in, bring it back in. Can one of the responsible interns in here go grab the rest of the interns outside? Please do not party with the Puna peeps. Until after the symposium. So I'm gonna be the stickler and continue on the schedule. We're running out uh, one minute behind. Uh, okay, we get some Oli in outside us. I'm super excited to introduce this next person. She was my Kiahaloa intern when I was a program coordinator over there. And now she was able to be a part of Pipes. Um, hailing all the way from Vanuatu. There is, there is, a, there is a joke behind that one. Um, being able to work with um, Derry Muraoka at uh, DAR is Chloe Molo. Let's give her a round of applause. Okay. So All right. Okay. Mai, aloha kakayaka. My name is Chloe Toto Nurkiwa Nalial Molo. Today I'll be talking about my internship. Um, looking at marine science communication and connection with Division of Aquatic Resources Protected Species Program. So my childhood in Vanuatu was spent <laughs> was spent with many hours spent under a waterfall in a river or at a beach, surrounded by family and friends, or left to my own devices. Diving and snorkeling became one of my favorite hobbies as a child, and through it, I watched the slow decline of the reefs that raised me and that I so cherished, um, ultimately igniting a fire whose flames I still continue to feel today. And please notice that I said feel and not fan, because like, what you're gonna do, just fan it till it dies. You gotta fuel your fire. So in that same vein, I moved, I left home in Port Vila to come to Hilo to study marine science. And having since graduated this past May with my degree, <laughs> uh -huh. mahalo. I will now be returning home to Port Vila to work as a marine scientist, really in whatever capacity that is. I joined Pipes really hoping that it would help me prepare for this transition back home, but also as an opportunity to explore my interests as a marine scientist. 
I've always been drawn to community-based fisheries management, and I still see that for myself in the future. But this internship has really got me considering a job in marine education. But really more than anything, I think PIPES has helped me to reaffirm one of my ultimate goals, really, of being a good steward to the waters and the lands that raised me. So in my internship, I was very fortunate to work with my mentor, Darian Muraoka, who is the uh, Marine Education and Outreach Associate for the Protected Species Program. Um, PSP is a program under DLNR's Division of Aquatic Resources, and it works to better understand recreational fishery activities that can potentially be harmful to our pelagic protected species here in Hawaii. Um, some of those being our honu, our Hawaiian green sea turtle, our ea, our hawksbill turtle, turtle um, our ilio holo ika ua ua, the Hawaiian monk seal, our haha lua, the oceanic manta ray, uh, the oceanic white tip shark, and the false killer whale. Um, I helped with, I mainly worked uh, with the protected species um, with the marine outreach. Uh, education and outreach efforts, um, as well as promoting pono fishing activities and practices through the Barbless Circle Hook Project. I worked with school groups, summer camps, and fishers, talking about protected species, marine debris, um, and handing out barbless hooks. This summer, I worked with over 3,500 community members from around Hawaii and gave out more than 5,000 barbless fishing hooks. Fishing tournaments were a really, really big and one of my favorite parts of the internship. With the Barbless Circle Hook Project, um, I tabled and handed out barbless hooks at f Keiki and Adult Fishing Tournaments. Um, I tabled at the Estokunaga's Ulua Challenge here in Hilo, um, the Mililii Go For Broke Keiki Tournament, um, and the Kamalii Challenge uh, in Kauai. Um, during the first two tournaments, I used a spinning wheel with questions on various marine topics that our table covered, um, giving out prizes to both adult and keiki. Um, I was able to tailor the questions really to the audience as I prepared them beforehand and gave out prizes that kind of ranged from coloring books and stickers to headlamps and fish scalers. Now working with these community events and these fishing communities definitely challenged any fear that I had of public speaking or engaging with community members because not only did I have to engage with the public, I had to do it confidently and amiably. I had to do it, I had to learn how to be inviting and informative and most importantly important because as someone who has a three second attention span, you need to be important for me to listen to you. <laughs> so I took that on as a challenge and Quite honestly, it was incredibly daunting. As someone who didn't grow up fishing, I felt like quite an imposter walking around these tournaments, telling people to use barless hooks, something I have never even done. That being said, it also challenged me to find the similarities and the differences that I shared with these people. And I knew that there were two things that we definitely shared a great love for, the ocean and some good fish. So once I was able to move past that, I really, really started to enjoy this work and being able to meet so many groups of new people. Another thing I really be began to enjoy was working with Keiki, something I honestly never thought I would say. Chaperoning hokai's and presenting about protected species and barbless hooks, um, marine debris and ankyline ponds. I worked with students from the Lanakila Learning Center, LOC, Mililii Levaita Camp and the Waikoloa Dry Forest Camp. So after presenting about protected species and marine debris to LLC just the day before, uh, I helped to host a marine debris cleanup down at the Liliuokalani Gardens, um, where our hui collected trash from Isles to Mokuola. Um, our hui collected over 1,500 pieces of debris, weighing over 35 pounds, um, and we categorized them all, finding that the two most common types were glass and plastic. I continued to work with LLC over the summer, chaperoning a Hoakai to Punalu'u Beach Park, uh, where the students were able to see fresh uh, air nesting tracks um, and learn more about Hono and air from the Hawksville Project Hui. The last Hoakai that I chaperoned for LLC was to Kekai Ola, the Marine Mammal Center, um, where we were given a tour of the facility um, and I helped to present about barbless hooks. Taking what I learned actually from the Hawksville Project Hui, 
Uh, I presented uh, to the Melili Ulavaya camp about turtles, talking about the differences between Honu and Ea, while my mentor Darian talked about barbless hooks, and we gave out their own little bags of barbless hooks. Finally, I chaperoned an alkaline pond, um, Huakai, to the Waikoloa Dry Forest Camp, um, along with um, De Darian and Devin, who I see in the back, so shout out. Um, we looked for opai ula, Hawaiian red shrimp, identified tilapia and mosquito fish, um, and talked about other current threats to alkaline ponds in Hawaii. Now this summer, I was able to malama very different aina in a lot of different ways. Um, working with LLC at Kekai Ola, I helped to clear grass, cut sugar bush, and clear kiawe from their coastline, sh their shoreline access. Um, I was also very fortunate um, in being able to visit beautiful Kahuwai in Puna, learn about the place and its history, and spend time giving back to the space. Um, I helped to clear their halau wa'a and collect kamani plants that would be later distributed. Um, as someone who loves the ocean, though, I realized that I could malama aina through different aspects of my work. I could care for shorelines by collecting discarded fishing line and trash from receptacles, and also by organizing marine debris, debris cleanups. I think one of the most unsuspecting ways, though, that I found to malama aina was through working with keiki. I loved introducing them to new things or simply providing a space for them to further their interests helping a whole new generation of stewards better understand and care for the spaces around them, what I considered an investment in thriving Aina. One of my final tasks was to create new educational products or resources to be used by PSP at future outreach events. Um, I used what I learned from the different huokais and events and huis and some of the really outdated resources um, and created a brand new um, or just a new fishing around sea turtles flyer, as well as a two-sided Honu and Ea ID card that included Hawaiian names for as many of the identifying features as possible. My hope with these was really to create resources that could be used um, by a wide audience as PSP tries to reach both adults and keiki alike, um, but also resources that use more alelo Hawaii than those that had been created before. This project I really enjoyed because it was an opportunity for me to be creative and artistic and also really challenge my graphic design skills, which she did not have. But she overcame that slump, and I'm actually very, very happy with the final product. I think besides my newfound interest in marine education, one of my biggest takeaways from this experience is really rooted in my indigeneity. Um, working with Darian helped me to remind me that my work should not only be a place for me to highlight my indigenous values, but also to strengthen them. It's important for us to stand strong in our indigenous values and continue to vocalize concerns and suggestions and just thoughts for our agencies and organizations to continue speaking for those being ignored. I'm forever worried about the ancestor that I want to be and will become, but only recently have I really started to think about the descendant that I want to be who I carry with me in my life and how I carry them. A fact I think I'm often too quick to forget is that we are all our ancestors' wildest dreams. So if anything, just continue to be wild for them. So, kumpalong tama, mahalo nui for everyone for listening. Um, and thank you for all the sponsors at the bottom for the money because we really like it. So, <laughs> thank you, mahalo. Mahalo nui. Does anybody have any questions for Chloe? And I will run to you with the magic mic. <laughs> magic mic, sorry. Not that kind of magic mic. <laughs> Should we give it to Devin? Oh, yeah. Devin. Hi, Devin. Okay, aloha. Chloe, um, it Aloha. was nice working with you this summer, and that was yeah, an awesome mahalo. presentation. Got a little dust in the eye at the end, yeah. <laughs> but mahalo. Um, I guess my question would be, um, what was like one of the most interesting things you learned this summer working with Darian, doing all the different camps, um, working with Mauna Kea Learning Center, all that? Like, what was the most interesting thing you learned, or like, I guess took away even from that? Yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Devin. Uh, do I have to repeat the question? Sorry. No, you don't. Okay, because okay. we use the mic. I'm just checking. Um, I don't know. It I think I was really fortunate this internship to work with a lot of really, really interesting people and get to um, visit a lot of places and go to a lot of places that I never would have before. Um, I think honestly one of the most interesting things or maybe most unexpected or just something I didn't really think I was gonna take away from this is just honestly how vital fishing and fishers are to our coastlands and the health of our coastlands because they are like the true stewards of that land. And so having connection and listening to those stewards, I think is like incredibly important and something that I really took away from this project. Yeah, so mahalo. Mahalo, Chloe, Ooh. and there's timer. Um, we have a question online. Yeah. From what you experienced slash learned here in Hawaii, what will you want to share slash mm. implement back in Vanuatu? Mm, so many things. Um, I think, honestly, drawing specifically from like Lanakila Learning Center, shout out Kumu Wendy and Kumu Wailin, Um I think that's a design that I'm really interested in. Um, especially with how they, um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought, but just how they teach students. They take the, like, especially with Kila over the summer, their entire curriculum is filled almost entirely with huakais and being outside and meeting people on the land, being, like, feeling connected to their spaces. Um, and this is also for a group of students who otherwise aren't really recognized or given their flowers, I will say. And a lot of times it's just because they need different resources, they need different support, they need different aloha, really. Um, and so I think that's something that I wanna take home with me, um, and especially for like in town where a lot of underprivileged students don't really have the opportunity to be out in the, in the aina. So definitely that. Thank you. Do we have one more question? One more. Yeah, Makoa. Okay, Makoa. Okay, so the question was asking about a gap in knowledge um, with locals specifically looking at coastlines and like their relationship to the water. Um, I think um, I think the word gap uh, can also be, sorry, I'm gonna think about this for a second before I say anything. I think the gap that we consider is also just like, it's a different relationship that people have. Um, and so I think the to bridge this gap of um, whatever it may be, I, I think it's really just fixing our relationship, or just changing our relationship with the waters that feed us and the land that surrounds us um, because there's a lot of ideologies that look at land very differently um, and see it as nothing more than just something you can continue to pull resources out of. Um, and so that I think is where the gap lies, but I think it really is just what we see as our relationship to these places that yeah needs to be changed. So mahalo for your question. Mahalo Nui, can we give another round of applause to Chloe? Um, the, the next person, I'm actually excited for these next four presentations as well um, because these are our partners that are specifically in the Hono Hono Nui region or Ili Kupono, um, or I don't even know if that's right. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to state it here and look at the people that know um, if it is a Ili Kupono or not. Um, our next presenter hails all the way from Waiakea. Somewhere in Hilo. Um, 
Maui. I was thinking of Mia when I when I actually. That's embarrassing. I, I came up confident though, huh? He's actually from Maui. And I was connected to Koa Lave. Anyway, um, is Matt Idioka, who worked with Kumuola uh, this year, um, with Nalumid and Mike Kalani. So, without further ado. <laughs> Sorry, brother. everyone, my name is Matthew Lioka, and today I'll be presenting my, my research experience on exploring the optimal salinity for larval opaihuna. So, a quick self-introduction to start things off. I was born and raised in Wailuku on the island of Maui. <laughs> um, I currently attend the University of Hawaii at Hilo, working towards a bachelor's in agriculture with the uh, aquaculture specialty. And I also work at UH Hilo's pack rack facility down in Keokaha. So my host site this summer was the Kumuola Marine Science Education Center. This program is working with Hamana of Kamehameha Schools and collaborating with field and research experts to rehabilitate and maximize the resources in their local. So here are my mentors and the Opai crew. I would like to give a huge mahalo to my mentors, Nalu Mead, Trisha Oleon, and Michaelani Glendon Backley for supporting me through this experi experience. Um, the OPI crew consisted of myself, two high school research aides from Kamehameha Schools, and Shayla, another PIPES intern who will be pre presenting next. Um, so prior to welcoming me as a PIPES intern, my mentors commit to planning year-round school or community work days along with educational curriculum. But aside from planning, one of the main research projects that they're working on is using genetics to distinguish the differences between the native ama ama and the invasive conda during its juvenile stage. So, oh. so here's a map of the Kumuola loko ia and its important components. So within this ecosystem, there are three separate loko ia. Their names are Vaiohole, Kapalaho, and Vaiopio. So the Kumuola Marine Science Education Center is located on Hawaii Island within the Moku of Hilo, the Ahupua of Vaiokea, and the Ilikupon of Honohononui. Um, so here's a picture of Vaiohole. It's the largest of three loko ia on site, and its name refers to two of the most important resources of the space, which are vai, fresh water, and the native ahole fish. So to orient you to space, our direction, down here is Mauka, and up there is Makai. So Kapalaho is the local ia closest to Makai, and Prior to the development of Kalaniana Ole Street, Kapalaho used to extend to Keokaha Road. And due to the development of this road, um, the exchange of water has severely been reduced. So here's Vaiopio, somewhere back here. The name Vaiopio has a dual translation of either a young loko ia that will emerge with sea level rise, or that this area was designated for juvenile fish. As of now, access to Vaiopio is limited because it's overgrown with invasives. So shown in this photo is the Makaha. This is our only direct connection to the ocean. Uh, the function of this Makaha is to trap recruiting pool or juvenile fish and prevent adult fish from escaping during tidal fluctuations. So these are the pool ponds. After juveniles are caught in the makaha, they're transported to the pool ponds, which is an enclosed area for them to grow without predation. So, 
These are the inhabitants of the loco. Here we have a nice school of ama ama. These are the only three Trevelli in the loco. These are some other photos of ea and invertebrates. But our two main food fish in this loco are the ama ama and the hole. So moving on to my hua. As a Lavaita, I have a deep understanding of the marine food web and enjoy incorporating this knowledge into my fishing techniques. One of my favorite fishing methods is to work up the food chain using live bait, especially opai. So I found an interest to conduct research on opai because they form the base of the local eel food web and contribute to the growth of the hole, which is an important resource of this space. So here's some background information on the species my research was based on. Opaihuna are benthic organisms that inhabit marine or brackish water environments. They are urihaline, meaning that they can tolerate a wide range of salinities. Um, and adults are found in the four parts per thousand water of our local eel. So here's an opai larvae. Like all other zooplankton, they play an essential role to the food web of the local eel and also to the near shore environment. They are positively phototactic, meaning that they are attracted to light. And so far, stage one has been the only stage identified in our loco. It's believed that a salinity higher than 15 parts per thousand is required for the further larval development. So moving on to my research question, although there is no background data, we believe the development of Kalaniana Ole Street has reduced the exchange of water through the Makaha and ultimately lowered the salinity of our water. So it's a theory that most organisms that inhabit the loco, including opai, require a high, higher level of salinity to complete their life cycle. Given that the salinity of our loco eel is at four parts per thousand, my research question was, what function does our local eel serve to its smallest resources? Does the salin salinity of our local eel support larval development, or do, they, or do these organisms end up dying in our local within the few, few first days of their life? So in order, in order to understand the larval stages, we first had to catch the larvae. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're positively phototactic. Uh, attracted to light, so this is why a light trap was used to capture them. So here are what some of our catches look like. As you can see here, this is the backwards swimming behavior of them during their larval stages. Um, opai larvae were not the only zooplankton caught in our traps. We also caught both crab and uh, opai, as you can see here. It's kind of hard to see, but there's an opai. All these black ones are crab. Okay. So moving on to the larval development, there are seven zoea and two megalop stages of larval development before reaching the juvenile stage. So here at stage one, this is the stage we catch them in, at our tra in our traps. Um, during this stage, their eyes are sessile, meaning that they're stuck in their head, pretty much, and oil globules from the egg reserves are still present. At stage two, their eyes begin to protrude out and become stalked. At stage three, this is when their tail begins to split. By the fourth stage, their walking legs become fully developed. In the fifth stage, these buds of their swimming legs begin to form on the abdomen. At stage six, their swimming legs become elongated. And by the last stage, their swimming legs become baramis, meaning that they divide into two branches. Ooh. 
So moving on to my methods, my experiments were conducted in mason jars with a 500 milliliter volume of water. Our salinity treatments were measured using a YSI. Looking at the feeding methods used, we fed our larvae a mix of melosyra, which is a single cell diatom, and artemia, also known as brine shrimp, were added for each feeding. So photo and video monitoring was used to track growth and food consumption. Uh, in this video, we can see a stage five zoella excreting food through its digest digestive system. And it's always a huge accomplishment to see food in their gut. So this is my data collection of exploring salinity ranges. Uh, in the pilot experiment shown here, survival was only seen in the four parts per thousand treatment. This suggested to narrow down salinities between four and 15 parts per thousand. So after narrowing down the salinities, survival was seen in the, in the four, eight, and 12 parts per thousand treatments. So this graph here shows a percent of survival over five days in differ different salinity treatments. Um, the highest ending value was seen in the eight parts per thousand treatment with a value of 57%. So here's additional data on the variability of density of opai larvae caught at different locations in the local eel. Uh, but my partner Shayla will discuss more about this in her presentation. Um, to close this presentation, I would like to reflect on my research question. What function does our local eel serve to its smallest resources? So through this research, we can now believe that the sal salinity of our local is able to support the larval development of opisoia. Um, this provides us with a better understanding that our local does not only import resources, but also exports them to the surrounding environment. Uh, one of the first issues we were presented with was a lack of knowledge on this species. When we first started our experiments, they would end up dying the next day and we would have to constantly restart our experiments. Uh, at the time, we couldn't keep them, pa keep them alive past five days. However, through trial and error, we successfully reared a few larvae to the megalop stage within the, pa within the past 30 days. But over my overall experience, this was a great ex uh, introduction to the research field. Uh, from the support of my mentors and my OPI crew, I believe that I gained new skills and knowledge. I definitely stepped out of my comfort zone. And ultimately, I hope to strengthen my relationship with my host site and my mentors as I continue to grow as a researcher. Um, lastly, I would like to thank the National Science Foundation, the Holy Maoloa Foundation, the Pipes Ohana, and the University of Hawaii at Hilo for providing me with this experience. Thank you. Mahalo nui. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but I think we could take one question. Anybody got a really awesome question for Matt? No, we'll take questions after Sheila's one, because they have kind of a Oh, yeah. Why <laughs> kill? <laughs> All right, Mahalo and Matt for a wonderful presentation. I'd like to introduce Sheila Kiyota, our next presenter. Mahalo, Sheila. Come on, come share your experience. Aloha, uh, my name is Shayla, and similar to Matt, I got the opportunity to work with Kumuola Marine Science Education Center this, or this summer, and I focused on the feeding habits of opai larvae in the local uh, of Kumuola. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from the island of Oahu in the Ahupua'a 
of Manana, also known as Pearl City, um, and I grew up in a smaller community known as Pacific Palisades. Um, for my college, I am entering my fifth year at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, majoring in marine science with a minor in Hawaiian studies. Um, and some of my passions include really anything to do with the ocean, whether it be diving or snorkeling, just going to the beach, um, but also teaching people about, my, about marine science from my perspective, um, also being marine science major with that minor in Hawaiian studies. Um, and also including what I know about the Hawaiian language, culture, and history. So like what Matt talked about a little bit, um, our host organization was Kamehameha Schools Kumuola Marine Science Education Center. Um, and then again, the crew, um, our mentors, and then the student research aides. Yeah. And then the location of Kumuola Marine Science Education Center, again, in on Hawaii Island, in the Moku of Hilo, Ahupua'a of Waiakea, and Ilikupono of Honohonunui. And then Matt went a little bit more into detail about the three loko'i'a, Vaiohole, Kapalaho, and Vaiopio. But this is a composition of the 1923 and 1932 map of the loko'i'a in Waiakea. Um, and then in this map, this was before Kalaniana Ole Street was built. So here is Vaiohole, Vaiopio back here and Kapalaho is right around here. Yeah. And then a day in the life of a kia'i loko'i'a consisted of a lot more than just um, research with our opai, but it included um, working with school groups. Um, and then we also shared a little bit of information that we've been um, collecting when we've been looking at the opai larvae. Um, every week we've also done ia surveys. Um, pretty much looking at the ama, ama all the way from the ama, ama to the ahole and even the invasive species we do have in the local year. And then we also did genetics and worked with fish. Um, so literal translation of a kia'i local year is, uh, is one who protects the fish ponds, who ensures that everything from the zooplankton, like our opai larvae, to the anai are thriving in our space. Um, so we really wanted to see how we can um, intervene, where we intervene into their life stage to really help them thrive. So that leads us to our research question. Um, and for me specifically, what are the food sources a kia'i could apply at different larval stages to enhance the growth of opai larvae? And then also, what is the density of opai larvae at different locations in the local ia? And then through these research questions, the overarching goal is really to understand the function of a local ia in relation to the development of opai larvae and how us as kia'i local ia can play a role in their life cycle, in their environment. So again, um, these are our zooplankton traps um, that have their LED lights that we start um, pretty much to catch our opai to start the experiments and really to collect density. Then these are our, um, some of our opai that we do find in the local ia. The two again mainly being the opai huna and then the opai oiha'a. And then this little guy, his name is Kevin. Um, <laughs> he's a uh, opai that we have caught in our trap before. Um, we have Kevin number one and Kevin number two. Um, but we have not yet been able to accurately identify him. Yeah. Then these are our um, opai zoea stages. Again, they do have seven zoea stages with two megalop. Um, so in the beginning, when we first catch them, they do have those sunken in eyes, paddle-like tail, and then through development, and under the microscope, this is under the microscope, in person, they're really like 2.3 millimeters, very small. Um, and over time, they slowly develop eye stalks and their tail splits. Um, slowly, they grow in size all the way to Zoea 6 and Zoea 7, where the lay, the swimming legs start to come out as well. Yeah. 
And then now, focusing on um, the density collection of our OPI larvae, um, we set up our traps nine times um, throughout last, the last couple of weeks. Um, we have always set up one trap at our pua pond, which was always our control, because we always knew that there was always going to be a enough there, really, to um, and really to see if there's a consistency among the days. So we set up at the pua pond, and all the way from Mauka to Makai, Makai being like um, where the Makaha is, we set up the traps to see if there's um, a trend, really, of the density from Mauka to Makai. So all the way from behind the Ahole tree, which is all the way back here, um, grass carp territory, and all the way through all the mokus, and then leading into An Pond, which is this one right here, and then finally the Makaha. So, um, when we were looking at density, again, our research question was what is the density of opai larvae at different locations in the local ea? And this is a cute uh, video that we got um, early on of just how dense our catches are sometimes. Um, and then this video includes a lot of like crab and um, opai. This table was created um, to look at the density of our opai larvae between the different traps from Mauka to Makai. And as you can see, based on the locations, this is most Mauka. This is um, Makai, all the way leading to the Makaha. There was a very distinct trend showing that there was um, high abundance of uh, opai in like most Malka sec uh, sections rather than Makai, and then the Makaha having zero. I also included this graph that shows um, the days that we did um, collect our density. And then the light blue is our pool pond, so it was showing great variation among the days. And this graph as well um, just shows our total zooplankton per trap at the pool pond, um, showing that we don't only catch opai, but also crab. Then now going into feeding, um, again, the research question for this is what food sources could a uh, kia'i lokui'a apply at different larval stages to enhance the growth of opai larvae? So these are the three main um, food sources that we were giving them. In the beginning, it was green water, which is pretty much pool wa uh, pond water that was enhanced with fertilizer. Um, Another one were these little alien things. Uh, day one, Artemia, also known as brine shrimp or sea monkeys. And then the last one was Melosyra. And this is just a video of pretty much the, so much uh, Melosyra that you can find at Kealoha Beach Park that's right across the street of Kumuola and found right next to Haleolono. So over, we went through many trials and errors. Um, so at first we did start them on green nutrient rich water, um, but then we saw a lot of die off. So then we moved them to green water and brine shrimp. There's still a lot of die off then. And then we finally moved them to green water plus melosyra and brine shrimp to create that ecosystem. But ultimately we eliminated the green water and we found that the optimal feeding regimen was melosyra and brine shrimp. So although um, we were feeding them melosyra that can be found in that environment, brine shrimp, not so much. Um, so we had a subject matter expert, um, name is Uncle Vernon Sato, who gave us a little bit of information on opai larvae and also said that at some point they do need protein to continue thriving. He said you can use um, aku meat that's washed and pushed through a mesh and then into those little chunks and they can start feeding on those. But he also said you can use tilapia. Um, so I was really excited about that because we, uh, tilapia is a major um, invasive species in the local ea. So um, within the last couple of weeks um, of the internship, uh, we caught them and then started them on the same melosyra on day one and then melosyra and brine shrimp day two to four, but then on day five, I took the chance with um, tilapia 
And as you can see in this video, it's one of our um, young opai larvae that latches onto it, holds onto it, swims around, and pretty much feeds on it. And in this video, you can actually see it starting to fill its gut right here. Um, and then, as seen in Matt's video, will be um, excreted. Yeah. And then this is the process of making it, yeah, all the way from catching it to filleting it, putting it in the food processor, making them into these little chunks that end up going into their jar and they feed on these little um, chunks of tilapia meat. And then now, there were so much accomplishments and challenges that we experienced throughout our internship. Um, one major thing was we are now able to understand more about the complex developmental stages of opai larvae um, because there's very little information known about their development, let alone in a local ia. Um, and then again, we did have like a lot of trials and errors throughout uh, so, so many times where we had to restart. But then something that was so rewarding at the end was in the beginning, we started with our opai that lived only to like day five at the most. But by the end, today we have four 30-day-old opai larvae just entering their megalop stage. And this is what a photo of them from yesterday or a couple days ago. Um, so very well developed and this is the same guy who has like li little food on his face um but yeah all the swimming legs and everything is developing so it's such a great thing to see um that our little babies are growing and for future studies this is a little video of like how where they started at like they have really grown so much um throughout our experiments but for uh future studies, um, we have answered so much questions, yet there are endless questions to still be asked, like what conditions do they thrive in in our local ia, and can they thrive without predators? Um, and also, what are the optimal conditions for opai in their megalop and juvenile stages, so this stage, because we've only been looking at them in their larval stages. Um, and then finally, are we collecting both opai huna and opai oiha because we've been comparing them to the stages uh, of an opai huna. Yeah. And then from my experience, um, that's a really big photo actually. <laughs> but um, I've become much more confident and comfortable as a researcher um, through this experience. Um, and also as a kia'i loko i'a, I really learned through experience and um, really learned of that kuleana that we have as a kia'i loko i'a to our space. Um, and also learning that when you are part of this like amazing hui through pipes and kumuola, um, we really embrace our strengths and challenge our weaknesses. Um, and it, it's always better to have a team around you to support and really challenge each other. And then I wanted to say a big mahalo to some of the funders and supporters. Um, the National Science Foundation, Hauoli Mauloa Foundation, um, Pipes, and the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Yeah, and mahalo. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah. Matt, maybe go stand up there with Sheila. Do we have any questions for Sheila or Matt? And Matt, and or Matt. I have a, there's a question online. What's the live life expectancy of the opai? Also, are they are there more programs? Are they more programs that expecting to grow in ca sorry? Um, expecting to grow in ca captivity and release into the wild. Are there programs that I, I think uh, the question is? Are there there are programs that are trying to grow them in captivity so that they can be released into the wild? Yeah, so um, there are no programs that are looking at growing opai in their hatchery. There are things of like growing larval fish and things like that, but not a lot on growing opai. That was actually a question that we did get asked during one of our school groups, um, and we are not exactly sure of the 
life expectancy of them, but they do reach their adults. Um, they should reach their adult within 30 days, 20 to 30 days. Um, but it's not, I would say they don't live like very long though. Yeah. Hallelujah. Do we have any other questions for? So for one of your graph, I believe the density was the greatest at uh, Mauka site. Yes, is that correct? Yeah. Um, yes. What do you think the ecological pressure that made them crowd more to Mauka site, like salinity, predator, predator pressure, or what? What do you think is the biggest pressure that you know? And do, you th and second part of the is that um, do you think the construction of the road also kind of affected the density as well? Um, so I think we found a higher density of the opai larvae in the Malka section, most likely because of the, the hydrodynamics of the local eel. Through tide changes, a lot of these organisms get flushed out of our makaha. So that's why we've seen pretty much nothing at the makaha. Um, and yeah, I think I, I believe that the road did play an impact on the density of our opai larvae. Mahalo, I think we have one more question. Yeah. So he was pretty much asking like what the the optimal salinity is and how sea level rise will affect their presence or their abundance. Um, so from the experiments that I conducted, I found that survival was highest in the eight parts per thousand treatment. So yeah, definitely with sea level rise, our opi are me hmm. <laughs> I don't know I can't I, I can't really answer that one like uh, yeah sorry Mahalo can we give another round of applause for <laughs> Sailor and Matt Not only Sheila, I mean, um, Brother Matt. Um, I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, all the way from the God's country, New Jersey. New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm proud to introduce our next speaker, um, Raz Benjamin Rocktail. Hello. Happy birthday, by the way. Happy birthday, by the way. All right, what's going on guys? I'm super psyched to be here today um, and today I'll be presenting this project Deep Learning to Determine Coral Cover and Health which I completed this summer with the Mega Lab at uh, UH Hilo. So we're going to be going into some complex ideas today but I just wanted to start out with something a little bit more digestible which is why I'm here to begin with and it's not even really because of science it's because of my family history. My grandparents came as immigrants to the U.S. from Korea, and they worked their way, as many immigrants do, through the educational system, and they actually found themselves um, as some of the first Koreans to attend Harvard University. And after that, they went and completed their PhDs in L.A., and they came to UH Manoa, where they worked as professors. This was a really important place for my family because it was the first place that we were more than immigrants and that we felt connected to the community, and it was also where my mom and her siblings grew up. And I never really got the chance to experience this, but my mom imprinted, me a, imprinted on me from when I was a kid just a sense of stewardship for our environment, but also from my grandparents just having that work ethic that if you work hard enough, you can do anything you want. Um, and for me, I, science began in the woods and streams around my house. I lived in New Jersey. I didn't really grow up by the ocean, but I was jumping into any pool of water that I could find. But as I grew older, I found myself being more detached from these places, and I still went to college to study science, but I studied biotechnology, and I really loved it. But after a couple years, I found myself just completely disconnected from what had brought me to science in the first place. And 
Then I decided to make a drastic switch from a career that had kind of a cushy, cushy job to something that's much more unstable, which is marine science and marine biology, which I haven't regretted at all. And I've been spend, spending the last few years working in marine toxicology, studying pollutant, pollutants in sharks at the Georgia Aquarium, which led me here this summer to the Mega Lab. So I got to work under a group of scientists this summer, uh, Dr. John Burns, Dr. Cliff Capona, and Dr. Hanani Kane, who are scientists who I really admire. And they study interdisciplinary methods to assess marine health and uh, coastal ecology as well. And I specifically started working under Kainalu Stewart and Brianna Ninmoto, where we began restoring the Kalmawi fish ponds, which are on the Kilkawa coast, where we did where we had our study site. And we also did remote sensing for water quality within these areas by dropping sensors into these different fish ponds and seeing what happened over the course of the king tides this past month. And you can see here, this is one of the king tides, and you can see the drastic differences between the low and the high tides here. And this higher tide here, as you can see, all this different flooding here and just increased water movement. This is the projected high tides of the coming decades with sea level rise and global warming. And something interesting that you can note too is, so these fish ponds over here are the same fish ponds that I flew my drone over in the last video. And these fish ponds connect to the ocean and they actually have a large influence on reefs and reef ecology because there are fish that are connected that swim through between the locuia and the reefs. And with sea levels rising, it's going to change the quality of the water. It might change the temperature as well. And these even act as filtration systems um, after storms. So different sediments that might settle on the reef might get filtered out by the locuia. So that kind of brings us to my focus, which was coral reefs at risk. So I wanted to look at coral reefs because coral reefs cover around less than 1% of the ocean floor, but harbor over a fourth of total marine biodiversity. And without these reefs, these warm water ecosystems are actually pretty nutrient poor and substrate poor. Reefs are really stress intolerant. They don't do well with any kind of change. So global warming and sea level rise is a huge concern for reefs because they will easily damage, uh, disease can spread, they can bleach, and that can often lead to mass death. So completing a coral reef health survey can be really time consuming, expensive, and difficult, but I saw a way to use machine learning to try to automate this for us so it would happen faster and we could have an easy way and a standardized way of assessing the health of a reef maybe before and after a bleaching event or during some sort of king tide event. So now we're gonna get into some more complicated subjects, so just bear with me, and if you don't want to, you just look at the pretty pictures. And so starting with computer vision and machine learning, computer vision and natural language processing were two of the first machine learning tasks, and there have been massive improvements in both, but specifically in computer vision within the past years. And computer vision is, as you can see on the right, it's just getting a computer to recognize different images and understand what they are. So the way that it's commonly done is through this thing called a convolutionary neural network, which is basically an artificial neural network. And a neural network is the way that your neurons work within your brain. So as you can see in figure A in the top, it's a schematic of neurons. And the way that a neuron works is it has an electrical impulse or a chemical impulse that, or a signal as an impulse that spreads across from an input to an output. And if the strength is strong enough, then it'll fire onto the next neuron, and that'll be an input for that next neuron. And it goes on and on. And this process can be exponential. You can have a large network of neurons. And we model this through having nodes within a network with these different arrows that connect them. And these nodes are individual neurons. That's the model of that. And these arrows are the models of the electrical signals. And we model them through something called weights and biases, which we train, and that's how the model can recognize different images and different impulses. And there's also a threshold, so if it reaches, if the signal is strong enough, if the weights and biases are strong enough, it will fire and then it will keep the network going. So the way that images are recognized is images are recognized by different edge detections. So 
let's say you have a line that's oriented just like this, and maybe some neurons will recognize that, and some neurons will recognize lines like this. And filters will be run over data, and only important edges and important features will be taken out, and everything else will be discounted. And the result is you'll have an augmented images that basically highlights just the things that you want. So in my case, it was corals. So I wanted the shape of corals and the shape of rocks and the shape of other things and recognizing what's a coral and what's not a coral. And when you have a larger model, it ends up looking something like this. This is where you can visually process it. You'll have a large model with a lot of neurons and when different lines of different orientations show up, in this case, it's numbers, different parts of the network will be stimulated and it will remember those mappings of weights and biases that will give you an output, let's say, number eight or number seven. And those specific, every time there's an image that somewhat resembles that, those same processes will fire. And that's actually similar to how your brain works with detecting images. Um, we go from small edges to kind of larger features. So the way that I thought about doing this was I wanted to take and annotate data. So I wanted to go individually dive at, the, at my site and take pictures of corals and then take pictures of non-corals, kind of getting a whole overview of the reef and looking at what's there, substrate and reef, and then annotating the pictures. So looking at where are the corals, where are the areas of tissue loss and the areas of predation damage, which were the two main health detriments that I found. And then I wanted to create a recognition model that could just differentiate pictures that has a coral and pictures that don't have a coral and see if that worked. And then after that, I wanted to look and create a model that would recognize the different health detriments. So looking at where's the coral and then where is the tissue loss or where is the predation damage. After that, I wanted to create a visual output because it would be useless to just make this model and then have no one understand what it does or not be able to use it. So I wanted to create something that someone could see and someone could, it could speed up kind of the process of looking at a map or a picture of corals. Then I wanted to automate it so that you wouldn't actually have to know Python or any code um, to run this model. And then I wanted to iterate it over large reef maps because the point of this in the end is to look at larger spaces and not just look at a singular picture and see if there's a coral there or not. So this was my field site, it's called Lehala, and it's actually right near uh, the Lokia that was just presented by Shayla and Matt, and it's also near uh, Kamaui, which is the um, site where I ran my drones in the video earlier. And it's a pretty protected pool. There's a lot of coral growth, as you can see by this video, and it's fairly shallow, which makes for dangerous sampling. And there's, I had a couple incidents with Vana, which is <laughs> difficult. But what I got out of my sampling was I, I took GoPro pictures and I annotated them for coral and I annotated them for these, this you can see on the right, this is uh, predation damage and it's very hard to see and there wasn't that much of it and it's hard to see on other color, colors of corals too. So that was one of the issues that I encountered. Um, but tissue loss was pretty easy to see and that was kind of the main health detriment in this area. And I recognized two issues in trying to create the model. And those two issues were one, recognizing coral and two, creating an output and recognizing where in the photo the coral was. So the way that I started this problem is I wanted to go very simple. So I started with uh, a VGG model architecture, which is an image classification, basically tell you if something's in a photo or not. And that's what I did with the coral. And I found that it worked really well, but it kind of had no influence. It, it didn't really matter if I could just say there's a coral in a picture. Then I had to output it. So I took the photos that, it, that I put in and I put an output of just the photos of corals, and then I would run them through another model called YOLO V8, which is a newer model, and it's used for object detection. So that's where the photos would come in, and then you would get an actual visual output of where the corals are and what's happening to the corals. And I did it in a sequ sequential method, so I would have an image, go first model, that would output just what I want, so just pictures of corals. If you were to take pictures of a large reef, you would just get those corals, and then you would have run it through the second model and get your final output. And my results varied. The first model that I ran it through had a really good accuracy. 
as you can see by the confusion matrix. And basically, basically these numbers are individual numbers of photos. And these shaded squares here on this diagonal line are the ones that it classified correctly. And these shaded squares, it, accurate, it classified incorrectly. So there was a very high percent, around a 99% accuracy rate. And it did this by basically changing the variables within the photos themselves and changing, so it basically recognized cluster non-coral pictures as having different features as seen by this PCA plot on the left than coral pictures. So you can see that they're two kind of distinct clusters and it's uh, pretty normal that there's a lot of distribution because corals vary. There are different types of corals. There are, corals come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, and these are the actual filters. If you remember earlier when I talked about filters, these were the filters and this is how the model recognized edges. So you can see that the original photos look very different from the different stages of filtering. And this was how the model detected edges to kind of look at where the coral was. The second part of the model did not work as well. And this is always something with science. Things, things never really work the way you want them to. But it still kind of worked. So we had a almost 74% accuracy in classifying corals, but much, much lower percents in uh, characterizing the damage to the corals, so predation damage and tissue loss. And I attribute that mainly to having a much smaller uh, set of data. The corals within the Lihala pool are pretty healthy, and there weren't as many annotated images of corals with tissue loss, and that might have been from random sampling, but with larger data sets, I'm confident that the accuracy would be much higher than the 13% seen in tissue loss and the 0% seen in predation damage. But I still saw that over the course of training the model, which are the epochs, which is how many times I let my model run through the data and learn, I saw that as I increased those, um, my loss got lower. So basically the amount that it got wrong got lower. And the result was something that looked like this. You would take in many photos that contain, some contain corals and some don't contain corals. And your resulting output would just be pictures of corals with boxes around corals and different color coded boxes representing tissue loss here. While it's not perfect, it's a start and it can be built off of. So what I'll be doing in the future is extending my computational pipeline, which is basically the last step of my method. So iterating it over reef maps instead of just inputting individual photos. Um, because the Mega Lab uses spatial analysis, they have a lot of data that encompasses large spaces that you can't just take with one photo. It could be 100, it could be 200 photos stitched together. And I wanna run these maps, these high resolution maps through a model that can characterize where exactly these corals are and what's happening to them. The last thing I wanna do is segmentation analytics. So I wanna go into percent uh, summary statistics regarding percent coral cover as well as uh, percent health detriments. And this is an example of unsupervised learning. So actually um, telling my model that there are subclasses within our classes. And this is, without me adding anything to my model, this is what my model recognizes right now, which is a good start. It traces corals well. Obviously it doesn't do as well with tissue loss, but again, that's because of a lack of data. And uh, completing this in the future will help to create a full um, coral health surveillance method that is easily accessible. So lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the people who helped me over the course of the summer, which is the entire Mega Lab. Thank you for being here. And uh, specifically, Kainalu Stewart, Brianna Nimoto, um, Nalu Okana, Mina Viratua, Vai Needham, Alex Spandler, and Arthur Young. And um, I'd also like to thank all the people who funded me because I definitely could not have been here without that funding. So thanks for that. Um, Mahalo me. Do we have any questions for Raz? Razzy Raz, do we have any questions for Raz? We have one online. Um, so the question online is from Winston Peloso. Um, <laughs> I thought there's been a lot of activity online here. Um, what is the convergence criterion, or are you limited by the size of your data set? Um, yeah, I am limited by the size of my data set. Um, these models are trained on millions of images on something called ImageNet. And 
I have in the hundreds of images, and I'm creating, I'm telling the model to learn new objects and classes, and the more data that I can get, uh, the better it'll be, because also corals are not something like identifying a cat or a dog. All corals look, corals is a huge class of things, and they look completely different, and a small coral or coral polyp is gonna look incredibly different from a mature large coral. So the more data that I have, the better the model will be. Raz, I got a quick question for you. Um, excellent job explaining such a complex topic. I, I really appreciate how we put that in simple terms. But I am curious about like your personal motivation because most labs will spend all their energy on one of these models for one task. And then in a short internship program, you tried two models and put them together. So was it just insane ambition or did you have like an intuition when you started that those two could work together? Because that's wildly impressive that you did that and I'm still kind of blown away. I, um, as, as you know, and as people who live with me know, I was, I was very stressed. I, <laughs> it, it, was, it was tough um, because I actually didn't know anything before coming here. I studied molecular biology and I'd never touched Python before. I'd never done any of this stuff before but I learned about it basically through a neurobiology class. I learned about neural networks and I was really interested in applying them to ecological issues. And it's something that I view as really important because I think the future of science is all computational um, with the way that we're going. We're already being almost replaced by ChatGPT, which is a very rudimentary model. And I think that um, it's really important to know these things and they're just gonna be more influential um, in the future as we start applying them more to different interdisciplinary issues. Hi, Raz. Uh, great job. That was awesome. I was just curious, um, what are some of the things that your model might have misidentified as a coral? It's a tough one. Um, some of the ones that I saw misidentified, because um, I looked at a good amount of the ones that it misidentified, some of them were actually me getting stuff wrong and the model kind of correcting me um, because I would annotate pictures and I would go through hundreds of pictures and sometimes I would miss a tiny coral in the bottom of the model. And one thing that it did have trouble with was dead coral because dead coral has similar features to live coral. Um, one of the main indicators is color and something that I wanna look into in the future is looking at extracting color as a specific variable and, and adding that to the model instead of just using this implicit model and its own variables to kind of extract information. I wanna add on to it um, with kind of Sub subject expertise. So things like that. Um, there are issues with computer vision and that's why you need to bring people who actually really know these subjects in. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be in a lab where people would help me out and kind of, you know, tell me what a coral was or wasn't when I didn't know. No, they wouldn't have to have, um, <laughs> oh yeah, long question. So basically Kieran asks, if a surfer or just someone who doesn't have any knowledge of computer science wanted to look at a reef around them, would they be able to use this through an app or through some other form to look at the health state of their reef? And the answer is yes. Uh, the code can be pretty easily automated and I have automated it at this point to where you can actually do it through Google's function, Google Collab, through Google Drive so you could upload photos into a Google folder and you could do it already. I personally don't know how to make an app. Maybe I'll ask Alex about that. But um, it, I think it would be possible. Mahalo guys. But I'm um, guys for that wonderful presentation. Next, we have Kieran, all the way from the Aina of Lohi Ao, or um, Kakuhi Hewa. No, not even Kakuhi Hewa. Manokalani Po, Kalamai. Um, but yeah, I want to introduce Razi, not Razi, Kieran Mitchell. Mahalo Nui. I'm going to try to lighten the mood after that. 
I've, I've watched him do his presentation about 10 times, and I learn something new every single time I watch it. So, hello, Mike Ako, everybody. My name is Kieran Mitchell. I'm from the island of Kauai, and today I'm going to be presenting on Where Stay, or Do Hawaiian Reef Fish Exhibit Habitat Differences at Laihala Hilo? So, for a little bit of a who are background, I'm 21 years old. Uh, I said I'm from Kauai. I'm studying at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I'm studying marine science. I grew up as a diver, um, as a surfer, and grew up in the ocean. My father was a, um, was a diver and surfer as well. He worked in, um, in Kilauea Point and Hanalei Refuge for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And he's a big reason why I'm here today, as well as my um, grandfather, who's a biologist as well. So here's just a couple photos. Here's um, the Kane of my ohana. This is my dad, and this is my older brother here. And we're diving at Kaweanui Beach, where I was 10 years old in this picture over here. And um, yeah, so just to orient you why this project is important to me is to just show you some I know where I'm from. So as I said, this is Kaweanui Beach um, in Princeville of Koi on the North Shore where I grew up spending a lot of time diving, my holidays being close to that, and then Kilauea Lighthouse, where I first live on Kauai, as well as Honolulu Elementary School, where I found my passion for the ocean and really um, made a goal as a young kid because the ocean's given everything of my life and created my lifestyle to really um, designate my life for Kuleana to give back to it, as well as Lumahai and Makua Reef in Haiana, where I grew up. So for the organization that I was paired with this summer was the Meg Lab, which was um, really just a group of great scientists who take that connection or Polina of indigenous science and having, bringing that culture and mix it with prestigious science and um, really just an gr gr amazing group of people. So to orient you to location, we were working at Laihala, uh, the East Hawaii. Thank you, Alex, for this map. Thank you, Kainalu Stewart, for this great image um, of Lehala. And this area is also uh, important to me. Last summer, I was interning at Kumola, um, where I was working to try to adapt um, an OEB, a native pollen fish, into contemporary aquaculture. And really what I learned this summer is that these ecosystems are all connected, as Matt was saying, with the sea level rise and um, biopeel and like pua fish that are coming through that makaha. Um, it's very important because this area is a very new, so any knowledge we can gain about this place is super impactful because these fish, like say like a, the native mullet, um, um, like a catagomous fish that likes to be hatched in salt water and then move up to the lokoia in fresh water. So these um, habitats where these fish can be protected, as you can see, are very important. So we also were working with two graduate students this year, Kainalu Stewart and Brianna Ninomoto, who were um, some of our main mentors. And we were doing GPS mapping using targets to look at coastal typographies. And there's advanced um, knowledge that Kainalu can tell you about with the drones and all the GPS where um, it goes, you have a target, and you walk around, you set the targets, and then you have GPS coordinates where you go, and the drone then connects them, and you create an um, ortho mosaic image, which Raz showed you of Laihala, which is a compilation or collection of photos that is geologically recognized to create a certain area. And this is important to just see the future impacts that sea level rise will have on these habitats, as well as local yeah. And we also have water sensors. Um, this is Brianna Ninomoto's project where she's looking at um, conductivity, sea level, and um, salinity in these areas. And we have a sensor in Kumuola, Haleolono, Kaumaui, and Laihala. And here's just a little video of us doing some, um, the mapping. This is in Kumuola. So, um, my project, uh, where I got to create an independent project, was where I was looking at preferred habitat of Hawaiian reef fish in Laihala, or where they stay. So, I'm looking specifically at abundance, species diversity, species richness, size, and behavior of the fish. 
And why this project is important, as I explained, is coral health and um, coral bleaching are affecting the habitats, and I'll, the future study of this is how are these fish's habitats affect by these. And why do I care is because I want future generations to be able to experience the same resources as I did. So in terms of method, this is a project that I created. I'm looking at coral, rock, and sand, where I have a quadrat, and I'm conducting fish surveys, 15-minute surveys, to look at what fish come through, the species, the amount of fish, and the behavior of the fish as well. So really, in this process, it, it's hard. Like, you can be doing, taking data right after, um, say, the storm, and I'm grabbing a rock and I'm sitting on the bottom because the water is, water is pushing you back and forth. And fish, humans, you know what I mean, we're trying to connect. You've got to try to be the reef or you've got to try to like, act as the member of that environment to really be able to get um, an accurate um, portray. So this is just a little video of me taking data, kind of trying to hide behind a rock so I could see what fish were coming through. In terms of huakai or analysis of results, here's a little snapshot into my data. So as you can see, I have date, visibility, tide, and observations say what's the weather. 15-minute um, surveys, so I'm, I'm actually conducting the survey for 15 minutes, and I'm looking at species, the individual, the size, and behavior. So to go into some results, here was my uh, scale pie chart for abundance. There was the greatest abundance in coral, second in by rock, and lastly, with a great just abundance of fish that were just swimming through, so not a great abundance in sand. And after conducting statistical analysis, um, I also got a p-value of 0 .0007, showing strong statistical evidence that there is varying abundance in the habitat. When looking at species, as some of you may know, this is a saddle wrasse, a type of Hinalea. This is the belted wrasse, another type of Hinalea. This is the Hoan Dasilis, or the Aloiloi. And this is the convict tang or manini. These were the main species that came through my surveys. And here's a little graph to just show what areas these fish preferred. So the, the aloiloi, per se, like the coral habitat, because as you may see, they, they like it for, scru for structure and for habitat. And then the belted wrasse is used in rock. You see them doing a lot of feeding throughout the rock. And then swimming through the sand was a lot of hinalea or saddle wrasse. So in terms of species richness, I found 13 different species in the coral, 12 different species in the rock, and seven different species in the sand. After conducting a Shannon Wiener index, to, which takes into account number of species and relative abundance, I got a value of 43.31 for coral, 34.19 for rock, and 14.78. So as you can t see in terms of species and relative abundance, the coral and rock were a lot greater than the sand. Also looking at size, the importance of this graph is not almost to see that there's much of a difference because there is not a huge amount of difference is really to see how these fish are all small. And as I was talking about before, like these are the breeding grounds and these are the areas, Lehala, the protected areas where these pua or baby fish are hanging out, then where they could survive, not be predated on, to go out into the ocean and also into the local eas. To look at behavior, the coral was a lot of feeding and sheltering, same as rock, and with the sand, it was a lot of swimming through. So just to look at a dis discussion or reflection, uh, creating an independent project, it wasn't um, all fun and games. Like at first, I wanted to conduct a project where I was spearing invasive to look at belly content to see competition of resources. And then secondly, I was using a 30-foot transect, as you can see in this image. But the substrate or the coral is not continuous across this entire 30-foot transect. So uh, my mentor, Dr. Burns, um, advise that I use a quadrant to look at a more specific area to have consistent substrate. And other work, we also worked on this summer. We were jumping in and helping out people with work they were doing. This is a project led by Crispin Nakoa where um, an artist from New Zealand came 
to do a local Helmana or Keiki group to help conduct a mural to really teach them about some problems in the ocean today. Here was that finished mural. And here was some Aloha Aina work we were doing at Kaumaui. And here's Raz and I, who spent a lot of time this summer, as you can see by Raz's face. And then, before I show this video, I just wanted to thank um, all the Meg Lab, Kalani Kane, Cliff Gofono, John Burns, everyone, um, Alex Kainalu McCoy, everyone who helped out with just everything that we did this summer. And then, here's a little wrap up video I have. Thank you for ending that like that. That was amazing. Do we have any questions for Brother Kieran? You would be all the way over there. Hold on. Okay. So I categorize them. Oh. What type of behavior did I see in the fish? So. Um, it's a pretty protected area, so I didn't see like any predation on the fish that I was looking at. But in terms of behavior, I categorized them into four different categories. Um, sheltering, feeding, um, swimming through. So just to like, you can see all their behaviors that they're doing, say like sheltering. You can see the aloe loi that is staying in the habitat the entire time. And that's an important thing to look at in a fish survey. Is the fish there for 15 minutes or did it just swim through? Whereas in the sand, it's not there main habitat that they're using for structure and feeding. So they're more swimming through the habitat instead of being there for that entire 15 minutes. So in order to run statistical data on it too, you have to, um, you have to dim down your categories into continuous things. So for the behavior, it was those different behavior. Oh, and my bad. Uh, I want to thank Kaoli Maloa <laughs> Foundation, uh, Pipes, for everything they've done. This is my second year here, and they've had a big impact on my future uh, for the Hoina, like I am I gonna try to attend graduate school after this and I think I found a big passion in EA as well as in um, ocean work. So all my mentors from the past that have helped me have had a huge um, impact on my future and I couldn't be here without any of them. Uh, and Pipes and the Mega Lab. <laughs> <laughs> Mahalo, another question here Raz, take the How do you think completing the summer project fits into your timeline as a student researcher? That's a great question. Okay. Um, I think as a student researcher, now I've worked in a lab at school after having a guided project last year at Kumola, which was a great um, insight into research, and then being able this summer to create an independent study, which is a little bit more rigorous and took a little bit more time for yourself to create the methods and create an entire project. I think the next step for me is getting into another lab next year and then taking some time off to be in research and then going to graduate school. And if I could work for or go to graduate school for any of the amazing mentors that I've had in the past, that would be, um, that would be a great journey for me. So really just advancing my research, going to graduate school, and then hopefully continuing my path after that. <laughs> Sorry, one more question. Aloha. Um, how did you determine 15 minutes as sufficient for observations? I used the GoPro, and I had the GoPro video, just I started the video, and then you did a 15-minute video, and then turned off the video and deleted it. So I was using a GoPro as, um, for time. Mahalo Nui. I think that's the final final question. <clears throat> right on you guys, Mahalo Nui for um, sitting through our presentations. We're actually gonna take a lunch break. So we're gonna take a 30 minute lunch break and then we're gonna start back up in 30 minutes. So can we have um, all of our presenters who's gonna be presenting next eat first so we, you can finish and you know be makoko for our next 
um, round of presentations. And then please mentor, stay, we have food for you guys too, go outside, we have um, some mea ai, so please come and, and, and cook out with us. And then yeah, we're starting at 12.30, mahalo.
you. Well, my Kako. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the one aloha. The two, two or three alohas. Let's try that again. Oh, my Kako. Um, this next portion, we're, we're excited to, or these next uh, five presenters, we're excited to um, showcase. These uh, interns were with our partners at USGS as well as, as, well as our National Park Services. Um, our first presenter uh, for this section, he hails from Oahu Alua, Kakui Hava, the island of Oahu, is Makoa Del Mida. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Aloha, everybody. Um, as Nalu said earlier, my name is Makoa de Almeida, and today I'll be presenting my research on the effect that avian malaria has on carotenoids in the Hawaii Amakihi. One more thing I'd like to mention that I'm quite proud of before I get started is that a lot of the photos you'll be seeing, including this one right here, were all taken by me or of me unless attributed otherwise. So please enjoy. So I was born and raised out of Mulani, Oahu. I grew up running around the mountains, uh, spending a lot of time in the ocean, surfing and hiking. She's a pretty average uh, local boy who loved his home. And yeah, I've always felt a deep sense of responsibility to these places that have shaped me and to steward them in whatever way that may be. So because of this, I have a background in the conservation of native Hawaiian flora and fauna. It's something I'm extremely passionate about. Every summer since eighth grade, I've participated in different Aina based programs working Malka to Makai uh, with different local organizations, communities, and resources. I currently attend school at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. Go Boo Dogs! And I'll be a rising junior this coming fall semester as a biology major. So for the summer of 23, I've spent the past 10 weeks here on the Big Island of Hawaii working with USGS at Volcano National Park. So as many of us know, Hawaii is famous for its biodiversity, especially that of our native forest birds. The islands were once home to 54 native species of honey creeper, and today that number is unfortunately down to 17. Birds played an extremely important role in Hawaiian culture. Hawaiians held these birds to an esteem level of respect, as well as anything that was made from them. I took these photos here at the Bishop Museum. From left to right, we have a lehulu, a mahiole, an ahuula, and a room filled with kahili in the background, all of which were made from native forests and seabirds, and these items are all restricted for royalty. So there's many different things driving extinction, but the main ones right now are avian malaria and avian pox. Avian malaria specifically is a non-native parasite, Plasmodium relictum, which is being transmitted throughout the ecosystem by non-native Culex mosquitoes. Once inside the birds, this parasite es essentially ruptures red blood cells and thus kills them. So what's being done about this? There's a number of disease dynamic studies across the state aiming to better understand how to combat these foreign diseases and how they're affecting birds. So one of these projects is the Idaho Ranch Disease Dynamic Study being conducted by the USGS. Uh, the project split between bird and mosquito research and it aims to better understand the mechanisms behind disease transmission, tolerance, and spread throughout the ecosystem. You can see me here working, uh, doing some trapping out in the field, some gel electrophoresis, qPCR, as well as dissections. And on the bird side, these are some photos I took uh, at our banding station. So we catch birds, we do a lot of different stuff, such as blood work, telemetry, morphometrics, microbiome, anything you can think of, we're actively trying to obtain that data. So within this pretty large project, I'll be specifically focusing on feather color. And to do so, I'm using colorimeter, which is a way to measure the intensity of color. So feather color is important because we can use this 
to infer carotenoid concentrations within the birds. Carotenoids are a naturally found compound in the environment that the birds acquire through their diet. And essentially, they're able to incorporate it into their feather color. So why is this important? Plumage color is often a reflection of fitness, quality of diet, and is very important as well in breeding selection. So this thus begs the question, does avian malaria have an effect on carotenoid concentrations in the Hawaii Amakihi? It's hypothesized that birds who are chronically infected must, uh, must suffer some kind of trade-off, and that could be, um, yeah, they're infected, maybe they're less fit, aren't able to forage or travel as effectively, are thus lower quality of diet, not as uh, colorful, and maybe less sexually um, competitive. So I'll be conducting this research at Ainoho Ranch at within Volcano National Park. There's a good mix here of both native and native flora and fauna. These are some of the species I work with. But my focal species of research is the Hawaii Amakihi, a Hawaii Island endemic species of honeycreeper. Certain lowland populations have started to show tolerance to this disease, which is why we're studying it. And to catch birds, we use mist nets up here. We age and sex the birds based off breeding conditions and plumage. And finally, we assign a unique individual band number so that we can track them throughout their life. To collect this data, I use colorimeter, which gives us three values, L, A, and B. As I mentioned earlier, I'm super into photography. I first picked up a camera in 2017. This photo in the middle was actually the first photo I ever got of a native forest bird, the Oahu Amakihi. And I've continued to share my photos and do a lot of community outreach over Instagram. If you're interested, at Hawaiian Plant, that's me. And yeah, photography has actually given me a really good basis for the understanding of how light and color works, which is one of the reasons why I was so excited to do this project. This video right here is actually a screen recording from the editing software I use to process my photos. You can see that hue is the actual tone of a color, saturation is the intensity of that color, and finally, lumens is how bright or dark that color is. Here, the software is selecting for the color yellow. But essentially, the A and B color space are representative of hue and saturation, while the L, L color space is representative of luminance. So the first half of my internship was pretty experience-based. I spent a lot of time in the field with both birds and mosquitoes, but I um, also had a good amount of lab experience as well. But around July, I decided to make my project very stats encoding heavy. I've never coded in my life before, never considered myself much of a computer guy, but I took this summer as an opportunity to push myself to do something new. Um, this is an example of what my computer screen looks like most of the time and where I stay coding. And this is an example of a principal component analysis. I ran this early in the year just to prove to my mentors that I knew what I was doing. But essentially, this statistical analysis is a way to take a multivariate data set, condense it, and see what's driving variation. So my results, you can see that dimension one explained most of the variation within my data frame, and that the A and B color space down on the bottom left were the main contributors towards this variation, whereas the L color space was contributing towards variation in dimension two. This can be visualized here in the ordination space. You can see the eigenvectors of A and B at 180 to each other, which means they're complete inverses, and the L color space here is at 90 degrees, so it's unrelated to either or. Finally, I ran my principal component analysis. We use sex and age as the key identifiers, and each individual point you see up there is a unique individual bird. The closer that points are to each other, the more closely related they are in color space. So you can see here significant grouping with our adult birds at this end. This essentially means that birds here are brightly colored yellow, strongly saturated. On the other side, you can see our juvenile birds, not as yellow, not as saturated. And in between, we have our subadults. This told us that colorimeter is working. And we can see here that this was consistent with what we already know about plumage color and age. Juveniles here, not as colorful. Subadults, a little more so. And finally, our definitive plumage adults, strongly saturated and colorful. To add on top of this PCA, we included malarial status as one of our identifiers. You can see that most of our birds positive with malaria were adult birds. So to account for this age-driven variation, I filtered my data set one more time to only include adult birds. We can see here that you can't really distinguish uh, 
significant separation between our birds positive with malaria and birds negative. If we did see significant grouping, we'd see maybe our positive birds down here and our negative birds up here. So what does this mean for birds living with chronic infection? I saw no, there's pretty much little difference in color space between our birds positive and negative with malaria. So this suggests that birds who are able to survive initial infection and are now chronically infected uh, appear to maintain a similar quality of diet and are able to incorporate carotenoids into their feather color in comparable ways to that of non-infected birds. There's actually a study done at Idaho in the early 2000s investigating the effect that avian malaria had on productivity or, um, I guess, reproduction in the same population of Hawaii Amakihi. This study also suggested that there's little difference between infected and non-infected birds in terms of foraging capabilities. So both of these studies are a few of only a handful that have looked into the effects that living with a chronic infection has on life history. It's very important to continue this type of research. My study here was, as I said, only one of a few that has contributed to this growing understanding. But understanding the implications of living with a chronic infection are important, right? These infections can last for years and affect bigger things down the road, such as uh, population dynamics and whatnot. This study really highlighted that Idaho Ranch is a great place to conduct disease dynamics research, but much more research is needed both for different populations species and sites across the Pai'aina. So finally, um, these are some fun photos I had. I, this is my first time ever I got to really work with birds and I had a great time, honestly. These are some of my more fun photos. I had a great time in the field. <laughs> Not such a great time behind the computer, but it was still a great learning experience. And finally, I'd love to give a big mahalo to my mentors, Christina Eben Paxton, uh, my colleagues, Car Carly and Mylise the Pipes Ohana, and finally, the Big Island of Hawaii for being so gracious to me. And of course, uh, these funders who made all of this research possible. Mahalo nui loa. Test, test. Okay, do we have any questions for Makoa? Trying to look at his mentors. Oh, here we go. Of all the birds affected by avian malaria in Hawaii, I was curious as to why you chose the Hawaii Yamakihi for your particular study. Yeah, so that was something I kind of glazed over. Uh, first of all, we chose Idaho Ranch because it exists as an ecological boundary between, say, really mostly non-native habitat and pristine native habitat. It's located within volcano, but it's just below all the prime ohia forests, so there's a lot of disease transmission happening here. And with the Hawaii Yamakihi, this specific population at least is kind of at that weird, like, mid to low elevation. And there's studies done that have shown that their survival rate is, I believe, between 30 and 50% in terms of after being infected. So that number is still super low. But a lot of the higher elevation birds, such as the EEV or, or KVQ even, are almost like 100% mortality rate. So even though they're not immune to malaria by any means, they are showing, like, upcoming evolving tolerance or that line is a little kind of mix between what tolerances, but maybe resistance to malaria. So I think the study like really showed that it's a great model species at least to maybe explore candidate genes that are aiding to this evolved resistance and maybe apply that to more of our endangered birds like the kiviki or even the akikiki on Kauai. Alonui, do we have another question for Makoa? I think we'll take one more. Oh. <coughs> so beside the the carotenoid car which makes up like the yellow coloration of the feather, do you? Th I mean, in your opinion, do you think the level? I mean, is there a difference in level of plumage that you've seen, like uh, just let's say density of the feather, or like the how the health of the feather in general, beside the coloration that can indicate? Yeah. That? So that's something we actually do on the field is we physically collect feathers from the birds, and currently I believe so. We're taking a lot. Um, while in, in the field just because we don't know how long these birds will be around, right? But in terms of looking at feathers and coloration, um, what I did here with colorimeter was really like only the first step. So we haven't really had the time yet, but you know, there's like so many research questions I had that kind of sparked from this. So that'd definitely be something to 
look into in the future. Mahalanui. Can we get another round of applause <laughs> for Makoa? I guess I'll walk to the front so the camera can see me. <coughs> Our next presenter um, hails all the way. Yeah, all the way. All the way. All the, all the way from America, Samoa. Um, and it's my honor to introduce her, Christine Tomoniko, who is working with the Hawaiian Volcanoes Observatory this year. Mahalo, can we give a round of applause? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Tomaniko, and the title for my project this summer is Ta'u Volcanic Ash 3D Modeling. So for this summer, I had the opportunity of working at USGS, United States Geological Survey. And under USGS, there are different volcano observatories all around the world. And the one that I had um, the opportunity to work in this summer is the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. This is a picture of their building. They're currently located in Hilo, but previously they were up in the National Park before the eruption in 2018. Oh, and they're gonna have a new building up at Imiloa, but yeah. And so as I was saying, HVO, Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, is in charge of looking over Hawaii, Hawaii's volcanoes, but they are also responsible for looking, observing and monitoring American Samoa's volcanoes. And so in American Samoa, there, there are three volcanoes in American Samoa. One consists of Tutuila Volcano, and then the other two are under the group of islands under American Samoa, the Manuan Islands. So that's the um, Hofunolo Senga Volcano and Ta'u Volcano. So the Ta'u Volcano over here is what we're going to be focusing on for this project. And the reason why we're focusing on Ta'u is because around this time last year, there was a lot of seismic activity that occurred on the Ta'u volcano. And as you can see over here, there are black circles, which are the different earthquakes that occurred last year. And then the sizes corresponds to how strong those earthquakes were. And then these seismic activity and volcanic unrest sets a reminder to us that there can still be volcanic eruptions that occur. And with volcanic eruptions, there can be volcanic hazards. And so this is a, a diagram to show the different volcanic hazards that can come from volcanic eruptions. And the things on the ground can or might happen on Ta'u, but what we're focusing with this project is the movement of ash and ash fall. So with that, what exactly, what exactly is volcanic ash? So volcanic ash is actually fragmented magma with particles that are less than two millimeters in diameter. And the objective of this project is to see if there was an eruption on Ta'uva, Ta'u, how would that affect life on Tutuila? And why Tutuila? So as you can see in this picture, Tutuila is not that far from the Manuan Islands, so it's only about 60 miles away from the Ta'u volcano, and it holds the um, majority population of American Samoa, and so we wanted to see how an eruption would typically affect life on Tutuila. And for this project, we use this tool called ASH3D. So ASH3D is a tool that is used a lot by USGS to model ash movement. And so it uses different parameters and, and it runs it on different volcanoes around the world and it would give you a model of ash movement. And so these are the different parameters that my mentors came up for me. And 
there was three different knobs that we adjusted in the in the tool. So one is eruption duration, plume height, and for the volume. So for these different parameters, we chose a random day from each month to run them at. And so we looked at how long the eruption would be, how high the eruption column is, and how much stuff would be coming out of the volcano. And then after running these parameters, this is what you would get at the end of it. So looking closer at one of these results, we can see it's, it's a map that you would get. It would give you like where the volcano is over here. We're looking at the Tau volcano marked by the blue marker. And then close over here is Ofuro Sengo, and then American Samoa. And in the back of the legend would be independent Samoa. And so this legend would give you when we decided to run the model on. So we ran it around June, January 5. And then the plume height was at seven kilometers. And it ran for 12 hours. Yeah, just so we ran a lot of models and in total we ran 360 models. And then these are the results after running all those models. And then in the yellow, it means it only affected Ta'u. And then in the blue, it affected all of the Manu'an Islands, which is Ofuol, Senga, and Ta'u. And then red means that it reached all the way to Tutuila. And after looking at the these results, we then can analyze what these results mean. And, it's, and it means that for typical eruption rates, ash rarely reaches Tutuila. And for high eruption rates, ash is deposited on Tutuila a quarter to a third of a time. And for the most part, summer and spring would be unfavorable times for Tutuila if Tau Volcano were to erupt. And the smallest size of ash deposit range from 0.01 millimeter to 0.3 millimeters. And the biggest size of ash deposit can range from <coughs> 3 millimeters to 10 millimeters. And we also like to note that an eruption does not always reach Ofuolusenga, which is the closest island to Tau. And after analyzing these, after analyzing these, we can then figure out what kind of effects it would have on Tutuila. And, and Tutuila would have minor to moderate ash thickness, which is 0.8 millimeters to 25 millimeters, which can cause eye and respiratory irritants, crop damage, detrimental animal health, equipment damage, infrastructure problems, and ash removal. And so, although we looked at the effects for Tutuila, I think it's also important to know what kind of effects it would have on Manua. And so, Manua would have moderate to severe ash thickness, which is 6.4 millimeters to 300 millimeters. And this can cause weak roofs to collapse at four to five inches of compact ash, damage to trees, essential services can be interrupted, roads become impassable, severe infrastructure damage, and also heavy plant and animal loss. So just to give you guys a picture of how these effects would look, I have these pictures or images. These would, you would see on Tutuila. This is minor. I'm just gonna scroll through them. And this is still happening on Tutuila. It can lead to ash removal efforts. And this is just to show how it would look on plants. And then this is what would, might happen on Tau, this heavy ash thickness. Okay. So what's next? I hope to inform my Samoan community and hopefully it will lead to more volcanic research to be done in American Samoa. And after my results, I just wanna say something about myself results, I guess. Uh, I am from, I am Samoan. I am from American Samoa, born and raised. And doing a project directly related to where I come from, it really 
It's an honor. It's always, I think this project will have a place close to my heart. And it was, this opportunity challenged me as a person as a, and as a scientist. And I had to learn different terms, unfamiliar terms, and adapt to an unfamiliar field. But I think that helped me to grow as a person and become a better scientist in the end, more open-minded now. And I'm just happy to do this project. And I hope to do more and contribute my skills as a scientist to steward my home, American Samoa. So this is just a picture of me. And these are some of my USGA, wait, USGS HVO memories. I work mostly in the, the office this summer, but I'm thankful to my mentor that really tried to put me out in the field where I got to experience and learn new things about volcano. So that's my mentor, Natalia. This is me close to the Halim, Halimaumau crater. And I got the opportunity to go out with the ash team. I just sat there, but I took their picture. <laughs> but yeah, so reference, acknowledgments, and thank you to Natalia and Drew for having me this summer. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Awesome job, awesome job. Do we have questions? Oh Lord, all the way over there. You guys always do this to me, huh? I gotta run over. I know I'm fat. Um, I was curious the effects that you had for the ash fall um, from minor to moderate, then moderate to severe. Are those like um, already programmed in the ASH 3D program you used, or how did you, if not, how did you come to conclude those effects for each place? Thank you for the question. I actually got those, um, or going up, I actually got those effects from the USGS website. So it, if you go onto the USGS website, it gives you like different ASH thickness, and it also gives you the, these effects, with, and that's where I got the images as well. One more? Can we take one more question? Who? Scratching his head. <laughs> Mahalo, Christine. So, what is the challenge of teaching American Samoan, so your community, what, what are some of the challenges about teaching um, about something that hasn't happened in their known <coughs> lifetime, right? Um, the, how, do you, how do you put some of this in this context? I think the challenge would be language because I found out from my mentors that there's not really a lot of terms in relating to volcanic research, so they had a hard time to relaying information to the community. So I think that's gonna be the challenge. Main challenge is communication. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, that kind of blew me away. I hadn't even thought about some of those words have been lost. So. Yeah. yeah. Can we give another round of applause? gonna make Mina run up there or Vi. Okay, Mina's pulling out the next one, which will be our um, Penny Snow, who worked with USGS as well, but in the on the Pierce side and um, was doing some really cool things, which I know all about, but I won't yeah, save it for you. <laughs> Here's Penny Snow. Shahim, Kanawe, Saika. Aloha, my kako. My name is Penny. Um, I'm from uh, Oregon, on the border of Oregon and Washington, where we call now the Columbia River Gorge. Um, my family calls it in Chwana. My family's Wishram from this area. 
Um, and uh, as a kid, I grew up at the base of an area called Salilo. Um, and I imagined myself uh, often riding my bike along our massive river here all the way out to Salilo Falls, which is an incredibly uh, important fishing spot for a lot of indigenous people in the Pacific Northwest. Um, <laughs> when you think of a lot of fish, this is the place uh, until 1950s we had nearly 20 million fish every year uh, come from the ocean onto our river and we could literally stick a net down into it and pull salmon out to feed our families. Um, and in the 1950s, the Dowell's Dam was built, and now our salmon populations are about 200,000 a year. Um, but I grew up really caring about this area and about how our fish run and how our forests exist. Um, and about the age of 13, I became homeless and wasn't really able to stay in that area for too long and found myself kind of wandering around looking for um, where next to call home. And in the early 2000s, uh, I learned about uh, tree sitting going on near where I grew up, um, protesting the cutting of our national old growth forests and made this place home. This became my lab for the next 10 years of my life, learning about endangered species in Oregon and about how the forests create their own environments and weather. Um, and it meant a lot to me to really be in this place where I could learn about the animals and their relationships with one another. Uh, and then in the early 2000s, um, wildfires hit and a lot of our forests and old growth have um, disappeared and been burned pretty heavily and it's made it really difficult for us to be able to um, exist <laughs> in the forests there and it made me look further and where I could put myself for the future of the area that I come from and I thought academics might give me that path and so I started in schooling, got my GED in 2020 at the age of 36 <laughs> and um, decided to pursue conservation science as a future for myself. Um, over the last few years I've done research uh, in a few different areas in the coast of Oregon with uh, toxicology and pollinator populations and now here in Hawaii I've been able to um, work with Pierce and USGS this summer. Uh, I've been asked by Dr. Renee Bellinger to come and take part in doing some research here to develop uh, eDNA methods um, for conservation science on the island. Um, eDNA is kind of a newer upcoming form of um, experimentation where we're able to go out into the field, take samples of DNA that's released onto our environment and uh, find out what might be in the area. Um, and the way that we do that is by creating primers <laughs> uh, for certain animals which essentially tear apart a uh, helix of DNA take one half of it and uh, amplify it over and over and we can compare that with uh, a DNA sample and essentially see traces of that organism living in the current area that we're looking at. Um, it really helps to be able to reduce the amount of labor uh, when going out into the field and having to identify by sight. Um, and it really, like its uses are numerous. Uh, we can see what the diets of certain animals are. We can see uh, interactions of pollinators on different plants without having to actually go out in the field and spend hours looking for rare species. Um, and this summer, in our instance, we were looking at ways for early detection of invasive species here on the Big Island. It's a little coquie frog I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, so the ways that we were able to come out and do that is first starting with our primers and primer development. Um, we were able to kind of um, use a lot of software these days to expedite our ability to craft primers um, for finding uh, yeah, our strands that we're going to construct and for isolating our forward and reverse primers, which kind of sit at the either end of the, um, the sequence that we're looking at. Once we've got our sequence figured out, we're um, able to 
um, blast it to make sure that it's specific to the species that we're trying to study. Uh, so we can kind of go to a certain area, like for us, we were looking at Koki Frog because it's pretty much everywhere in <laughs> on this side of Hawaii, and we know that we're going to be able to see it if we go out and sample. So we're able to use our samples uh, in a space, pretty much assuming that we're going to be able to find <laughs> Koki DNA because there are, what, 20,000 of them every acre on this side of the island. So there's a lot of them. Um, our study wasn't really focusing on Koki, but more of a way to establish methods to be able to study terrestrially uh, concentrations of species in a space and to be able to um, hopefully keep invasive species at bay when they first come, uh, looking at things like that have happened in Guam with the brown tree snake. You know, these are really big things that spread fast that are really um, intense for their uh, environments that they can kind of come into. So being able to, you know, test for things like the brown tree snake or like uh, a number, any number of invasive uh, species, I think is a really great thing before it gets too bad. Um, so yeah, we run uh, a couple of different reactions. I won't get too <laughs> much into them because it is pretty jargony, but we use a, a specific uh, process called qPCR where we actually put a little probe in between those two end caps that allow us to amplify even more specifically by species uh, of taxa um, and we then can kind of use those uh, primers and mix them with the DNA that we find with a process called gel electrophoresis which allows us to see that uh, the DNA that we're looking at is the DNA we want. And this little ladder lets us uh, know how many base pairs are amplifying uh, when we kind of drop the little ink into these slots. It travels through this uh, gel agaricose. We're able to identify, uh, depending on how many base pairs amplify, that it is the species that we're looking for. Um, so that was fun, being able to <laughs> learn this new method that I haven't done before. Uh, yeah, meant a lot. This is us in the lab doing a bit of gel electrophoresis. Um, here's a little uh, kind of, when we look at the amplifications, we do use kind of a tiny little dark room that exists on a table for us, and it amplifies in these little spots, and it can tell us, you know, the brighter the amplification, the more we know it's hitting on these or combining with these other base pairs that we found in the environment. If it gets a little weaker, we know that that might not be the best. We run these through multiple different temperatures, uh, 53 degrees, 55 degrees, and 57 degrees to kind of look at um, what temperature variations those might amplify on better. Um, yeah, out in the field, um, we're able to go through and um, figure out what maybe methods work the best, whether or not that's using a paint roller to gather our collection samples or to use uh, <laughs> tissue paper like paper towels. <laughs> um, so yeah, out in the field, we're able to gather these and kind of take down uh, what, type of, what time of day it was, uh, the actual location, cloud cover, um, you know, whether or not it's rained. The DNA only exists in the, you know, out in the environment for about 72 hours maybe, so it's important to know like what um, kind of variables might ensure that we're able to find the DNA that we're looking for when we're out in the field. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been, <laughs> I don't know, it's been good, it's a new kind of trip. Once we um, take those samples from the field um, into the lab, we're then able to run them through a vacuum filter, and then we're able to digest uh, the DNA that we pull off of those filters and turn it into DNA, and it kind of comes round trip back to the primers. We compare them with the primers, and we're able to identify uh, what species might have been in the environment there. And sadly, I wasn't able to do our QPCR, which is a bit more um, meticulous than the PCR, but it seems like those came out with <laughs> pretty good results while I was working on this project here in town. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, this is really a lot of um, 
good methodologies that can be implemented and used here on the Big Island for um, looking at invasive species and how they might make their way onto the island and when, and being able to detect them before uh, before it's too late. <laughs> I have to be able to bring this home with me and to be able to apply this to where I come from um, and just kind of, uh, yeah, share, share this knowledge. And a lot of the knowledge that I've kind of picked up while I'm here about how people care for the space that they're in. Um, yeah, that's what I have. I want to thank Dr. Renee Bellinger, Karina Pinzari, Michelle Vesquez Morales, um, USGS, and Pipes for letting me come out and take part in research here on the Big Island. It's meant a lot. Mahalo. Awesome job, Penny. Do you have questions? At least like one or two of Koi. Um, my name is Penny. You talked a bit about like the previous work in Oregon with like invasive species and or no, learning more about like endangered species at home. Um, how do you see yourself really being able to use these techniques and practices at home? kind of in that, I don't know, same vein that you were previously. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think the first thing that comes to mind is salmon populations. Uh, a lot of times salmon are counted by, by hand. You know, we see them going through and there's a lot of that kind of um, count happening and it takes a lot of hours and there's a lot of areas in Oregon where our rivers meet the ocean and our populations have completely plummeted but there's just not enough labor. There's like nobody that's able to count, so a lot of our stations have completely shut off salmon counting, and we really don't know how many salmon are on the rivers anymore. Um, and I think eDNA, with its potential to be able to estimate populations, is something that really is one of those things where a technician could literally go by a field station and do some sampling to get a rough estimate of pop potential populations in an area. So things like that I feel like are really, um, yeah, communi you know, uh, yeah, can go back and forth between here and, and home. I don't know, can we get one more question from the crowd? Thick skin, thick skin. So when designing the primers, how did you select which uh, fragment of the genome you wanted to amplify and did you select a sequence that is preserved between all the species of coqui? And uh, on, based on that, using your primers, how many different species of coquis you think you could utilize, like you could identify with those primers? As far as I know, there's only one species of coqui. It's the Lutherdactus coqui. Um, I don't, I'm not 100% on that, but I think that that's the main one that we found online. So we were using online resources and we're able to isolate or to find out exactly what taxa we're wanting to use because it'll have a unique strand of sequence. Um, and there's all kind of like a list of ways that, you know, things that you're looking for with like temperatures, you want them to stay within a certain range and the more GC pairs you have, the higher the temperature will go and the less, the lower the temperature. So you want it in a specific temperature, you want a specific number of base pairs in your sequence. So I think looking through like a long 2,000, you know, sequence, uh, 2,000 base pair chain, finding that area between the two primers with all these different variables, I think helps limit to, you know, what you're looking for, or what, what is happening with the primer. Um, so that's how we were able to identify what segments of the primer to go for, how, how the temperature changed, how the you know, distance between the two ends, the reverse and the forward might have changed. Um, I can't remember the other part of the question, <laughs> but yeah. It was a lot of work, it was pretty fun though. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, we actually do this thing called blasting where we use the NCBI database and you can blast it against all the other sequences and hope that it comes up a very unique sequence so that you can go on knowing that you're not going to amplify on other species of animals that you're not trying to find. So. 
Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo Nui Penny. Um, oh, this works. I'd just like to shout out our online audience right now. Mahalo Nui for tuning in and spending some time with us um, online from wherever you're at. Is it you? Or Glenn? Oh, Kalawai. I don't want. Okay. Um, next up, we have hailing from Pukohola on the Kauai High side of the island, um, Alohi. Aloha, my kako. Oh, that was slow. Um, my name is Amber Rose Aloha Hokalani Kikahuna, but I just go by Alohi for short makes it easier for some people. My project is about Pukola ethnographic resources, and I'll get in more in detail about what ethnographic, resource, ethnographic resources are to, in this presentation. So for, first, I'm going to start, why is it working? Okay, there you go. First, I'm going to start off with where I'm from. I'm originally from Arizona, and yeah, kind of drier than here. I like that it's not dry here. It makes my skin like itch every time I go back home. Um, I was living in different mini states. I lived in California, Nevada, and many other states, but that was when I was a baby. And moving on, I was born in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is a very small town, um, around 7,000 feet up in elevation, so huge difference from here. Um, we are really famous for our Route 66 and all of the outdoor activities, and also the Grand Canyon, which is about maybe an hour away, depending on which rim you go to. We have the east, south, west, and north rim but some of them go into the other states. Um, one of my favorite trails to do back home is Humphreys Peak. That goes up to 13,326,000 feet up in the air, so it's a pretty long hike. It's about a day trip, and so I am on the outskirts of town. I live about 30 minutes away from town, depending on traffic, um, and as you can see here, this is actually going to be Humphreys Peak, and then right here we have another mountain range, which is Mount Eldon. All of them have trails. Um, Mount Eldon has about three trails, and Humphreys Peak has many trails within the peak itself, but going up to the top, there's only one peak, and it's seasonal because we also have Snowball, Arizona, which is where a lot of people will come out and ski um, during winter. I went to Flagstaff High School which is all the way back on the other side of town. <laughs> so I had to wake up pretty early to go to the other side of town for school. I went there all four years except for my freshman year at the beginning of the year. I went to my rivalry team, which is Coconino High School, which is kind of on the opposite side of town as well, closer to where I would live. Um, I graduated there in 2021. So after that, I decided I wanted to come to Hawaii and go to college. That was a big decision because I didn't want to leave home for a minute, but my mom pushed me, so I'm glad she pushed me. <laughs> um, I really wanted to learn my culture, and that's one of the main reasons why I came out here, is to learn my culture and understand where I came from, because growing up Hawaiian in the middle of a state that has like no Hawaiian culture is very hard, so I didn't know anything about my culture until I started coming here. I decided to go to the University of Hawaii in Hilo, and I'm a, I am a major in kinesiology, exercise science, minoring in Hawaiian studies, and getting a certification in indigenous health. My mom told me about pipes in May, no, way before May, but my mom told me about pipes and showed me I should go for it so I can start learning about my culture and so that I can connect on where I came from. And I agreed with her, so I went through the pipes application, got accepted, and now I am working with Pukohola this summer. So um, Pukohola is on the other side of the island. <laughs> it is in Kauai High, and I would drive there every day um, well, not every day, but I would drive there some days to go to the site and go out there and do my work. Um, I would wake up at 5 in the morning and leave by 6.40 so I can be on the site by 7.30 a.m. and get started on the ethnographics. Um, so going into some of the sites, we have um, a lot of certain sites within the site itself. The first one I'm going to talk about is Pukola Heiau. Um, from 1790 to 1791, King Kamehameha constructed Pukola Heiau. The Heiau was built for 
the war god Ku so that Kamehameha could conquer the Hawaiian Islands. In order for Kamehameha to conquer the Hawaiian Islands, there had to be a sacrifice. The elite of Ku, Keoa, who is the cousin of Kamehameha, was the one to be sacrificed. Since then, this has, has been this has been one of the most important historical events in Hawaiian history. So if you look here, this is going to be Pu'ukola Heiau. Um, the important thing to note here is the color changing of the rock. Um, they believe this is where the sacrifice would have happened because the color of the rock is different and the rock itself will also be a little bit different than the rocks that are built around it. Um, a good thing to note too is all of this rock came from Kohala. So King Kamehameha had his men line up literally all the way from Kohala to here to build the Heiau, which took a year to build. The next Heiau to talk about is going to be Mailikini, which is right down from Kuukoha. Mailikini was a temple, but later turned into a fort to protect the major ports. King Kamehameha decided to have cannons and guns here. Mailikini shows that King Kamehameha was able to use the new modern technologies to secure his control over the islands. So he used a lot of cannons and guns when modern technology came. And they would be pretty much around here, around the walls, and he would have them lined up so that if there was anyone coming in, he had some form of protection. Um, although now we decide not to really call it a temple, we still call it a heiau, just because there are burials within this heiau, so it is still very um, well respected, and you have to respect that there are burials in Kupuna that are, built, are, that are buried there. The next site is going to be Pelikane, which is just a little down, it's this beach area. Um, Pelikane is also known as the Royal Courtyard as many important, and has many important events. For example, King Kamehameha killed his rivalry and his, his rivalry slash his cousin, the elite of Ka'u, Keoa, um, at this beach. So Keoa came all the way from Ka'u, canoed all the way around the island to this spot, and at this time he already knew that he had to be sacrificed for King Kamehameha. Um, so when he showed up, he already knew he was going to die, and he respected that. So what happened is it took place right here, and then not really sure what really happened, but I'm pretty sure they just brought him up there and finished it off in respectful terms. Um, there's also many other events here, like other foreigners coming and Englanders coming and King Kamehameha talking to them, but also Queen Emma was born on Pelikane, and she also had a holiday that lived around this area. Not sure where on the map it would be, though. Um, it is at the, it is said that it's going to be at the Zhang Young Homestead, which is on the opposite side of the highway. And then um, there's also going to be burials here for the Kapuna. So going more into about my project, my project is about the ethnographic resources of Kauai Hai and Pukola Heiau and how those relate to Aloha Aina or Aloha Aina stewardship. I am utilizing the park's ethnographic overview and assessment, or EOA for easier terms, to get to categorize current existing ethnographic resources of this area in order to identify and document those resources pertaining to Pukola and Kauai Hai. Um, ethnographic resources can really vary. They can be landscapes, objects, plants, animals, sites, structures, really anything that you can see visually. Um, but to make it an actual ethnographic resource is when a group of people, um, usually traditionally associated, regard a resource or a thing as essential to their development, identity, culture, traditions, and lifestyle. And for it also to be um, considered ethnographic, it has to be within the last 40 years usage of it. Um, so if something was to be coming up within the next like 20, 10 years, it could not be used as an ethnographic resource because it has to have that 40 year mark to actually be considered an ethnographic. Um, although most of these ethnographic resources are shared typically through passed down families, histories, accounts, biographical documents, and histories, um, by that being oral histories or written histories and interviews that reveal ancestral knowledge or Aiki Kapuna. So a couple of art, um, interviews I read would be by Kule Nagasava, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, she's a Kapuna who vividly, vividly recalled a time when the harbor had a reef named Kai Havana Avana, Kavai Havana Avana. The coral reef was eventually removed to make way for the construction of the harbor, altering the coastal landscape forever. Nevertheless, the reef has been beloved fishing spot teeming with marine life. So you can see here, this is going to be the harbor um, that was built in like 1950, 1960-ish. Um, 
They do also have a break wall, which is where, um, it's kind of on the opposite side of this picture, really hard to see from this angle. Um, but the, the coral reef was pretty big. It had a big fishing spot. It's what fed a lot of the people and the community at the time. So when it first was being constructed, a lot of people had to find new ways of finding food, fishing, and a lifestyle. Um, this relates to Aloha Aina because not only did it take um, their food away, but also the loving for the community. Their Aina got destroyed and their food sources got destroyed. So um, now we're trying to restore the environment by um, Keeping it clean, it's a little hard though because this is also a stream down here which you'll see in an easier picture. Um, when it rains in Kohala, a lot of the rain will actually come down and cause a flood. So it's a lot harder to keep this area as clean as we would like to. Um, but also we try to keep it as healthy because the black, rift, black, rift tip, black tip reef shark um, actually comes here and still um, nurses and having, having kids. So we try to keep it as um, clean as we can. It's just a little hard when there's flooding and it comes right into the ocean. The next interview I am going to talk about is with Dom Esmeralda and, and Betty Esmeralda. Um, they talked about how um, Spencer Road used to go be between Mailekini and Puhokola and how it changed the landscape. So you can kind of see here, this is the road. Um, we, when it went in between Pukula and Mylakini. So Pukula is going to be right here, and Mylakini is going to be down here, and this is the road. So this road was there for a while. It went all the way down to the beach, and then they finally decided to remove the road and keep it on the opposite side. So when you drive there, it's going to be on the opposite side going around the visiting center down to the beach, which is connected to Spencer Beach Park. Um, at this time, too, they had a lot of vegetation come back in, but a lot of it's invasive species. And I know the park is trying to have native species come in, um, especially native species to Kauai High to kind of represent Kauai High, but also show what it would normally look like, even though the landscape has been changed. Um, I was able to actually see pieces of the old road when I went out there. We had Manoa, Manoa interns that were archeologists that came out and I was with them for a day, kind of got to see what they do. And I didn't know there was a road in between the two before, so I was really confused seeing road pieces in between two heiaus. And um, that's when I kind of learned about how it changed the landscape. When you walk out there, it's super flat where the road was at, and then it just kind of cuts off, but there's still pieces of that road and metals out there, so um, yeah. And then I know a lot of people too at the time, going back to Aloha Aina and how it relates, is now they're trying to bring back native species because it is important to show the native species of Kauai High. The last interview I read was with Shortly Berdeman, another Kapuna who interview I read mentioned how the beach itself at Pelekane used to be more expansive and has sacred burial ground. Um, these accounts revealed how the landscape has evolved over time and the changes that have shaped Kauai High's culture and natural heritage. So the beach itself actually be, used to be pretty big. It was in White Sand Beach and was pretty expansive. A lot of the people um, used to live on this beach and it was very important because many people who did live on the beach did eventually get kicked out. Um, we're not sure why they got kicked out, but a lot of people came over, Michigan military came over and pushed them out and only gave them $300 to find a house to live. Most of them ended up moving to Oahu just because their kids ended up moving out there, but they never had got a full explanation of why they got kicked out. Um, so, yeah, finding a new lifestyle for them was pretty hard. And ever since then, it's been kind of, no one's living out there, pretty dead. Um, you just have the road that kind of comes through. And so I, I know now they're trying to make it a little bit more livelihood for the community, especially the people who are born and raised in Kauai High and who lived there and how um, their ancestors used to live there. So it's pretty interesting to see how. Um, it's changed its landscape. And when I was going back to the harbor before, back here, this is the stream of the flooding from Kohala. Um, it is tearing the ground. So every time there is a flood, it is getting more expanded just because the rain and all the dirt that comes down and everything and all the debris, it is tearing apart. So I know the park is trying to figure out a way to kind of keep it how it is now and keep it clean. Um, this picture actually is recently um, 
before I came, this was all covered in grass, debris, rubbish, and all that. And they also had another internship there with um, four high school kids. They all cleaned this area for a festival coming up in about a week or two. Um, and they cleaned this up for that. And they said this is the best they've ever seen it just because of all the leaves and debris that comes down. And a lot of people actually, um, homeless people actually try to come down and camp out here at night. And so that's been an issue for the park. Um, moving on. Um, I am immensely grateful for the opportunity to explore and preserve these mo'olelo, and I hope that my project can do justice for the significance of, it, of this cultural travesty. Uh, as my journey continues, I remain committed to honoring the voices of the kapuna and those who have shared their stories with the park. Their narratives not only provide essential historical content, but also imbued the presence with a profound sense of place and belonging. I aim to ensure that their wisdom and experience are carried forth into the future, leaving a lasting legacy for gen future generations to come. Uh, I also want to give a mahalo to my mentor, Leigh Brown. She can't be here because she had a baby, which is adorable. Um, and then, yeah, she had a baby. And I want to say thank you to everyone who sponsored. Hello, Alohi. Awesome job. Do we have any questions? Just one. Let's get one question. Any question online? Oh, I gotta go all the way over there. <laughs> Maybe just say it and then repeat it in there. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> um, the question was when I was working there, what was the energy like? And the energy was very strong. Um, you could definitely feel it. As soon as I pulled in on my first day, I automatically knew the energy was going to be strong, but I didn't realize how strong it was. Um, not going to lie, it's a very odd feeling because of how like intense it is. I know people ask me that quite often, too. Um, during our hokai with pipes, um, when we went to Aina University, I had the same question. And I don't know how to explain the energy there. It's, it's very intense. And it's not a scary intent. It's just like you better be respectful or you're going to get lickings, <laughs> like something like that. So um, I respect the energy, though. I love taking in the energy. Um, it's just also when there is people visiting, it can get a little um, a different type of energy because they have kids running around, and then also they're not from here, so they're not going to understand the cultural aspect of it. So being someone who's looked into the cultural aspect and learned the history, um, I definitely think there should be more guidelines upon that and maybe a stricter rule of like trail access because we have certain trail access, but even then a lot of the kids will try to climb on the rocks or pick up the rocks, so the energy kind of changes then. But if you're alone standing out there right in front of the Heiau, it is a very, very strong energy. Mahalo Nui, can we give a round of applause to Alohi? So we kind of set up for this next uh, presentation. I just wanted to give a little shout out and acknowledgement to uh, this presentation as well as the next two that you folks will be seeing. Uh, without support from the National Park Service, we wouldn't be able to uh, be doing internships like this. And uh, hey, shh. Um, and we have a, we're fortunate enough to have a three-year agreement with them to develop the next generation of cultural resource managers at the National Park. So um, thank you to Jade and Mama Bear Sharon uh, for, for making things happen for this program. Thank you, guys. And without further ado, I guess I'll introduce Brother Man from over here, from left field, standing at 6'3". I don't want to say how, how, how heavy you are. From Panaeva, Hawaii, Glenn Kealoha, AKA Kaimi. Uh, aloha mai kako. 
my name is Kuimi Kealoha. I was born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii, graduated Kumehameha Schools, class of 2022, uh, and I reside in Ottawa University in Arizona. Uh, my project name is Malama Aina with Havel, Western Science to Hawaiian Science. Uh, so this summer I got the opportunity to work at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park in the Cultural Resource Department. Uh, my awesome mentors were uh, Nafatalia Fla uh, Flate and Caleb Hook. And this is a picture of them. This is Tali and this is Caleb. And then their colleagues, uh, Linda, Janae, Krista, Carly, and <laughs> Anna, Anna Kalea. And here are some cool places I got to experience. Uh, first off, oh. Okay, yeah, whatever. Uh, I got to go to Kahuku Ranch in Kau. Uh, it's a cool place. I got to see some farming systems from old Hawaii and it used to be a cattle ranch. Oh, okay, there you go. Uh, and then I got to go to Kau Desert Footprints. Uh, we did condition assessments on C-shaped structures and I got to observe some footprints. And I'll go all over these uh, sites later into my presentation. Uh, and then the next site I got to do was Helinopoli. Uh, we got to overlook USGS scientists digging into the soil looking for different ash layers. And we were there in case they dig up some, you know, cultural artifacts. And we got to go to Kipuku Kuaulu Bird Park Trail. Uh, we did an assessment on a Mauna Loa cave system that the National Park Service wants to close up because, you know, some people like go inside and, you know, almost mock it. Uh, my my uncle, uh, Pauli Kilihomalu, was a big advocate for this area. He did a lot of clearing for the trail and done a lot of stuff for the native plants. And Kialakomo, out of Chainer Crater Road, we got to do some condition assessments here with cisterns, salt dryers, and other cool stuff. Uh, and then 20 minutes fisherman's trail, uh, we got to do condition assessments on old ruins. And uh, we got to go on some park trails in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park we did some condition assessments on trails. And lastly, uh, just yesterday, they took us to Pulu Station. It was a 12 mile or 10 mile hike up there. Uh, my mentor, Caleb, took us out there. It was pretty cool. It used to be a Hawaiian tree fern industry. And going on to Western science and Hawaiian science. So Hawaiian science is not about the tools and technology, but an organized method of questioning, testing, and examining results with the land to Malama. Uh, and here are some pictures of what I think depicts Hawaiian science. So our kupuna were observers. They cultivated the land to sustain over one million people on Hawaii Island alone. Uh, they figured out different farming systems for different landscapes, like wetland and dry land. Uh, they fished and farmed based off of moon phases, which is pretty cool that they figured out. Uh, they learned how to navigate. And they created systems that allow plants and animals to thrive among Kanaka. And moving on to Western science. Uh, Western science is starting to understand that Hawaiian practice, mythology, and recording have equal validity and are a functional and useful method of exploring our world and universe. So, so here are some of the things that I got to do and learn at the park. Um, we got to do, or I got to observe some excavation sites. Uh, we did laser scannings, condition assessments, photometry, and just like Hawaiians, observing the land. And moving on to our Kahuku unit. Uh, in Kahuku, uh, we did some field schools, so huakais, uh, it's on the bottom here. We got to take four field schools out there. We got to take Naalehu Elementary, Poho High, Ka'u High, and we did a community day. Uh, I think this is a great experience for, you know, Kiki and people in Ka'u to learn. You know, why work in somebody's backyard without even, like, telling them what we're doing there? So it was a cool experience to host. 
and it was a great experience for the keiki because we try to you know inspire them to maybe come into this line of work and the keiki loved it they liked uh getting down and dirty with the archaeologist and his interns in the excavation sites so kahuku was a ranch land in the 1800s uh, it was ran by paniolo so hawaiian cowboys managed the livestock in kahuku uh, but after the 1886 Mauna Loa lava flow, it wiped out the land and all the cattle, so all the steak was gone. Uh, s and then archaeologists went in there and used aerial imagery and found that there were field systems from the 1750s. Our ancestors used these uh, field systems to grow uwala, banana, breadfruit, and sugarcane to sustain themselves out there in the dry land farming system. Our ancestors used fire to clear the land of native forest, brush, and grass before planting these uh, plants. And their farming system that they used were called kua ivi. Uh, Hawaiians built rock walls, which were called kua ivis, um, to abs absorb moisture in the air to uh, regulate uh, moisture and warmth t for their plants. So here's a picture of oh when it loads. Oh, whatever. Well, here's a picture of me, the archaeologist from Manoa, and uh, another intern, Janae, that worked with me at the park. And moving on to laser scanning. So laser scanning. Laser scanning is the process of capturing three-dimensional spatial data using uh, lasers. Laser scanning is an effective method for 3D modeling and precise measurements. And laser scanner acquires data in the form of points like point X, point Y, point Z, or point one, two, and three. And I got to, oh, here's an example of a laser scan. Uh, so here's like a aerial view of this cave that my mentor Caleb got to do. It's Pua Po'o Cave. So you can see that it goes from forest to forest and in the middle it splits. And inside the cave, you can see it's like, like comic-y. Uh, he laser scans it and depicts it in the computer to make uh, this picture. And going down, this is the laser scanner that we use. It's worth $100,000, and yes, they trusted me to use this. Uh, and the place I got to laser scan was uh, Jagger Museum. So here's me operating the laser scanner. And here's like the area that we got to laser scan. Uh, so basically, they are deconstructing, deconstructing uh, Jagger Museum and moving it in the back due to earthquakes and the land being not right for the building and people going in, going in there. And here is the results of our laser scanning. So as you can see here is like a picture of our results and that black dot right there is where the laser scanner is. And in this picture it depicts uh, what you can do with the laser scanner. So you could put a point here and a point here and it would measure how big uh, in reality this roof is. So it's 8.226 meters. And moving on to in the field. So I have to give a lot of credit to my CRM group, they are beasts in the field, so I would just go up to the office and they would tell me, oh, let's go out in the field. I'd be like, oh, yeah, Roger. Uh, <laughs> so it would just be hiking for, like, miles, or it would, like, range from, like, a mile to, like, you know, 10 miles, like, police station. And they expect me to go back to the office and, like, sit in that chair and go on the computer. I'm like, oh, you guys are nuts for this. <laughs> so I'd be over there just, like, dozing off. Like, but I, I get my work done. I promise, I promise. But the first uh, area that I got to go to was Calicoma, uh, Chain of Crater Road. Uh, it's off of Chain of Crater Road, actually. It's a couple miles in. I got to do some condition assessments on cisterns. Cisterns are like basically old uh, catchment systems, so for drinking water or for like their plants and animals. And salt dryers, which the Hawaiians would, yeah, the Hawaiian. The Hawaiians would put uh, salt water inside and it would dry it and get like Hawaiian salt. 
And we also got to do some cave systems. I didn't get to go all the way inside, but I got to check them out. Uh, and I got to see a cool petroglyph on the side on the side wall of the cave system. Uh, going on to Ka'u Desert. So Ka'u Desert was a pretty cool place that I never thought I would be going to. Uh, basically, it's just a bunch of footprints in the desert, and we got to assess C-shaped C -shaped structures. C-shaped structures are believed to be where Hawaiians make shifted areas for shade and shelter on the um, Ka'u Desert Trail. And the footprints are preserved in ash layers, so if you want to see. Uh, these are all ash stairs, and the footprints would be preserved in them. So the backstory story is basically that Kamehameha and Keua were having hakaka, they went battle them out. They battled them out, out in like Waimea, I think, and then while Keua was hiking back, Kamehameha was like, oh, Pele, what, like wipe them out for me? <laughs> and then huge, he didn't wipe like, I think like a quarter of the army out. But I thought it was all the warriors' footprints, but actually the scientists went in and measured some footprints and there were some kids and women's footprints, so they believed it was a trail that the cool residents used to go to like Puna or Hilo or Waimea. And they were just walking on the ash. And here's a picture of us in the field. Uh, moving on to 20 minutes fisherman's trail. So 20, min 20 minutes is, uh, it holds a special place in my heart. Uh, my family has holoholoed here for generations. Uh, my great grandmother, uh, my dad's grandma, that Hawaiian sitting over there in the orange shirt, uh, she gave land or like 200 acres to the national park for to give us rights to you know do practices and holoholo out there, but. We have to do condition assessments on believed to be burial sites, uh, rock formations, and salt drying stations. So as you can see here. And all these sites are like in the middle of nowhere. People don't really know where these things are unless you like uh, my hammer mentor, Caleb. So yeah, as you can see, there's like opiki shells from back in the day and stuff. And lastly, the Pula Station. So just yesterday, I learned about the Pula Station. Uh, it dates back to the 1850s. It was a factory to harvest Pulu from the Hapu'u fern. Uh, pulu is this uh, fiber from the fern. They, people used it to make pillow stuffing due to cotton shortages in the country. I think it was like during the Civil War era, they're saying. Uh, yeah, and they're trying to preserve the area, so my mentor Caleb and his colleague Jeff would, uh, back in the day, went out and tried to weed this place out to help preserve it. And yeah, I just want to say a huge thanks to National Park Service, University of Hawaii at Hilo, the Haoli Mao Loa Foundation, and Pipes, and I just want to say a Big mahalo to my CRM group. Uh, without them, I would have not been able, been able to see all these cool places. And uh, as a Kanaka, I want to be a big advocate for them. Uh, they put our culture before their science. So just keep doing what you're doing, guys. And yeah, mahalo for everything that you guys do. Mahalo Nui. Do we have a question? For Mr. Ke Aloha. I'll start throwing their mentors on the spot, like give them the mic. I should probably give one to you. There we go. Okay, I'm running to you, Caleb. Hey, can you be good job on that? Um, <laughs> so my question is, what was your favorite thing that you did the whole summer, and how would you what would you tell your friends the your favorite thing and what the best part about it? Mm. I don't know. I think my favorite thing was actually looking at the footprints out in Ka'u, which is pretty cool. But I don't know, all the experiences and all the opportunities that the National Park Service gave to me, like uh, Eruption Crew. Eruption Crew was pretty sick. 
to do without you guys. I would have not been able to do that and gain that experience. But yeah, I think the footprints, seeing that and hearing about the backstory was pretty interesting. Okay, I gotta run over there. Hold on. I think we next year we gotta have two of these mics, huh? So, if you were gonna continue working with these guys, what are the kinds of techniques and tools that you'd be really excited to learn about um, applying? Mm, I would like to learn more about photometry. Uh, it's kind of the same thing as laser scanning on the computer wise, but photometry is a pretty cool thing to learn or take in reference of uh, cultural artifacts. Like, so laser scanning is like laser scanning a big area. Photometry is like, uh, so say I can photometry this stand right here. It's like for more smaller, smaller things. So maybe that. Um, just before, I will hand the mic over. Um, so Mrs. Correa's education playlist says, well done, Kaimi. Um, oh, thanks, Ms. Correa. But also, there's a question. <laughs> um, have you been to those places prior to this program? That was another question. Uh, just 20 minutes trail. Uh, it's pretty cool, because I think without this program, I would have not seen all these places. Like the pool station, for example. That thing is like in the middle of nowhere. We had to hike up lava. Uh, going to a forest, uh, hike past a couple like craters, it's just pretty cool. So yeah, I would have not been like, able to do all these things without them. Aloha kawa. Hi, Auntie Sip. Considering all of your experiences and, and having visited places that most Kanaka don't have access to, how has perhaps your perspective or sense of kuleana as a Kanaka changed because of your experiences? Good question. <laughs> uh, it changed a lot. Uh, before this summer, before pipes, I didn't want to go into conservation, but you know, it showed me a big perspective of how taking care of the land, how the aina plays a big part in my life. You know, I thought you know, working the kalo patch in the backyard was just you know chores, but it's just you know. It's helping sustain the aina, it's helping sustain everybody. You know, maybe in the future we don't need the barges. We can just sustain ourselves over here just like our ancestors used to do. Okay, one more thing. I know that as a result of your internship, you had additional opportunities to work the flow um, or in Hale Ma'u Ma'u. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so it was like at an all park meeting uh, since I think it was that day we had an all park meeting. The Halimomo crater erupted. So they asked people to, um, you know, work them because a lot, bunch of people like come. So I don't know. I just got to direct traffic, you know, hey, the Hollies, the Hollies come over here, the Hawaiians go on this side. <laughs> nah, 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 but it was, it was cool. It was cool. I got to see the lava flow. Uh, I got to see plenty of people out there. They were like, oh, Kimi, what you doing over here? I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm doing up here, right? Nah, but it was a great experience. Okay, we got one more. Oh, this is going to be a good one. Not a question, just a comment. When um, Kaimi was, we approached Kaimi about doing the eruption duty, he jumped at the chance. And um, the staff was really impressed by him and really were honored to work with him. Um, so thank you, Kaimi, for all your nah, I'm honored work. to work with you guys. <laughs> They're the hammers. And he's going into archaeology, mom and daddy's changing his major. Nah, just <laughs> <don't know. laughs> Follow. Good job, Kanye. Mahalo for sharing your wonderful experience over the summer. Um, it is my honor and my pleasure to be introducing our next speaker, who also have strong connections to Ka'u as well as Hilo. Um, I'd like to introduce Bethany Okamoto, who will be sharing her experience also with um, NPS. Mahalo.
Aloha kaku. Uh, hi, my name is Bethany. Uh, you just heard that. Um, so sorry to bring the energy back down. I know we just went on Kaimi's Holo Holo adventure, uh, but now we got to take it back to the office this time. So <laughs> sorry, guys. No more of the. There's still fun pictures, though. I promise. Um, so yeah, this summer, as you heard, like Kaimi, I was with the Cultural Resource Management Office at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. I was digitizing collections there. Um, there's many collections there, you don't see them. Um, so it was very cool to learn this summer to be in that space, um, to get to work with those photos and those items. So to just start, I kind of do have strong ties to the Ku'u area, that is where my ohana is from, that's where my mother is from. Um, this quote that you can see on the screen here is actually from my uh, Tutukane Ku'umi Kin En, my great-great-grandfather. Um, it says, as you can read, because we have these good things, we should do the right thing to leave something for those who are coming after us, that they may know. And so that's kind of sort of my tie to anthropology, it's my um, subject of study. And most importantly, collections work. Um, my great-great-grandfather's words, his recordings, um, his ike on ka'u are included in a few archaeological surveys. Um, and a lot of those recordings are at Bishop Museums. Um, my mother has been working for the past few years to access um, those recordings. Unfortunately, it kind of is a lengthy process. Um, but that's kind of sort of my personal tie. What makes collection work special to me is knowing that it's not just uh, words or objects, but it's connected to people, real people um, and families. So kind of when I go through this presentation, I just want a question for you folks to reflect on is, um, can cultural um, items and collections be used for reflection? So I just wanted to start with introducing you folks to two faces I've actually seen a lot of this summer. Um, <laughs> As you can see on the left, we have Charlotte Lovejoy Westcott. Um, she's the daughter of Channing Lovejoy and the namesake for the Charlotte Lovejoy Westcott collection. She's the one who donated to the park. And on the right, we have Superintendent Thomas Bowles, who was the first superintendent of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Um, so you guys are gonna get acquainted with them as well <laughs> as we go over this presentation. So like I mentioned, um, the Charlotte Lovejoy Westcott collection is named for Charlotte Lovejoy. Her father was the manager of the Volcano House. If you don't know, the Volcano House is a hotel that's been located on park premises for a while now. This was back in the 1920s. Um, her father was actually manager in 1923 to 1923. 27. And so these photos mainly are composed of guests, visitors going on hikes, geological formations, the volcano house itself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those kind of images. Um, I think there's about, there we go, 153 images in that collection. Um, actually, I only did half of it. Megan um, did the other half. She's one of the interns at the park. So awesome to her because that took me a while to get through. Um, but that's not even the tip of the iceberg because the Thomas Bulls collection is actually 692 photographs of Thomas's Bulls times not only at the park but beyond as the superintendent. So a lot of the pictures that you see in there are also geological features, guests. He has this group that he takes a lot of pictures of called the Volcano Kids, the Volcano House Kids, <laughs> of which Charlotte was one of them. Um, and those photos actually cover a longer time frame. It's from the 1920s to the 1970s. So what I was actually doing this summer is these physical photographs needed to be transferred to a digital format. And that's called digitization, when you take that physical object and transfer it into, in this case, like a TIFF file or like a JPEG. So to kind of sort of show you that process of digitization, here's just a couple images of what that work looked like for me. Um, this was my little workstation in room nine <laughs> in the basement of the Kilauea Visitor Center. A very stark difference from the Ka'u Desert, so sorry. <laughs> but as you can see, this is my friend, the scanner. I didn't give her a name, but I should have because I spent a lot of time with her. Um, but basically, I would have a box. The box is organized into folders. You take the images out of the folders with gloves, of course. <laughs> handle them carefully and nicely. Then you put it in the scanner, make sure everything is good, ready to go. The program would already be pulled up on the computer as you can see here with the settings inputted, specific settings for like the kind of photograph that it was. Um, and then you make sure everything is ready to go by previewing the scan, then you scan it, 
and after you scan it is perhaps the most fun thing to ever do in the world, and I would love to do it for the rest of my life, metadata. <laughs> so metadata, if you don't know, um, it's a funny word. It's data about data. So the pictures that I'm scanning are the data, and then the data about the data is who took the photograph, when it was taken, any information about the location, a uh, description, a title, uh, copyright information, all that kind of sort of stuff. So I did it in this lovely program, Adobe, <laughs> Adobe Bridge, um, my favorite thing to open up. Um, and basically, uh, I guess the longest part of the process is called alt text, alternative text, and it's for accessibility reasons. But basically, you have to describe a photo in like the most detail possible. So if somebody who couldn't see it can visualize it. So that's kind of sort of the digitization process. Metadata was definitely the longest part of it, but it really tested my ability to think of synonyms. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, writing the same word over and over for roof, not it. <laughs> so after learning a little bit about the process, why do museums do this kind of sort of thing? Why do they digitize collections? And digitization is just one of the many modern methods that museums are using to preserve their collections. According to the NPS handbook, uh, museum handbook, uh, museums are tasked with collecting and documenting, preserving, and providing for collections access. So digitization is just a tool to reach these goals. And so the benefits of digitization are kind of sort of threefold. Um, it makes collections more accessible. Uh, eventually, these photos that I've scanned and done metadata for will end up on the MPS Gallery website, where people around the world will be able to access them. They won't just have to go into, you know, the visitor center or schedule a time to look at these photos, but they'll actually be able to access them and see the information about them on the site. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with preservation, uh, because the less people physically touch the pictures and handle them, the better. Uh, the longer their lifespan will be. Um, and that kind of sort of leads to perpetuation because when these resources are properly preserved and protected as well as, you know, widely accessible to the community, it leads to perpetuation where in perpetuity people can view these images and learn from them. So during my time, I didn't actually spend all my time in a basement, I promise. I did get to go holo holo sometimes, sometimes with Amy, sometimes not. <laughs> so some of these pictures that I was looking at in the collections were actually things that are still in the park today or things that we can find similar features of. So I get to go on these trips where I would see these features or even the same locations. So that's kind of sort of what we're going to look at now, photo comparisons between uh, pictures in the collections and what they look like today. Some of these photos are of similar features, so it means it's not in the same location, but it's depicting a similar thing. And some of them are in the same location, just in two different time periods. So the first one that we have here is the Volcano Golf Course. It's actually been in operation for like 100 years, pretty long time for a golf course. Um, pictures of guests in the Charlotte Lovejoy Westcott collection. You can see them golfing on the green. Um, quite a few pictures actually enjoying that there. And if you want to go visit it, it's called the Volcano Golf Course. Like I said, they're still there. So. Of course, we have the Volcano House, the hotel. Um, the Volcano House, of course, features heavily in the Charlotte Lovejoy Westcott. I'll just call it the Westcott Collection to save, <laughs> save time. But that's because, obviously, Channing Lovejoy was the manager of the house. Um, it was first built in the 1810s as like a simple cabin lodging, um, but eventually it got expanded through many renovations. It experienced fires and other such things. So the current photo that you see is in a different location, but similar vibe. Here we have a trail sign. Uh, the modern picture is along Halima'uma'u Trail. And this one here, I'm not quite sure, but it is, in fact, the world's weirdest walk. <laughs> As you can see, uh, changes in the way that these signs are designed are very evident. And we'll talk more about that later. So you can see my mentor Carly next to a, a big boulder here. Um, many of the pictures in the Charlotte Lovejoy Westcott, and I actually saw a few in the Bowles collection of these huge boulders that were spewed out of Halima'uma'u in, I believe, yep, 1924, eight tons, pretty big. Um, these areas are now not really accessible. You don't want to be tromping in those areas, lest a boulder like that fall on top of you. 
Um, but you can still find them in places like along the Kilauea Iki Trail. Here we have a lava clinker. It's a word that I didn't even know until I saw Thomas Bull's annotations on the back of a picture. Pretty cool. <laughs> but like I said, in the Bull's collection, there are geological features, and a lot of times you see him next to them. Pretty cool to see. Um, yeah. Now we're getting into my favorite ones, the same location photographs. Here's a monument overlook. It's featured twice in the Westcott collection. Um, at the time, it had some beautiful panoramic views <coughs> of Kilauea Volcano, um, but now not so much. There is vegetation in the way, but the monument still stands, so it's something pretty cool to see. Here we have the stairs for the old Volcano House. Um, the 1920s Volcano House, I'm not gonna lie, is kind of sort of my favorite. It had a sunroom, a billiards room, all these sorts of cool features. Um, obviously now it's not there anymore, but I still think it's pretty cool. Here we have steam baths. In the 1920s photo, you can see Channing Lovejoy working, or not working, but I guess supervising the construction of these steam baths. If you go to the site now, you can stick your hand over the hole and you can still feel hot air, which I thought was pretty exciting, but I'm still confused as to what that was for. And lastly, for the same location, we have the water tanks and the watershed. These facilities help support the Volcano House and are still in the same location above where the Volcano House used to be. So while we're looking at these photographs, some basic observations can be made. Obviously, there's differing locations and vegetation has grown over time, but I wanted to uh, reflect on these photos and see if they could tell me anything about the culture or values in the park or ways things have changed since when that photograph was originally taken. So to start off, there is obviously similar visitor interest. Obviously the Volcano House is still in operation even though you know it's changed locations over time due to various complications or relocations. Um, it's still in the same spot and it still offers the same visitor experience. You still get that wonderful view of the crater um, that they would have had back then. Um, also, there's still the golf course that is obviously in operation and running. So it's clear that tourist interest in the area has remained relatively unchanged. People still want to see that area. Um, and the continued maintenance of such facilities is evidence of that. Obviously, there's also differences in safety. Um, some pictures, particularly of hikers um, and geological features, are now places that we can't visit anymore. Um, and likely because they're in areas like the crater and things like that. And this is likely due to the park's increased awareness and precaution regarding having two volcanoes located within its boundaries. You know, just increasing awareness is about safety and the unpredictability of the volcano. And lastly, and I feel like the most important, is changes in values. Is uh, the two images of those trail signs that we saw earlier. I'm not gonna scroll back to it, it would take too long. But <laughs> those images that we saw of the trail signs earlier show a shift in park values regarding the spaces that it contains and manages. Um, the sign in the 1920s appears to appeal to the idea of an exotic or weird landscape for visitors to explore. And this starkly contrasts with modern park signs, which are used as an informational navigational tool. Um, and a lot of times they try to include indigenous place names or ancestral knowledge of place on these trail signs or plaques. And this is a reflection of the work of native and local community members, as well as the federal government and staff um, to recount and add to the rich heritage and history of the place. So here's a wonderful photo of the crater. Uh, this is from the back of the modern day volcano house. So like I said, it still has that wonderful view. So as you can tell, like from looking at these photos back then and now, um, there are people, lands, and histories that are covered by these photos. You might just look at them as an object or just something to stare at people that you don't know and you don't understand, but there's somebody's family there. There's, somebody history, there's somebody's history there. There's culture there. And I think it's really important to recognize photographs' unique ability to communicate that sort of intimate knowledge. And that's a reason why we can use them as a tool to reflect, critique, and even celebrate the past and the present. 
So through time, it's clear to me by looking at these photographs of smiling guests, happy hikers, interested park members, that this space has been an area of joy, discovery, and wonder for a very long time. And if we continue to care for it, it will remain that way. And lastly, I'd just like you to consider your own collections. Think about your own family photo album or your Instagram or whatever it happens to be. Oh, what would people in the future uh, reflect on or think of when they looked at your personal collections? And how would you like them to be treated by somebody like me in the future? <laughs> I'd just like to give a big mahalo to the Cultural Resource Management Office for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Uh, they're all sitting right there. So if you all want to stare at them and clap, that would be great. I'd also like to thank my funders, the National Park Service, Haoli Mauloa Foundation, Pipes, and the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Thank you. Awesome job. Um, we're gonna what? Yeah, um, we're gonna take some questions now. Is there anybody in the audience who would? You would do this to me, bro, all the way. Uh, so my question is, what are some cool artifacts you got to work with, and maybe what is your favorite ones you got to see? That's a good question. I thought everything was really cool. It was very interesting to see. We got to go to a cultural festival. You were there. You know that. We went to a cultural <laughs> festival um, in Kahuku, which was a really cool experience. And me and Carly got to share some artifacts with the community from our collections. Um, some do not touch artifacts. Keep that in mind. Do not touch. <laughs> But I think my favorite part was the huge ads that we had. I'm not kidding you. It was definitely this big. Um, I also, it was interesting to learn about some things that I'd never even heard of, like abraders. Um, I guess it was like different materials, like coral or basalt rock that they used to sand things. That was interesting. And opihi shell scrapers. Just things that I had never seen before or heard. And it was really special to me as a kanaka to see those things and see objects that my ancestors interacted with, especially ones that, you know, are not popularly known, like a poi pounder, you know? So that was pretty cool. That was awesome. Mahalo Nui. Do we have one more? One more. Not a question, but just a, a comment. I wanted to thank you, Bethany, for all your hard work. You know, this was a really tough project. And when we were looking to decide um, on the intern, it had to be somebody who was going to be able to handle it. Because as you can tell, it's not the most exciting thing you do every day. And I'll have to say, I saw Bethany in the morning and at lunch and in the, and the afternoon, and she was always positive and uh, you know, always upbeat, and so thank you so much for that. What she has started um, here with this project with Carly and Megan, um, you know, the, the park has thousands of, of images, and people just don't get to see it, um, but the project that they've started is really gonna open up um, these images to the, the, the world, really. So thank you, Bethany, for all your hard work. Good job. Stop clapping, I think we have one more. We have one, uh, we have one online one. So from William, William Hui, what is one artifact that you found while scanning that you didn't expect to see? I guess, and it wouldn't be really like an artifact, but I guess more like an image I wasn't expecting to see. Um, I don't really know, I guess the coolest things to see would be the eruption photographs and the bulls collection that I've recently seen. Um, there's one, I can't remember what the village was called, but it's of a flow that happened in 1926, I believe, um, from Mauna Loa. So that was really interesting to see the lava interacting with the water, really up close picture. 
Also cool to see photographers with their old cameras from the 1900s. That was pretty cool, a couple pictures of that. And of course, the kids was very interesting to see, kids leaning over uh, earthquake vents and steam vents, very close. I was wondering where their parents were. <laughs> <laughs> but that was cool too, I guess, to see the curiosity and interaction with the landscapes in the park, so yeah. Can you get a round of applause? <laughs> Right on, mahalo nui, Beth, for sharing your wonderful experience. Right now, we're actually going to take a 15-minute break before we get into the last section of our um, presentation. So 15 minutes, I'll make fast kind and come right back because we're going to start promptly at 2.29. Mahalo.
Okay, I think we're almost back, guys. But I don't know how to do this. <laughs> do you want to do it? <laughs> Right, and Leslie is all set. Good. All right, wonderful. Aloha, everyone. I'm Sharon Ziegler Chong. I um, uh, run the office that the Pipes is within, and have been involved with Pipes for 29 years. Um, it's been a while, so this is really exciting. And I wanted to just introduce our uh, next program. Our next, our, our four speakers. Um, the next four interns are working as part of a partnership that is a new partnership as well, just like the Park Service one. Um, it is with, uh, uh, these are four projects that are w a part of UH Hilo's partnership with the Hawaii Community Foundation uh, and Arizona State University, uh, the University of Hawaii and various other partners are working together on Iole. Um, this uh, UH Hilo's effort within um, uh, within with Iole is focused on it's a it's an overall program looking at the studies across the Aupua'a. Uh, we have several faculty involved, and these four are going to be looking at everything from the sky to listening to down in the in the um, uh, ground and the water that runs through it. So it's a really exciting part of our partnership and the faculty who have been working on this for um, just uh, just over a year. Uh, we've been talking with them and we're really excited and I hope people are online too are um, going to be able to join in on this. So we're excited to hear this. So with our first speaker is going to start in the sky um, and, and give us an overview literally um, is uh, Leslie and Cecile Coote. <laughs> Okay, so my project is on creating a geodatabase for the Iole Ahupua'a. Hello, my name is Leslie and Ciso Cruz, and as of May 2023, I'm a recent UH Hilo graduate with a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science. So, I was raised in the country of Mexico, but I am fortunate enough to be here today because of my parents who immigrated to the United States so I could pursue a higher education. As a kid, I grew up very connected to the land, which is what led me to pursuing a higher education in environmental sciences. I grew up by the ocean. I grew up also in the ranches on my pet donkey. And I grew up helping my grandpa take care of his mango acres and coconut acres. All right, so for this project, I am glad to be working with um, the UH Hilo SAB Lab, or Spatial da Data Analysis and Visualization Lab, under mentorship of Dr. Ryan Peroy and Dr. Roberto Rodriguez. Some of their previous work and current work includes monitoring the 2018 lava flow, mapping coastal erosion throughout the island, and using drone and helicopter imagery to help combat rod. Here we have um, an image, an aerial image um, showing some rod trees, some infected rod trees and some non-infected rod trees. I'd like to give a thanks to all the agencies and funders for supporting not just me, but all of the PIPES interns here. All right, so let's get into our brief history of Kohala. Kohala is the oldest place on the island of Hawaii, and it is a home to King Kamehameha, making it the true heart of Hawaii and filling it with so much history. So in 1841, a Protestant missionary named Elias Bond settled near, the Kapa, near Kapa'au and established what is referred to as the Bond District in Iole. And there's an image of it, and it's an image of Bond himself. 
1863, Bond planned on starting the Sugar Cane Company and part of his land and his neighbor's land became the center of the Kohala Sugar Company. By 1906, the Kohala Sugar Company controlled 13,500 acres of sugar plantations on the island of Hawaii. In 1906, the Kohala Ditch was also built to bring water from the uplands to the lowlands, and the company closed in 1975. As Sharon mentioned now, we are currently, um, Iola is currently under ownership by the Hawaii Community Foundation with partnership of UH Hilo and Arizona State. But before that, the ownership changes were in 1967 when the Iola Development Corporation formed to hold trust over the Bond Estate and lease the land to the neighboring ranchers. By 1998 to 2008, 2,418 acres of land was donated to the New Moon Foundation and in 2016, the Kohala Institute was given master lease over the acres. So since that change in ownership, there has been a goal or an initiative to steward Iole back to the Ahupua it once was. After all, an Ahupua is a traditional Hawaiian division of land that conserves and maintains its natural use of resource levels while maintaining the population within its boundaries. So, this summer, there are four different projects, including mine, being done in Iole. Going from Malka to Makai, we have Lillian and the Lohe Lab monitoring acoustic recordings. We have Wyatt and Dr. Peter Mills conducting microbotanical surveys at the Lohe. And we have Amber with Dr. Steve Colbert taking water samples to compare to other locations. As you can see in the image here, the two blue points are where the water samples were taken. The orange point is where the acoustic recordings were monitored, and the green point is where the microbotanical surveys were done. And then there's a the red line buffering the Ahupua viole, which is what my geodatabase will cover. So what is a geodatabase? It is a storage space that holds several layers, and by having the geodatabase on one platform, it will allow the viewer to play around with different data, visual data layers that they want to see or analyze. And by creating a geodatabase that holds visual data layers from several different time periods, it will help guide stewards of Iole in a way that they will be able to see how land has changed over time, what land used to look like, what is currently there, and perhaps some things that are there right now that weren't there before. So some of the previous work, um, during my 2023 spring school year, um, I was in Dr. Peroy's field methods class and we got to help start the foundation of this project by taking ground control points for the helicopter that would be taking aerial images to create the base map or ortho mosaic that is used to compare other data or visual layers to. So here we have some images um, from that helicopter flight after we took those ground control points. Um, the top image shows flying over the reservoir in Iole. So my first step in creating a geodatabase was to search for visual layers and images that already exist. From there, I organized those layers into different categories such as agriculture and land use, water resources, and geologic and geophysical. Um, as Beth mentioned earlier, metadata. So this is kind of my mini met metadata spreadsheet, organizing all the layers that I was pulling in I then geo-referenced historical aerial images to correctly, align, con to correctly align the images to control points on the base map that was created. 
I also cut down layers to only cover the North Kohala district to make it a focal point. So for example here, we have an image of 1985 solar radiation lines, and but we're only showing the lines in North Kohala. That way we're not focusing on the outer areas too much. And then from there, the visual layers and images were then uploaded onto ArcGIS Online for those who have a link to be able to access the data and play around with it and make any analysis on it. So below shows some of the data available on the geodatabase. Right here we have, let me click on it. So right here is the 2023 base map that was created from the helicopter flight imagery flight that you guys saw earlier in this presentation. Um, I also had to do some editing during my time here and honestly that was kind of a challenge because at one point I was staring at a computer screen and I was like, is this the correct spot that the tree's supposed to be in? Is this the correct angle? Should I be focusing on residential areas? So I was, I spent a lot of time looking at this on PIX40. And this was, will also be used to compare to other aerial images. So here we have an image from 1954 and 1965. Um, someone who's viewing this image may choose to focus on the change in the coastline or they may choose to compare it to the 2023 base map to see how things have changed over time. Here we have an image from 1977 and 2000. A viewer a viewer looking at these two layers right on top of each other might choose to focus on the change in forest going up Malpa. As you can see, there's more forest grown in. Or they might choose to view the increase in residential areas during the time period, depending on what they choose to focus on when playing around in the database. As I said, we also have some layers on agriculture and land use. So this one is from 1978. Um, someone viewing this may see that grazing covered a lot of the Iole Ahupua'a, um, as well as a bit of macadamia nuts. And it seems like some avocados too. They can then compare this layer. Let's see. Oh. They can then compare that layer from a layer of the year 2020. So on this one, it shows that it seems like pasture is still dominating the Iole Ahupua, but macadamia nuts have definitely made their spread as well. We also have some layers on streams. Um, I specifically put this one in here because I made a trip out to Iole before my project was coming to an end and I got to talk to the Aina crew and they were completely fascinated by being able to see all these layers and I only showed them this example. And I think that once we have something like this up, we can take their input on like layers such as streams, like this one is our 2008 layer, but currently it is the most up-to-date layer on the geo database, meaning there is not one for 2023. But with any input from the INA crew or others who are familiar with streams, we can make any updates as needed. And then another example of some layers we have is we have some layers um, on soil, so water permeability. Water permeability is the measure of how fast applied irrigation water moves through the soil. And as you can see here, in the region of the Iole Ahupua'a, it's pretty moderate going down Makai side, but once you go up Malka, it seems to be pretty fast. And then this one's from 2014. So, creating a geodatabase is only the, found is only the beginning of a foundation as mentioned earlier, there are other projects being done in Iole, which means new data layers are being generated. 
And now that a foundation has been created, we can see what is missing and what data needs to be collected. So what are some of the next steps? Um, we can continue updating the database as new layers come in. We can continue finding older data layers. We can improve them by georeferencing and ground truthing to make layer corrections, and we can help answer questions that any people in Eolan may have. Throughout this project, I was able to personally grow my connection to myself and my home, as before this, I kind of really didn't have a place that felt as similar as home till I came here. And thanks to Yole, I've been gaining confidence in my work and myself. I'd also like to thank the agencies and funders for not only giving me the opportunity to continue a project that I started during the end of my senior year, but being able to connect with other people and Yole. Mahalo to all the agencies. Awesome job, Leslie. Do we have any questions or comments? It's about time for me to start answering questions. Um, I'm actually on the, the Board of Directors for EOLA, so thank oh, you for this work. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and um, I have a kind of challenging question to ask you. So you've been listening to presentations all day from various people and their projects. Are there any of the projects you've heard today that you think could also be done at EOLA and we could learn more about that place? Um, I definitely will write when Beth and Kaimi were giving their presentations. I was, I definitely know there's, when we went to Yola, it seemed like we weren't as introduced to the history as much. So I wish that that was something that was done right off the bat because we can have all this data, but without the history, you kind of can't really piece it all together. So looking at these, Im like really looking at historical images and analyzing things like that, super important. And yeah, the cultural significance. I think we were all there for orientation and I think we definitely needed a little bit more of it and I'm grateful that my internship gave me more of that with Eola. Mahalo, do we have another question? When I went up to Eole, some most of the streams are dry and there's yeah. wells. And so I was wondering if there'd be some way, and maybe this is a question for Ryan, to update that to show where there is running water, where it's dry, where the wells are, because there was a lot of historical diversions in that area. So trying to really understand the picture of the water movement, I feel like that kind of shows you where the dr where it drains, but where mm -hmm. the water can really be found would be interesting. Yeah, that's also something that the Aina crew brought up while I was up in Iole. So I hope it's definitely a project coming up because that layer was from 2008 and we're in 2023 now, so. One more? I think last year I called out Ryan that was pretty fun. I was going to try to call him out again, but. <laughs> okay, can we get another round of applause for Leslie and Susan Cruz? Awesome work. Mahalo Nui, Leslie, uh, for sharing your oops, experiences with us. Um, we are going to continue in our adventure through Iole, and doing so is our guy, Wyatt Steele. Hello. How's it going? Um, yeah, I'm Wyatt, and I worked with Dr. Peter Mills this summer, and what we've been trying to do is establish a lab here at UH Hilo. 
that focuses on the study of microbotanical remains. Um, so we teamed up with Dr. Sarah Hotchkiss and her graduate student, Michael Payton. Um, they're both from the University of Wisconsin and they pretty much have just been helping us trying to get the lab up and running. And we've been working on our pilot project here in Iole. Um, so first, what are microscopic plant remains? Okay, so the soil is home to a variety of microscopic plant remains, including pollen grains, starch grains, charcoal fragments, and phytoliths. So each of these structures, they can be identified to the kind of plants that they came from, which means that we can kind of reconstruct ancient ecosystems, kind of have a window back in time. If we can look at the microscopic plant structures that are in the soil, you know, we can see what the floral biota of a place once looked like at, at any like, given point. Um, so phytoliths in particular, they have not seen a whole lot of attention in the state of Hawaii. So phytoliths, I got some up here. They're microscopic silica bodies that plants produce. Plants, they draw up monosilicic acid through the groundwater and then phytoliths are basically that silica and that acid that gets deposited in and in between their cells. Plant dies, plant decays, those phytoliths are left behind in the soil and they take on really dis distinct shapes and we can find them, we can extract them from the soil and identify what kind of plants they came from. So that's kind of our goal. Um, so we're working in Iole. Um, we had to come up with somewhere to get sediments from and we figured, you know, Lo'i is gonna be the place we wanna do it because Lo'i are essentially like sediment traps that create like super, super deep strata. Um, so you can see the histor historic map of Iole right there. Um, we decided to take samples from the lowland Lo'i and upland Lo'i 1, which is the one on the right up there. You can also, there more modern map right below it too. Um, so these different sites, they have different conditions. The lowland Lo'i has historically drawn water from the Poliakamoa stream, um, which means that the phytoliths or all the microscopic plant remains that are in the Lo'i, they should be more representative of the entire Poliakamoa watershed. Um, the upland Lo'i is spring fed, so that, you know, it hasn't really seen the same stream deposition that the lowland Lo'i has. So whatever microscopic plant material is in the upland Lo'i, it should be more representative of what's in the immediate area. So we kind of liked going with those two different sites because they kind of give us different, I guess, types of data. Um, there are some considerations as far as like how we were gonna get our samples. The way Lo'i are built, you know, is flash floods kind of sweep them down and they're rebuilt. They kind of actually form like underground staircases. So we had to be careful, you know, dig far enough, you know, within the walls of the, the existing walls of the Lo'i so we can get down to the deepest layer. Um, for getting down to the deepest layer, we had different options. We could trench, which is pretty invasive, but it does expose the most stratigraphy. We could core, which is also a really good option for preserving a lot of stratigra stratigraphy, but it's kind of limited in areas where you have a lot of obstructions. So then there's also augering. Augering, it can kind of go right through those obstructions. Um, it can pretty much preserve the relative strate stratigraphy of everything you get, but within each um, section that you auger out, it's, it's a little jumbled up. So it's not the cleanest data that we can get, but as far as like least invasive methods um, that you know we can actually pull off, uh, augering was the way to go. So we decided to auger in our locations. So let me scroll, okay. And the lowland Lo'i, we augered two spots. Um, we didn't go as deep as we would have liked to. Um, auger number one, that bottomed out at 86 centimeters below the surface. And auger number two, that one bottomed out at 77 centimeters below the surface. So our, our strategy to kind of dodge that 
underground staircase of low E walls. I don't know, it didn't really work too well. There's a lot of obstructions all over the place. So um, we, we were hoping to get a better, better situation when we went to the Upland low E1, um, which we did. We went to the Upland low E1. And even though it's not in use today, it's still full of water flowing through it. And we got down 212 centimeters below the surface. And that's subtracting the 30 centimeters of water that we were standing in the whole time. Um, so we actually hit the bedrock layer. So we got down, we, we think, like pretty deep, as deep as we, we might have been able to go. This is what your field notes look like after a day <laughs> in a low E. Um, here, here's a good uh, example kind of showing how, just how deep we go. So here's the uh, auger. Just got to give it a minute. Th these, these load quick. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, those are what paleoethnobotanists look like right there. Um, okay, so we have the samples in our hand now. Uh, we wanted to try pretty much the standard laboratory procedure that is done to extract actually both starch grains and phytoliths from sediments. This can be done in the same procedure. Um, I'm going to gloss over it a little bit. I could get into it, but we're not going to be leaving here until like 5.30 if I get into it. So um, basically, you use density separation. So you treat the sediment with all kinds of different chemicals, basically to break down all the stuff in it that you don't want. Um, and then you put heavy liquids into the, uh, into the sample. They have a specific density. We can put a heavy liquid in at a specific density that allows starch grains to float to the top, where we can isolate it out of the sample, look at it under a microscope, and then a different heavy liquid of a much higher density uh, that allows starch or phytoliths to float to the top. So it was going smooth. We did everything. We extracted the starch grains. We got to the very, very end. And then we kind of ran into a bit of a problem. Um, here's some of our very sophisticated laboratory equipment that we use. That ultrasonic bath, you kind of use that to uh, break up the material into more discrete units. And the centrifuge is used to kind of filter uh, samples, re um, remove kind of solids from liquids, separate those out. But anyway, we ran into a problem at the very end. We didn't have the right chemical. So the part where we have to float off the phytoliths, we couldn't actually do that. Uh, you, we need sodium polytungstate. That's the thing that's capable of reaching the density that will allow the phytoliths to float up. We accidentally ordered sodium tungstate dihydrate. Big distinction. Uh, so we were unable to actually float off the phytoliths, and we just you know, we were a little downtrodden. We wanted to just kind of see what we produced either way. So here's a look at a finished phytolith slide. It's too contaminated, too much sediment. We weren't able to, able to extract them. Um, we weren't able to actually complete the final step of the process. Um, we diluted the samples down a little bit to just kind of spread all that stuff out. Um, I looked at the diluted slides, and I did find some phytoliths. These are your classic dumbbell-shaped phytoliths. Um, got a little scale bar down there. These are 10 microns, about, you know, width. Um, this one, it looks a lot like the kind of phytoliths you get from the epidermal tissue from plants. Um, but not going to know for sure. Our, our big, you know, end game thing is to take modern living plants and get phytoliths out of them so we can build a reference collection. And all the phytoliths that we find in the soil, we can match it up to the phytoliths we already know exist that come from certain, you know, native plants, canoe plants, even invasive plants. So right now we're kind of just looking at stuff that we're not really able to identify yet. But we wanted to try this process because it was definitely the hardest one. We wanted to kind of get it out of the way. 
Uh, but that, that could be a phytolith. These could be phytoliths as well. Found these. Um, so th there's all kinds of little structures that are down there. Um, now, as far as the starch grains go, we did extract the starch grains, but the amount of starch grains in each slide, it was really scarce. Uh, we, you know, it could be a case that the sediment that we sampled just didn't have a lot, but we kind of think it was actually an error in our process. Um, but there is a starch grain, and that's actually the same starch grain under polarized light. And you can kind of see like a, a cross in it where the light's kind of on the edge that's called an extinction cross. And that's something we can use to pretty like easily identify these starch grains. Um, okay, so let me catch up here. Okay, so we wanted to kind of just jump right into trying it again. Get the right chemical, start from the top, but then we just kind of re-examined the whole process. We looked at the feasibility of everything, and it just didn't really seem that cool. Um, that process, assuming we could do it right, it takes about three days to produce samples from just four little test tubes of, you know, sediment. Um, that doesn't, that's just not really what we want in terms of throughput. Um, and it also requires handling a lot of very hazardous and expensive chemicals. Uh, so we looked into other methods and we found that microwave digestion can be used to do the exact same thing. You can extract phytoliths. You can get actually up to 40 samples in about an hour. So, you know, it seems like the better option for sure. Um, we actually heard that there was a microwave digestion system here at UH Hilo, so we went to go check it out. And this is what we found. We were met with an early relic from the 2000s. It looked like a microwave you'd find in a kitchen. That black box on top of it, that's a laptop that's like this thick. Um, we tried to turn it on and it didn't turn on. It's used to control it. It didn't really work out. We, we called the manufacturer, and they told us that this product had reached its end of life 15 years ago. <laughs> um, so this wasn't the thing that we wanted to put samples in and process them under extremely high pressures and temperatures. We wanted to look into maybe other systems. So feast your eyes on the Anton Parr Multi-wave 5000. This is the top of the line, or it's a modern microwave digestion system. This is what, you know, is used in the current era to produce these uh, kind of, really all kinds of applications in science, but it can be used very well for exactly what we're trying to do. These bad boys are going to run you about 19 to $23,000. So if any of you guys in the audience can move that kind of money, you know, come talk to me after. I think we can have a really good conversation. Um, but we do think that this is absolutely the route to take, just in terms of safety, you know, not having undergraduate students handling concentrated nitric acid and boiling it. And um, in terms of overall expense, too, because a lot of those chemicals we use, that chemical that we needed, it costs $1,500 for a little bottle of it. Maybe not what we want, right? Um, and just in terms of throughput, you know, it's not going to really work to process four samples every three days. And, you know, we, we want to learn what the soil has to say in Iole. We don't want to spend the next 15 years doing that. We, you know, it would be cool if we can process those samples quickly and we could spend most of our time on the microscopes identi identifying the phytoliths. Um, okay. Where am I? Reconstructing ancient landscapes. What did this place look like 100, 200, 1,000 years ago? So that's something I always ask myself when I'm in a place that has seen a lot of change. Um, it's amazing to me that the answer to this question can be told by the soil. And when I'm pondering the ancient landscape of a place that has seen great change, I think I'll do so with optimism from now on, knowing that the memory of that landscape is preserved beneath my feet. 
Um, I'm interested to see what the lab will learn about Eole and elsewhere. There's going to be so much that we can find out past the obvious presence of like ancient Kahlo cultiv cultivation. Like that's a given. Um, we're actually going to be able to make insights into Kanako Oevi permaculture and look at how the plants they used for kapa, food, um, la'au, lapa'au, cordage, everything, how that was woven into the existing ecosystem. So it's, you know, we're, we're hoping to get like a really, really big picture from this. Um, and in areas that have been especially affected by change, areas that have been affected by sugarcane, cattle ranching, development, um, that's kind of where we really want to apply this, uh, this area of science, um, areas where, you know, that memory has, is, is a little further away than areas that have not seen such great change, you know. We can start to create those windows into the past for the people that live there, and maybe they can start, you know, building a relationship with their aina, trying to restore it. And we're not just trying to restore the, the native ecosystem. It, it could be used for the restoration of functional ahupua'a. So we want to look to what's in the soil as a, as a sort of template to use for that. Um, now, as far as, as far as I go, it was wonderful to work in Iole. Um, Kohala was my home during my early childhood, but I've been away for a long time. Um, I feel like my old home now has become more solidified as a part of my story. It's no longer just like somewhere that I have a lot of hazy childhood memories. So I'm really happy to have kind of uh, reinvigorated my relationship with Kohala. Um, and it was wonderful to work in Iole and talk with all the folks at Iole and talk to them as Wyatt from Kohala, not Wyatt from Kauai or Wyatt from UH Hilo. It was, that, that was really special for me. Um, working with Peter, working with Sarah and Michael, that has been great. We, we all kind of went into it like not really knowing exactly what we're doing, um, but we all had like a really common interest and that dynamic was really special. And they have just given me every, every resource that I could have asked for along the way to you know, help me in uh, immersing myself into this new field of study. Um, I don't think I'll ever look at soil the same. All the little things that are in it are just so cool to me. I, I, I think about it like everywhere now. I think about it like what's in the dirt beneath the foundation that I'm standing on. Like I, I'm just constantly thinking about the, the layers of information that are just everywhere beneath us. Um, and I really hope that the lab can be a place for future students to, you know, maybe gain some experience like I have and maybe get some new perspectives on the worlds that they've already known. So here's, a, here's my literature cited. Okay, the scroll button's not really working too well anymore. Okay, our mouse, we're almost there. <laughs> okay, I don't know why that's going so slow. You guys can see that, right? Oh, there we go. I think my head was like blocking the signal or something. And these people made it possible. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Mahalo Nui, pressure makes diamonds, huh? Yes. Um, I think we're about 10 minutes over, but I think we can uh, field a question here. Does anybody hey, do have a really complicated, complex question for Wyatt? Mini. Yeah, so our protocol for collecting the sample pretty much differed between the different lo'i that we were at. Um, for the first, the lowland lo'i, it was completely dry. And we ran into the issue of like dry, loose dirt kind of falling back into the hole. So we kind of had to like remove about like five centimeters of dirt, you know, between each actual section that we, we collected. Um, so there was some consideration into that as far as like contaminants go. Same with the upland low E as far as like anything like underwater that could be pouring in when we put the auger down. 
we kind of wanted to take more from what we grabbed from the bottom of the auger rather than maybe some of the grass mud stuff that poured in at the top. Um, so we have the soil. What we so we we have we put them into bags. The auger sections are like maybe like that big. Um, so each auger section get, got its own bag, and we still have all of that ready to be processed for analyzation. What we did with our lab process, we used probably maybe enough dirt to like, it's like the same volume as this mouse, if not maybe a little bit more. Like there's really not a lot that you have to do, have to have to use to create just a little sample. So we're still sitting on that dirt. Um, as far as plans to like return it, um, I think there's th that's maybe not a, a possibility for uh, sediments that get treated to have them extracted because they're just so diluted, so mixed with you know hazardous chemicals and stuff that you know that's probably not the cleanest thing that we could be like depositing back into the ground, but you know, we're really eager to use what we can find in that dirt to, you know, treat the place good. Yeah. Okay, we'll take one more. Here you go, find it. Sorry, maybe we will leave at five thirty. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there like a way that you guys can date the phytoliths? And if so, like can you see uh <coughs> like landscape change over time just by like dating certain phytoliths to like see how yeah. things have changed? Um, so as far as specific dates go, I suppose if we wanted to do like a more controlled analysis, we might would we might want to go with a more like invasive approach that does preserve the str stratigraphy like trenching. You know, if we do trench, we can see that stratigraphy. We might even be able to, you know, like isolate like more like macro particles, you know, like maybe a piece of rotted wood that's preserved in that layer. You might be able to carbon date that. I don't know how big of a sample you need to carbon date things. I don't think we'd be using like starch grains. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. You know, we could car we could we could carbon date. Um if we if we can get material from certain layers, you know, we could get a carbon date on that. But as far as tracing changes, um we don't necessarily need to have a number to tell that story, um, it would be cool to like have dates and everything for for the whole story. But you know, we can still trace those changes across you know the relative stratigraphy that we pulled out, um, and you know see how the plant life has changed. And especially like, I, I think Augur three is going to be great as like our deepest one. I'm hoping that it went deep enough to have like a layer that's representative of like the pre agriculture ecosystem and I'm hoping that we can see the exact moment in the layers that Kahlo shows up and then we can see that whole section as you know Kanako EV permaculture and kind of look into that a little bit and then sugarcane which I don't think we're gonna spend a terrible amount of time on but you know we we'll want to look at everything okay is the well, I I a round of applause for All right. thank you for Thank you for hearing me. If you have any more questions for him, please talk to him after this. Thank you. As Lillian's making her way up there, and um, uh, what we found out was pipes often goes full circle. We've been going along enough, so we see a lot of things. Kamalu's mom used that, that micro digester. So we have an intern's mom use that micro digester for her, for her masters. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, whenever. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, thank you, Wyatt, for your experiences and for that uh, sales pitch on the Multiway 5000. I kind of want one now. Um, now taking us into not the soil, but trees and shrubs and really cool things is Lillian Lewis. Hello. So uh, yeah, my project is on the power of listening utilizing passive acoustic monitoring and bioacoustics technology within Iole Ahupua.
And then the map that connects us all. Uh, mine is the orange marker right at the front. That's one of our main sites. But we did have some sites closer towards the shoreline as well. And then as a quick overview of what I'll be going over today, I'll just start with an introduction of myself and the place I've been working. And then I'll transition into the ha'alele, or the methods, the field equipment, sites, and software. And then the huakai, or results, of the bird species and opeapea, our native Hawaiian bat. And then lastly, I'll end it off with the key points and future research. Um, a little bit about myself is that I'm a student here at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, I'm also a student employee and peer mentor with first year experience on campus. And then I'm a Umatilla tribal member. So my name in the Umatilla language is Akalai, which means the eyeballs. And for the lab I was working in over, over the summer, I was working with um, Anne Tanimoto Johnson right up there and Dr. Patrick Hart. And the thing I love about the Lohe Lab is they um, take into consideration not just what we're doing, but where we're working, and they try to incorporate Hawaiian culture whenever they can. Sorry, she's loading. So the place of work um, where we did most of our research was in Iole Ahupua'a. But upon speaking with the Aina crew up there, we also found out that it also goes by Aina Kea. So the Kohala Institute at Iole, um, they focused on Aina-based education and also finding ways to sustain food, water, and energy for future generations. And transitioning into my project, um, my research questions are, what does the species diversity look like in Iole? And how can the data that we gather be used for future research and species management? So for the hypotheses, we asked, um, acoustic monitoring in Iole will document both native and non-native bird species. Uh, we will detect our native um, duck, the Kaloa Maoli. And we will be able to detect the native Hawaiian hoi bat or the opeapea. And then lastly, we took a look at whether time of day or time of night and sight impacted the amount of detections we caught. So for the ha'alele or methods, um, a lot of the field equipment we used were bioacoustics monitors. This is an example of the wildlife acoustics SM4 song meter. So it has an audio sample rate of 44100 hertz, and then we set it to a recording schedule of 5 o'clock a.m. to 7 o'clock p.m., and then again from 7 o'clock p.m. to 5 o'clock a.m. And this is an example of our wildlife acoustic song meter, or SM4 bat song meter. Uh, it has an audio sample rate of 256 kilohertz, and we scheduled this one from 6 o'clock p.m to 11 o'clock p.m. and 1 o'clock a.m. to 5, er, yeah, 5 o'clock a.m. And this is the ultrasonic microphone, or SMMU2. So for the deployment of these recorders, we put three Malka site and two Makai site of each recorder, and they were from the dates of June 6th through July 20th, 2023. So now, to, just to show you a little about, about our sites, this is Malka Site 1, or Watt. Um, also, after talking with the folks up at Yole, we found out that the Watt stream was actually named after a previous landowner, but its original name in Hawaiian is Hapahapai. And this is Site 2, the Duck Pond. Site 3, the Reservoir. Site four, which is one of our Mackay sites, uh, shore side. And site five, trail side. 
So for our lab software, we mostly utilize Raven Pro. And the cool thing about Raven Pro is, it, is that it allows you to not only listen to the audible recordings, but see what those recordings look like in a spectrogram. And then from the spectrogram, we were also able to make selections. So this is an example of a Kaloa Maoli selection in that little red box over there. Um, another platform we used was BirdNet. So what we did is took audio recordings and then put them into BirdNet, which, which breaks down into three second spectrograms. And then the algorithm matches it to the most likely bird species and gives you its final prediction. Oh, also, um, I would manually go through and look at all of the species that it had a 50% confidence or higher rate, and then confirm if it was either incorrect or correct. And then after that, I would go through and look at all the species with a 50% or lower confidence rate. So other things I did in Raven Pro was make manual selections. So for all of our bat sounds collected, I would go through and make 50 selections of bat sounds and then other selections of background noise, wind, and rain. And then I would also look at presence or absence for the bats at each site and what time of day those were. So Kugu is another platform I used um, to enter those selections into. And similarly to BirdNet, it looks at these detections and gives you like what it believes to be a bat sound. But the thing about um, the algorithm is it's not always correct. So I would just go through and make sure they're either correct or incorrect. So for the time of night and site preference, um, this went on from June 6th to 13th, 2023, and that was just our first round of data collection. And we would take a look at um, what time of night hourly they would make their vocalizations. And we would also look at the amount of vocalizations per site. So for the results, uh, we saw over, or er, we detected 17 species of birds within Iole. And then we gathered these target species from the 2007 Kohala Watershed Report. And then we used that to help decide what our target species would be. Um, so this graph shows that the most detections were at site four on the shoreline, but the like I said before, the detections are not always correct. So some of the bird species like Apapane or um, Hawaii Amaki'i or Hawaii Elopayo are things that the algorithm thinks it detected but weren't actually there. And then now for our target species that we did see, um, we have on the left the name and then the right the spectrograms. This is the common mina, common waxbill, gray franklin, house finch, melodious laughing thrush, scaly breasted munia, spotted dove, turkey, warbling wide eye. Indian peafowl, northern cardinal, red-billed theatrix, saffron finch, yellow-fronted canary, zebra dove, and the Kaloa Maoli, or Hawaiian duck. And then now I'd like to share a quick recording of the Kaloa Maoli record. Yeah, Kaloa Maoli. Now, I know that sounds a lot like a mallard, right? <laughs> so how can you tell the difference? Um, one way we were able to do this was by 
communicating with the folks up at Iole and asking if they saw any of these species in person. And they let us know that they have seen a pair of Kaloa mo'oli, uh, male and female, and that's how we were able to make this detection. So for the Opea pair results, um, these are our Kugu results for the accuracy per training round model. So for this graph, um, basically what we were trying to do is get this red line to be in equilibrium with the green line. And it was trained with previous data collected from Iole, or not Iole, from the Lohe Lab. Um, and we put the model through 25 rounds of training. And then you'll see that the starting accuracy for this is above 0 0.650. And then for the accuracy per training round with new samples, um, we trained the algorithm with only data collected from Iole. And then you can see that the accuracy already improved from 0 0.650 to right above 0 0.88. And then we decided to combine all of the data collected from both Iole and the first round collected from, or first round click, sorry, first round collected from Iole, and then uh, previous data from the Lohe Lab, and then we trained the m model with this for 25 rounds, and then the accuracy increased from 0 0.650 all the way to 0 0.94. So basically, what this means is. The more data we collect and add to models, um, the higher the accuracy increases to. So for the linear models, these were all collected using our first round of data due to a limited time frame. But for the bat detections at each site, we did see the most bats, or hear the most bats, at site two, which was our duck pond. And then you'll also notice that there is no data for site four. And that's just because we didn't get any detections. And then our data for site five was also very limited. So for the bat detections at each hour, we found that there were the most vocalizations at seven o'clock p.m. and five o'clock a.m. And then the bat detections at each site at each hour uh, similarly, once again, there was um, the most bat vocalizations at 7 o'clock p.m. and 5 o'clock a.m. And then you'll note that all the blue boxes means that the most detections were also at site two, which is the duck pond. And now I'd like to share a recording of the Opea Pea. Another cool thing about Raven Pro is that we would not be able to hear this with our ears naturally, but because we use um, platforms like Raven Pro, we're able to slow down the recordings to 0 0.25, and then that way we can hear it like that. So the key points for the birds is that both native and non-native bird species were present at all five sites, and the Kaloa Mo'oli is believed to be present at all five sites, but the most detections were at site two, the duck pond, and additional data could be used to increase the accuracy of the BirdNet model. The key points for Opeapea is that Opeapea is present at all sites except for site four, and that most Opeapea detections are at five o'clock a.m. and seven o'clock p.m. Um, similarly, site two had the most detections, and additional data could also be used to increase the accuracy of Kugu. So for future studies, they could focus on Having a larger sample size, um, they could take a look at vocal behavior trends, so seasonal changes, site preferences, and changes over time. And they could continue to add data to platforms like BirdNet and Kugu. And then lastly, there could be restoration work to the duck pond to create an island so the ducks can nest apart from predation. But also, I know the Ina crew said that's something that they're very interested in working on, so I'm happy to hear that. And lastly, I'd like to give a huge mahalo to my mentors, Anne Tanimoto Johnson and Pat Hart. 
and then everyone who helped out with this. Mahalo. Awesome job, Liz. Do, do we have a question for Lillian? Question or questions? Oh, Lord, you would. Why? Yeah. Favorite bird sound. Um, I like the Indian peafowls. They're like the peacocks, just because I was like, oh, I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but also the ducks, of course. <laughs> um, so I get a question. It looked like one of your sites didn't have any data. I think that was for the, what was it for? Yeah, site four. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Why do you think that specific site didn't have any yeah, uh, for data. sure. Um, most likely, it's just because I was reading that like bats don't really like salinated water. So sites four and five were both closer to the ocean side. So they prefer fresh water, which might be why they prefer the Malco sites. Any more? One more? Okay, I'm going to run the mic to you. Uh, before the question, shout out to Na'alu for just running around, passing the mic <laughs> to everybody. Um, so what do you think, uh, what's like an ecological feature or anything special about Site 2 that has like a large presence of o Opea Pea? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I couldn't tell you for sure, but if I had to guess, I would think there's probably more like insects in that area and then just a higher biodiversity because of the duck pond. Awesome job, can we get another round of applause for Lillian? <laughs> Mahalo Nui Lillian for sharing that wonderful presentation of all of your experience this summer. Next we have Amber Sky Skiwo. Where is she at? There you are. All right. Skibu. Mahalo. Okay. Ali, Ngili Tasil Simrarugul Ad. My name is Amber Skiwo, and today I will be talking about my research project about water quality monitoring entitled Entrecaucus Species Comparison on the Shorelines of Kailua Kona and North Kohala on Hawaii Island. <coughs> okay, here. Okay, so about me, I am 23 years old, born and raised in Palau, and today I study marine science here at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. So growing up, I spent most of my time out in nature, whether it was swimming in the rock islands or taking an adventure at the waterfall, I always felt at peace when visiting such places. However, I had a strong passion for our ocean. I believe my upbringing in Palau was my catalyst to joining the Pipes Ohana. I learned at a young age the importance of our ocean and its conservation. <clears throat> We not only depend on the ocean for food, but for our cultural identity and practices as well. The long-term success of this symbiotic relationship is based on the responsibility that each Palawan is taught at a, at a young age that they are caretakers of the sea. <clears throat> we work as a community to execute such practices and ensure that they are successful. I wanted to join the Pipes Ohana to be able to do scientific research uh, on an island that shares similar beliefs uh, and practice practices to my home island. The following project I am working on will allow me to do scientific research and provide helpful information to the community on sewage pollution. My host agency for this project is the Marine Science Department at the here at UH Hilo, and I was fortunate to have three awesome mentors, Dr. Tracy Wigner, Dr. Steve Colbert, and grad student, Ms. Ihilani Kamau. 
The agency has previous and ongoing research uh, here on Hawaii Island. Some of them include water quality monitoring, study on the effects of sea level rise on coastal water infrastructures, uh, as well as the vertical mixing and carbon dioxide dynamics uh, in a groundwater estuary on West Hawaii. My project is about the comparison of shoreline Enterococcus species, a fecal indicator bacteria that is used to monitor, monitor water quality on the shoreline communities of Kailua Kona and North Kohala. This type of bacteria is found on warm-blooded species, including humans, and indicates possible sewage pollution in environment. So both coastal communities have on-site sewage treatments as well as cesspools. The public sewer system in Kona does not connect to all residential areas, whereas Kohala has no sewer system at all. The rise in human activities and urbanization have caused the island to face an urgent challenge in controlling coastal water quality. Here is my project map, it's just an overview. So those are my stations uh, in uh, Kohala and these are my stations in Kailua Kona. So for my site, uh, this project uh, is based uh, on the shoreline communities of Kailua Kona and North Kohala. So Kailua Kona serves as the hub of Hawaii Island. Uh, uh, a lot of tourist uh, activities, marine recreation, and cultural heritage. With it being the second most populated area on Hawaii Island, uh, it has 6,500 cesspools that discharge a total of 15 megaliters uh, per day of untreated sewer into coastal waters. Other than the on-site disposal system, the kea La Kehe Wastewater Treatment Plant serves 1,700 connections, but does not connect to all residential areas. As of the North Kohala, there is no wastewater treatment, which means all residents have OSDS and most are cesspools. As for sampling and analysis, for this project, I use the microbiological analysis method this method involves water, collecting water samples and analyzing them for the presence and concentration of Enterococcus species. In addition, water physiochemical parameters such as salinity and turbidity were, were measured in the field with a YSI meter. A typical sampling day usually begins um, at 4 a.m. due to the long drive from Hilo to target sites. I had a total of 14 stations to collect samples from, 12 in Kailua Kona and two in North Kohala or the Iole Ahupua shoreline. I collected samples during low tide and near sunrise because the Enterococcus species bacteria will most likely die when exposed to sunlight. At each station, duplicate and triplicate water samples were collected in previously sterilized plastic bottles and later processed within six hours of collection. Okay. <clears throat> Enterococcus species were analyzed using the Enterolert MPN method following the manufacturer's recommendation of 10 ml sample water and 90 ml of sterile water. They are then both mixed with a specific volume of regent provided in the Enterolert test kit. The Enterolert test kit uses a proprietary defined substrate technology, nutrient indicator to detect enterococci. This nutrient indicator fluoresces when meta when metabolized with enterococci. Basically, when a well turns blue, there is enterococci present in the water samples. So for my first graph, uh, when comparing enterococcus species concentration on both shorelines, uh, I came into conclusion that there is not much difference uh, 
in concentrations when it comes to urban versus rural areas. And Chircaca species can persist in tropical soil uh, and come from different animal sources and, th and may not be an indicative of sewage. And when in the beginning of the project, I expected rural areas to have low or no Enterococcus concentrations. And my second graph is a column plot comparing a different Enterococcus concentrations on different shoreline stations. Uh, so contrasting patterns were seen along these shoreline stations. Uh, they ranged from 5 to 190 MPN per 100 ml, and significantly differed uh, among stations, with station 3 and 5 having the highest values. So according to the State of Hawaii Department of Health, entrococci content shall not exceed a geometric mean of 35 MPN per 100 ml over any 30-day interval. So this red line indicates my 35 mean. And in this study, I found that 8 out of 14 stations exceeded that value of entrococci content, indicating sewage pollution. Station 3 is located in Ali'i Drive. Um, station 5 is located right next to the Royal Kona Hotel. Stations 9 to 12 is all of Kahalu'u. And Station 13 is located near the Vainaya River mouth at the Iole Ahu Pua. Okay. And then for my last graph, I have a scatter plot showing a relationship between salinity and the Enterococcus species concentration. The blue represents Kailua Kona and red represents uh, Iole. So it had a significant linear relationship with salinity in all stations of Kailua Kona. Enterococcus species concentrations were increasing as salinity decreased. However, station 13 and 14 in Kohala did not show any linear relationship. And this is because wastewater from cesspools enters the ground and into the shorelines. Okay. So in conclusion, the degrad degradation of coastal ecosystems um, due to sewage pollution has emerged as a pressing concern in modern environmental research. The discharge of untreated sewage into coastal water can lead to multiple environmental health issues. This study found that Enterococcus species concentration were high along certain shorelines on both shorelines that indicate sewage pollution. With this information, both shoreline communities will be aware of the health of their coastal ecosystems uh, and take action. The community may work together to ask for funds to upgrade and maintain sewage infrastructure, as well as monitoring programs to assess the extent of sewage, po sewage pollution and track improvements over time. So overall, this project enabled me to learn new skills and knowledge in my field of work. And prior to moving here to Hawaii for school, I used to work at Coral Reef Research Foundation, where we did a lot of water quality monitoring in marine lakes. Uh, so with that, I am very thankful for Pipes for giving me this opportunity to expand my experience in my field of work. And other than that, I made a lot of new connections with new people and places that I hope to work with in future research. To end, I would like to thank all my funders for this project, especially NSF. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs> awesome job, awesome job. Skibo, uh, do we have any questions out there? I don't know how I'm going to get to you, Penny. Can you pass this mic to Penny? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, noticed that in Eole there was one place that had kind of over the limits of Enterococcus. Is there like an understanding or discussion about whether or not that's maybe due to cattle runoff as opposed to human sewage? Yes, so I don't, so in Leslie's 
presentation, she showed one of the maps with the streams. And my station 13 is located right next to the river mouth of that stream. And um, I was also able to be part of other projects where we went up to the Malka side of Iole and I observed a lot of cattle. So yes, I think uh, continuing on to this project, we can take that into consideration and do test on it. Can we get one more question from any of our esteemed guests? No. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I always like the mentor questions because they're always. So, <clears throat> so building on that, if enterococcus isn't the best way to identify sewage pollution at Iole, are you familiar with any other methods that may help us to identify if it is sewage if there is sewage pollution present there? Okay, so my project is part a, of a bigger project run by my mentor, Ms. Ihilani. And for her project, the, she uses Radva, yeah. Uh, she uses more project, uh, like more methods into testing for sewage pollution, such as collecting limu or water samples for clostridium bacteria, and also it's another FIB fecal indicator bacteria. So it's not only the enterococcus test, uh, you can, there's another FIB bacteria, and the uh, limu. Yeah. Awesome, there's one more, no, maybe. Can we get another round of applause <laughs> for Amber Ski Wolf? I just, I guess I'll go up here because we're in front of the camera. Mahalo Dui for everybody coming in person, online. Uh, that was our final presentation for today. Tomorrow we will be back here. Uh, can we get another round of applause for the presenters today? Awesome job. We'll be back here tomorrow, bright and early, 8.30. We have our first Olelo Hawaii cohort starting us off. See you guys tomorrow. Interns, you are staying here. <laughs>